Hey what's up everyone and welcome to Spring Boot Master Class or Spring Boot Complete Boot Camp by Daily Code Buffer. So in this particular video we are going to have a lot of fun and we are going to learn a lot of things. So let's see what we are going to learn today. So what we are going to cover in this particular entire Spring Boot Master Class is these are the topics that will be what's and why's of Spring Framework. We will be going through the all of Spring Boot, how to start with the Spring Boot and how to go ahead with all the Spring Boot components and how to create all the different REST APIs, all the different methods, how to create the entire application with the help of Spring Boot. We are going to also learn about the JUnit and Mockito, how to create the unit testings, how to write the unit testings for all the different components that we are going to build. So we are going to build controller layers, service layer, repository layers for all those type of components. We are going to learn how to create the test cases and also we are going to learn how to write a integrated test as well using JUnit and Mockito. We are also going to learn Spring Data JPA and with that, we are going to use the MySQL database and we are also going to use the H2 in-memory database. We will see how both can be used and we are going to see how the Spring Data JPA gives us the ease to create different queries and how to interact with the database from your Spring Boot application. And we are also going to learn about the Spring Security. We will be implementing the entire Spring Security within our Spring Boot application and we are going to also implement the authorizations authorization server, authorization client resources with auth2 and open id connect. So this is going to be a jam packed course. Let's also see what are the different topics that we are going to cover for each and every topics that we have mentioned. So for what's and why's of spring, we are going to learn about what is spring framework. You need to understand the foundation of spring framework. And we are also going to see what are the advantages of the spring framework and what is the life cycle of a bean, how your beans are created, how you define the dependency injection in the spring framework and what is the Spring AOP that is the aspect oriented programming. So these are the very core concepts of a Spring framework which will help you to learn more on the Spring Boot. So these are all the concepts that are being used in the Spring Boot. So once you grab all these concepts, it will be very easy for you to grab the Spring Boot framework because once you understand all these concepts and then you switch to Spring Boot to start learning Spring Boot, you will get the aha moment. Okay, these are the lot of things that I don't have to do. Okay, because these are already done by the auto configuration of Spring Boot. So you will be able to understand a lot of things in detail. Now within the Spring Boot module, what we are going to learn is what is Spring Boot, why Spring Boot came into existence, what are the advantages it gives to a developer, how developer friendly the Spring Boot framework is. And we are going to see how to build our REST APIs using Spring Boot framework. So we will be creating all the different APIs to create the data, update the data, to get the data, to get all the data. Seems like a complete CRUD application where these are the general operations you will do in your day to day work. So we will be seeing all those things in detail and we are going to write the unit test cases for each and everything that we develop. So we are going to write a unit test case using JUnit and Mockito for our controller layer, for our service layer, for our repository layer everything and we are also going to write the integration test as well to test out each and every component together. So in the Spring Data module we are going to learn about the JPA that is the Java Persistence API and we are going to learn about how Spring Data JPA uses that JPA and how it uses the Hibernate and give us the lot of different functionalities to directly interact with the database. So there are a lot of features that are directly built into the API which we can directly use and if you want to enhance we can also enhance all those APIs. We can write our own custom queries and everything. So that's when we are going to also learn about the Hibernate as well. And we are also going to learn about the different entity relationships in the Hibernate. We are going to learn about the one to one relationship. We are going to learn about the one to many relationship, many to many relationships, unidirectional relationships, bidirectional relationships and all of those things. Then we are going to learn about the spring security, which is a very important part. And this is where every developer feels little bit hesitated to learn because at the starting it feels little bit complex but once you understand the concepts once you understand the all the jargons that are being used it is very easy to implement so we are going to learn about the spring security how to implement spring security in your spring boot project and we are also going to learn about the auth 2.0 and open id connect what is auth 2.0 and how we can implement that in our project and we are going to see a complete flow in which we will include registering a user with a verification code resend a verification code forgot password reset password and a complete login flow with the help of auth 2.0 and 
This will all be implemented using a token based authentication, which will allow us to create the different resource servers. These are the concepts available in your auth 2.0. So we'll be creating resource servers. We'll be creating clients. We will be creating authorization servers. So all this will connect together and you can create your application. So these are the things that we are going to learn in our entire Spring Boot masterclass. Now to get the most out of this course, these are the prerequisites that you should know. That is the Java. You should be familiar with the Java programming because we'll be coding everything in Java. I will be teaching you each and everything about the Spring and Spring Boot, but the basic syntax of Java, how to create a Java program, all you should know. These are the basic things. And if you know the basics of Servlet, that's the advantage, but we will be going through each and everything in this tutorial. And the main important thing, you should be having the enthusiasm to learn all these things because this is going to be a very long masterclass. You should be going through each and every topics in detail. And while we are doing the coding, you should also practice alongside. It should not be like you just go through the tutorial and you don't practice it. You have to practice it and then only you will be able to understand each and every concepts. Then what are the software requirements? So you should be having Java installed. I'll be using Java 11 in the entire course. So if you use that, it will be very easy for you to follow, but you can use any Java version. Make sure that you are using Java compatible with your ID that you are using. I'll be using the IntelliJ ID ID. You can use IntelliJ IDEA. If you want, that's a community edition, which is free of course that you can use for learning purposes. There is uh, Eclipse as well, Spring Tool Suite as well. You can use anything. You can use VS Code as well, and you can install all the different plug plugins available to support the Java project. And I'll be using Maven 3 Plus. So Maven 3 Plus you can install and you can configure in your variables. And I'll be using the MySQL database so you can install MySQL Server and Workbench. So I'll be showing you all those things. So you can install directly, go to Google and you can install all those stuffs and it will be easy for you to follow. And by any means you're not able to install it, then you can let me know in the comment section below or you can use the H2 in memory database as well. I'll be showing you all those things in the tutorial. So that's all about the course. And if you have any queries, any issues, then you can reach me out to my Twitter handle or Instagram. These are the handles. You can reach me out at Daily Code Buffer on Twitter and Daily Code Buffer on Instagram. You can follow me there. I will be posting a lot of contents there and you can DM me as well. I'll try to help you out. I will try to answer your questions. If not, there is a comment section always. If you have any queries, comment it down and I will try to help you out as soon as possible. So that's it. Grab a cup of your coffee and let's start our masterclass. If you're new around here, welcome to Daily Code Buffer and this is Shabir. I will try to teach you whatever I know and whatever I have learned using this all tutorials. Now first let's see why frameworks first of all, right? So if you're working with any of the programming languages or in this particular video, let's take the example of Java. Java gives us a lot of features and advantages to build the application. But when we are trying to build the enterprise applications, when you are trying to build the business applications, Right at the time, we have to concentrate more on the business logics. At that time, we don't have to work around or we don't want to work with the basic boilerplate codes or the basic necessities or basic cross cutting concerns, we can say, right? So we'll be doing many things like security, like logging, like configurations, like batch processing, scheduling, many things, right? So these all things directly doing with Java without any frameworks, it will take a lot of time. So frameworks comes into picture at that time, like frameworks are the way that will provide a lot of basic structure, basic functionalities that we can work upon and we can mainly concentrate on our business implementation. So Spring is not the first framework. There are a lot of frameworks available for Java, but why Spring is more popular that we can understand using the advantages of the Spring framework. So Spring is just the another framework like other frameworks available for Java or the other frameworks available for the other programming languages. It gives us a lot of features so we can work upon. It gives us like logging, uh, security. It gives us uh, dependency injections. It gives us uh, scheduling, batch processing, and a lot of things. There are a lot of modules available within the Spring Framework. It's a suite of framework, right? It's also called as Framework of Frameworks. We'll get to that part later why it's called Frameworks of Frameworks. But Spring started as a small project and now it's really huge. So let's see the different features of Spring Framework first. So the first thing Spring allows us is to inversion of control. What is inversion of control? Inversion of control is nothing but to give the control to the framework itself. You don't have to take the control yourself. You don't have to create every objects or whatever you want to do in your application by yourself because consider there are thousands of uh, classes that you have created and for each and every time you are creating the objects and you are destroying the objects uh, for the garbage collection, it's a tedious job. We have to work on the business logic. What we are doing is we are giving the control to the framework itself. 
okay so that is responsible for doing everything to do that spring allows the dependency injection so we need to understand what is dependency injection that will cover in detail later on in a nutshell dependency injection is nothing but to give the dependencies of different classes into the different classes suppose one class needs the object of the other class then we will give the control to spring to add those particular dependencies we won't be adding those dependencies we will see later how we can do that as well the other thing spring provides us is the aspect oriented programming that is spring aop now what is aspect oriented programming aspect oriented programming is nothing but to tackle down the cross cutting concerns because when you are building the application there are a lot of things that we might do repeatedly like logging the uh, user data whatever the logs we generate right uh, doing logging in uh, doing securities so this type of things that we have to do for each and every request that's coming from the server so to do those things every time it's a tedious job so what we do is we separate out all those cross cutting concerns and we separate out using the spring aop and we define like whenever this particular uh, things are called or whatever the particular methods are invoked we have to invoke this particular methods or we have to do this particular operations that we will define or that we can define in the spring aop so that's the spring aop part that spring provides us the other thing that it provides us the ability to create the web application so that is a spring project called spring mvc that allows us to create the web applications the other thing is if suppose if you want to work with a database right so ideally if you are directly working with java you would be working with the jdbc and we know that working with jdbc is a really tough thing right so spring provides us the spring data libraries so that we can connect to the database so for all the different database that you want to use for all those things there are spring data projects available either you want to use with the mysql either you want to use with the oracle or no sql databases anything for all those things there is a project from the spring framework that you can use to connect to your database and it would be very easy for you to implement those things and it also allows us to implement other libraries and other frameworks very easily suppose you if you want to work with the hibernate for your database connection or for your orm then it allows us very easily to implement hibernate within the spring framework so that's why because of the ease of implementing other libraries and other frameworks in this spring framework it is also known as the frameworks of framework so by all these particular features we can understand that spring boot is a layer on top of the java to build our applications now as spring boot adds a layer on java for the developers to make the application very fast reliably and with a peace of mind do the same thing with your identity on internet using vpn with more than 5200 servers amazing speed and one click connect nord vpn gives us a lot of features and security as a techie we know that how much important it is to secure our data and identity with nord vpn's diskless servers and end to end encryption everything is secure which routes through the nord vpn servers so no one will know your ip address and if you want you can route through two vpn servers to double down on your security and production and it also enables all the content on netflix and amazon prime you just change the server to that particular location and all the contents and your favorite shows will be available to whichever server you have connected to so i use nord vpn on all my devices so if you are interested go to this link or use coupon code dcb to get a two year plan plus a huge bonus gift check the first link in the description below now to understand more on the dependency injection let's go to the computer open intellij idea and i'll show you some code so we can understand more on the dependency injection so let me just open intellij idea so i'll just create a new project over here and we will use the spring framework dependency in it so let me just create the new project and you can create spring project either using maven or using gradle both are the excellent build tools so either one whichever you are comfortable you can use i'm more comfortable with the maven so i'll go ahead with the maven so here you can just select the maven project that you want to create because we are not creating spring boot project we are just focusing on the core spring framework so from here select the sdk i am using java 11 so i'm just selecting the java 11 over here and there are a lot of archetypes available maven archetypes so from that you can directly create the base structure of the maven project but we are not going from this we will be creating entire project from scratch so click on next over here and give the name of the project i'll just give spring framework demo and in the artifact coordinates you have to give your details over here now your group id is to identify or to get a unique group id over here now we'll add the group id over here generally we will be writing the domain name in the reverse order to make it unique so i'll just write com dot daily code buffer and the artifact id would be your name of the project so with the combination of group id and artifact id your 
artifact would be unique in the world and then you can give the version as well we'll go ahead with the 1.0 hyphen snapshot version and we'll click on finish and here you can see that the project is created so this is the pom.xml file of your may one this is very important for your project so let me just close it for now let me go to the src folder main java and let me create the package over here let me give demo and let me create the main class over here okay and we'll have the main method as well now ideally when we are working with the java application what we do is we create a lot of classes and whenever we want to use those classes we create the reference of that particular class and we instantiate that class with the new keyword right so the object of that particular class is created and we can use this class we can assign some variables or whatever we want to do or we can call the methods available in that particular class so that's how generally is been done in the java application so suppose for the example let me just create one class over here so what i'm doing is i'm creating a class which says doctor and let me say public void assist the doctor can assist the other doctors and i'm just printing out doctor is assisting so this is just a simple class that i've created doctor and there is one method that is assist which is printing doctor is assisting now if i want to use this what i'll do in the main class i'll just create the reference doctor doctor equals to and then i'll instantiate this particular class with the new keyword that is new doctor right and then i can say doctor dot assist if i run this this should run right completely fine now what if i want to create a new doctor again or what if there are new objects that are to be added to this particular class right because currently if you see there is only one doctor if you go to this particular doctor class suppose there are different classes created and the objects of those particular classes are required over here right suppose doctor doctor have qualifications right so suppose if you're creating the class qualification and you want to use that particular qualification in this doctor class what you will do you will just create a qualification reference to it and whenever you want to create the object for it either in the getter setters or in the constructor you will instantiate this particular object using the new keyword so that thing is bound to this doctor class right because whenever you want a doctor class you have to have the qualification class so you can see that those two class doctor and qualifications are tightly coupled right because whenever you need a doctor you need to have a qualification without that particular qualification you cannot create the doctor because you have directly instantiated the qualification class within the doctor constructor itself so this is a particular concern that we have to solve right and spring allows us to solve that particular concern now to solve this concern what we have to do is we have to do the loose coupling you might have heard this term right tight coupling and loose coupling so we have to create a loose coupling with within the objects that we are creating so that means if you want to work with directly qualification you should be able to work and if you want to directly work with the doctor you can work and if qualification is available that's fine we can use the qualification if qualification is not available we can still create the doctor right ideally it should not be right <laughs> but here to understand uh, we can create the object and the other thing why we have to do the loose coupling is for the unit testing we will be creating a huge projects and to test it everything every time is not possible so what we do we separate down or we create a different component small small components and we try to test those small components we do the unit testing of those components and we try to build the application so that means if we create a doctor class over here separately and we create the qualification class also separately we should be able to test both of them separately and we should be able to test both of them together also so that type of thing should be possible and that's the design principle that we should follow so to achieve this to do the loose coupling dependency injections comes into picture from spring so what it allows us to do is we can create the different classes and we just tell spring like these are the classes i have and what spring will do is spring will try to reference all the classes so it will have the graph of reference right it will have like this particular object is connected to this particular class this is a separate class this is connected to this particular class so this all reference graph it will have spring will have and it will try to match everything so you don't have to do anything so you don't have to use a new keyword to create the objects or anything we just have to annotate it or we can do the xml configuration as well that 
this particular class might need this or we need this particular object. So we'll just define everything like a blueprint. So we'll just create a blueprint like this is all I need and Spring will take care of everything like whenever the objects are there to creating the objects and to inject all the objects whenever it is required. So everything Spring will take care of. So that is we are giving the control to Spring. So that is the inversion of control and dependency injection is the process that we are doing. So let's understand how to do this dependency injection there are different ways that we have we can do dependency injection constructor base setter base and we can do via xml configuration as well and then we can do via annotation base as well and we can do via java configuration as well so we'll see how we can do via xml configuration how we can do via annotation based configuration and how we can do via java configuration so Let's see how we can do this. So I'll just remove this for now because I don't need this and let me go to the main glass and I don't need the let it keep this way right. So now to work with the spring we need to add the dependency. So to add the dependency what we have to do is we have to go to the palm.xml file and here we have to define the dependencies what all the dependencies that we need we can define here and we can add the dependencies. So what I'll do I will go here and I will add the dependencies. Okay, inside dependencies I need to add the dependency so I'll just add the dependency tag okay in this particular dependency you can see that you have to provide the artifact and the group ID that two would be unique so I just want spring context dependency and that is the from the group org.spring framework and the version that I want to use is 5.3.14 okay currently spring framework 5 is the latest one and within few months Spring Framework 6 also will get released but the base will remain the same right this tutorial will be applicable at that particular time as well and once you add this you can just refresh the Maven dependencies and Maven will try to get all the dependencies in your local repository there will be a central repository as well for Maven and it will try to fetch all the jar files whichever we have defined over here and it will create the local repositories so it can give you the content from there directly so this one dependency is created now now if I go to this particular main class so now we need to understand okay spring will create all this particular beans right but where from where to get all these things right so what spring does is whenever you start the application spring will load all the beans and it will store all the beans in the container right so we can get all the beans from the container itself so there are two interfaces available that is bean factory and application context from that we can try to get all the beans which are loaded and we can use those particular beans so we don't have to use the new keyword to get the object and we can use that particular object so let's try to understand that now what's the difference between bean factory and application context application context extends bean factory so there are a lot more features within the application context now if you want to know the exact differences you can go to the documentation and you can go through everything but here we will be using the application context for now for that i will link the article in the description below so let me just create the object of application context and here you can see that it is part of the org.springframework.context package okay and i'll create the context object equals to new and here you can see that there are a lot of different ways that we can get the spring context but here we have to go with the xml based configuration because we will try to use the xml based configuration so here there is a class called class path xml application context so we will be using this one and as we are using class path xml application context we need to create the xml configuration for it so let's create the xml for it so and that particular xml has to be in the class path so whatever it would be in the resources folder it will be in the class path because everything is in the main right so let me just create the xml file and i'll just say it's spring.xml so we just define the xml version over here and then we have to define the beans because whatever the classes or whatever the objects that we will be creating all those will be called beans in the spring so all the objects are beans and we can get those particular beans from the bean factory or the application context wherever the container whatever the container is holding those things so we need to have beans but it's xml it doesn't have the xsd to understand it so we need to provide the namespace and those particular information in the xml so what i'll do i'll just copy paste the details from the documentation and this particular namespace and everything will depend on the spring version that you are using so currently I'm using 5.3.14 hopefully that's the one right 
yeah so accordingly i'll add the bean stack over here so don't worry it's very easy to find if you just google it spring bean xml you will get it and you can directly use it okay so this is what i have done you need to create the bean stack and within this bean stack we can create the beans so whatever the classes that we are creating or we will be creating we can define over here and this particular context this particular xml file we need to provide to our class path so what i'll do i'll just provide this is spring dot xml it's simple thing that we created the context from the spring dot xml so whatever the beans are defined over here we can get those particular beans from the context so how we can get we can directly do context dot get beans method okay so from here we can say okay i want a bean of type doctor simple thing right so in this particular factory whatever the beans are there for the doctor class type we will get that particular bean and we can use this particular bean so if you run this let's see what happens and it should fail obviously you can see that no such bean definition exception because spring still doesn't know that i have to create this bean because we just created the class over here but we have to define that this class whatever i have defined that's a bean that you have to use so that thing we have to define in the spring xml itself so what we will do is we'll create a bean tag and in this particular bean tag we will say which class we want to use we want to use demo dot doctor okay and for every bean that we define we need to make it as unique so we will define the id so i'll just define that id is doctor so we just define the bean now if we go and check and if you run the application again it should work right you can see we got the bean from the contact itself and it is executing cool right let's try to create one more object so what i'll do i'll just create one more class that says nurse okay and this also has the same method let me just copy it from here and i can say nurse is assisting okay if i go to main over here and if i say i just need nurse over here and this is also nurse okay so instead of doctor we'll get the object of nurse and we got the error because we have not defined the bean so let's go ahead and define the bean as well so we'll go to the spring xml over here and let me just define one more bean bean class equals to demo dot nurse and i'll give the id as well id equals to nurse okay let me run this again and you can see that it should work now if you see over here we are defining the type over here right that i want the class of a type nurse but instead of that you can get the values from the id also that you have provided if i just say nurse so here you can see that it will get the data as an object because it doesn't know the type yet so we can do the casting okay and if we do this way also then we should also get the object you can see that it is working completely fine now generally this is not the way that we create the applications right because we'll be having the lot of complex structures right so let's make it something complex let's add the hierarchy so this nurse and this doctor belongs to the staff of the hospital so let me just create the staff interface over here staff is the interface and this staff interface has method void assist okay nurse and doctor both implements staff i'll go to the doctor as well and doctor also implements staff now doctor and nurse both are part of the staff and both have implemented this assist method and now i have added both these beans also in the spring context in this xml file now if i go to the main.java file and instead of doctor i just need the staff to assist okay so what i'll do i'll just say staff over here and i want staff to assist now instead of this what i want is i want the object of doctor for now so i can say doctor dot class now this doctor dot class should be assigned to the staff and we should be able to call the method 
pretty good right now either from the doctor we can change to nurse as well and we should be good here Now you can see here, right? It's pretty simple. We just decouple the entire application. You can see we are not creating the objects. We are not injecting the objects. We are just getting everything from the container itself, Spring container itself. And we define what are the beans that I have in the XML file. Now, if you see, these are just a simple classes. What if we have some properties? So let me go to the doctor class and let's see if I add properties, private string qualification. And for basic Java class, if there is any properties that we are defining, we'll be having the getters and setters. So let me create the getters and setters for this. Okay, these are the getters and setters created. Now what will happen over here is Spring will try to create the object that is doctor, right? So it will create the object, but it doesn't know that it has a property qualification, right? Or what value to add to the qualification, right? It will try to add the default value that is null. So if you want to do that, we can inject those particular values of the properties from the XML file itself. So if you go over here, and if you see, if I want to add some of the properties, that's the setter injection that we are doing. And if I want to add the properties, I can add using the properties tag over here. And you can see that the property is qualification and the value that I want to give is suppose MBBS. Okay. So this is the value of the property that I have provided to the doctor class. So if we, now if you go to this particular class and if I, let me just change to doctor for now. Okay. And I also need to change to doctor. And if I do s out stuff dot get qualification, I should get the qualification. You can see that I got the qualification that is MBBS. So the value MBBS was injected via setters from the XML itself. Now, suppose what if you want to inject the entire object itself, right? So suppose just, just for simplicity, I'm doing over here. Suppose if you want to add the object of nurse over here. Okay. So private nurse nurse, it should not happen, but just for simplicity to understand, I'm just showing you over here. That suppose if you need the object of nurse or whatever over here, what you will do over here is you just define over here nurse. Okay. And if you want to inject the value of nurse, so you will go to the spring.xml file. You have already defined the bean. You have to define the bean, right? Then only spring will understand it. So the bean you have defined over here and here, if you are doing with a constructor argument, you can go ahead with the constructor args tag over here. But here we are just adding the properties. We can add properties. And it doesn't have the value because we need to add the getter setters over here. So let me just add the getter setters. So now you can see we are getting the nurse over here. So now you can see that in the first one, we added the static values because we had a value defined. So we just use the values attribute over here. Here we need to use the ref attribute. So we have to reference the nurse object that we have created over here. So the entire object from here will be injected to this particular doctor class over here, doctor object over here, right? So here you can see that we are just defining the definition like this is what I want. Spring will take care of every, everything. We are not using any instantiation anywhere like new keyword or whatever is available in the Java, right? Everything is done by Spring. So that's the beauty of Spring framework. So let me just remove it because I don't want it. I just uh, added here to show you that we can use this way as well. Let me go to the doctor. Let me remove this property. If I go back to the spring XML, if I remove this as well, and if I want to use the constructor based, then I can use using the constructor arguments and I can give value equals to MBBS. So it will add to the first property. Okay. I need to remove this. Let me just remove this. Go to the main and run this again. We wanted the error and we got it because you can see we could spring could not resolve the matching constructor. So yeah, you can see that we have defined like this particular bean of doctor will have a constructor that's have one argument, but we have not created the constructor. So we need to create a constructor. So if you go to the doctor and if we create the constructor, if I say constructor with 
qualification this is the constructor created now if i go to the main if i run this you can see that i should get the value that is mbbs so this was injected using the constructor injection the earlier which we saw using the properties was the setter injection this was using the constructor injection so these are the two ways that we can use to inject the values to our beans now let's try to do with the annotation based configuration this was the xml based configuration that we did there is also another way that we can implement this using the annotations within the recent spring frameworks you will see everywhere that annotations would be used now to use the annotation based configuration what i'll do i will just comment these beans out because i'll add the annotations for it and now after commenting if i go to the main class okay i'm just using the doctor for now and and let me go to the doctor class over here and let me just remove this everything okay just let's try the simple thing first it has the assist method and from the main as well i'll just remove this now to use the annotations we have to mark this as a spring component okay that's it so what we are telling spring is that whatever the class that we have created is the component that you can use to create the beans out of it that's it right if we try to run it again let's see what happens and it should fail actually and here you can see that it failed over here because spring doesn't know yet like you just created the class you define like it's a component but where i should search that right so we need to define that search here you will get the components so we will go to the spring.xml and we have to define that we need to search the base package so here what i'll do here i'll define context component scan over here okay like in which base package i want to search i'll just say that in the demo package every components are there so search there whatever the components that you are getting try to load those components so we just defined over here and we have just removed every bin definitions and everything and we just added the add the red component over here now if i go to the main class and if i run this again i should get the doctor object you can see we got the doctor object but if we try to get the nurse object right let me try to get the nurse and this is stuff and if i run this you can see that we got the error because spring doesn't know that nurse is a component yet it only knows that doctor is a component if i run this doctor should come right doctor is coming so to make nurse also as a component we can also annotate with at the rate component that's it simple right so this is the annotation based configuration there are a lot of different annotations specific to the specific needs available you can see it's a stereotype annotation so there are a lot of different annotations available so once you explore the different uh, tools or projects in the spring framework then you will get to know more about the different annotations also so you can uh, understand that this is the way that spring handles the annotation based configuration as well the other thing is we can handle using the java configuration as well so let's try to create the java configuration so for java configuration we have to create a configuration class so let me just create the java class that says bean config okay and this particular bean config i need to annotate with at the rate configuration you can see that it's part of the context annotation and it will try to say spring that this is the configuration that whatever the configuration has been defined we need to act accordingly now what i will do i will here also say the same thing that you say in the xml so in the xml whatever currently it is there right currently you can see that we have defined only one thing this is not the xml this is the spring.xml right currently we have defined only one thing that is component scan where we need to scan the components the same thing we will define in our bean config we are not going to define the other beans for now i'll just say component scan over here and where to scan i'll just say base package equals to demo that's it okay this is a simple thing that we did over here now if you go to the main dot java file here instead of class path application context we need to use this particular configuration that we are using so let me just comment it out over here and i'll use the different context okay let's say application context context equals to new i'll just say annotation config application context and here i'll define bean config dot class this is the class that defines the configuration for my annotations so it will refer to this particular bean config class 
and it says okay this is a configuration class and we need to scan demo as the base package and whatever the components are there we need to load those components that's it we'll go to the main we are not using the xml now we are using the bean config if you run this it should work completely fine and you can see that it's working fine now the other thing also that we saw in the xml is when we had not defined this component scan we had defined the beans right so this also we can do using the configuration so if we go to the bean config and here for the same thing what i'll do i'll just remove this okay for now but i don't want okay let it be what i'll do i'll just say public method which will return doctor i'll say this is also doctor and i'll say return new doctor so yeah you can see that i just created the method over here that is the public doctor doctor which is returning the new object of the doctor and you can and i what i'll say i'll just say this is the bean that you need to load okay so whenever you're loading anything this is the bean that you need to load and to make this work what i'll do i will remove the component from here this is not the component now i'm defining bean myself in the configuration this is the bean of type doctor that i need simple thing right and if i go to the main this should work the same way because whenever it will try to load the bean configuration there is a method that has been defined as a bean so this will be acted as a bean the new doctor will be created with a default constructor that whatever i'm defining over here and it will be available in the container let me just run this it should work cool right so this is the way that whatever we define in the xml we can define here as well the same thing whatever you did in the xml configuration like constructor injection setter injection everything is the same way you have to define this way either with the bean or you can annotate with the component make it as a component and it will be available in the context now let's understand about the different scopes available in the spring bean so whenever the spring is creating the beans we need to define how those particular beans we want right there are five different types of scopes available in spring bean by default all the beans will be created using the singleton scope so for each and every class there will be only one single object available in the entire application so by default that's the thing that spring is going to do but if you want we can ask for the different types of scope as well so there are five scopes available that is singleton prototype request session and global session the other three that is request session and global session are used mainly when there is a web aware context available so that is when we are implementing the spring mvc but we can still go ahead and see the singleton and prototype design patterns and how to define the different scopes of being in the spring application so default is singleton which will always result into one particular object in the entire application and prototype is you will get a different object every time when you request the object from the container request is used when you need one object or you need a different object for each and every request that you receive in the application so currently let's try to see the current scope that is the singleton scope by default available and see what it happens so whenever we do any changes that changes should reflect to all the particular objects that we get so here what i'll try to do is i'll go to the doctor class and i'll add the qualification again and i'll add the get assets for it okay and i'll also generate the two string method okay this is the two thing that i have done over here that i have added the qualification property added the get assets for it and i have overridden the two string method over here and if i go to the main class over here and let me just say i need a doctor okay let me convert this to doctor and doctor dot assist okay that's fine now what i'll do i'll just try to do as out doctor okay and let me run the application currently you can see that i'm getting doctor is assisting and i'm getting doctor qualification is null but before that let me just set the doctor dot set qualification to mbbs so i just set the mbbs as a qualification and i'm getting the qualification as well now after this let me try to get the object again so i'll just say doctor doctor1 equals to context dot get bean i need doctor dot class and i'll do system dot out dot print ln doctor1 simple thing right 
I just took the object doctor over here and then I added the qualification and after that I'm getting the doctor again from the container and if I run this again you should see that I'm getting the same object back right I have set the value over here and I'm getting the object back again because by default is the singleton design pattern implemented for all the beans scope of the beans so spring is creating only one object for the entire application and i am getting the same object and if you want to change it right so you can go ahead to the doctor class over here and you can write with at the rate scope okay you can define the scope over here and you can see that there is a scope name available and if you define singleton then this will be your default scope that will be singleton and if you want to change the scope suppose i want to change the scope of this particular bean to prototype then i can go ahead and change to prototype when i change this to prototype for every time when i try to get the object from the container i'll get a new object so if i go to the main again and if i run this for my second object i should not get the mbbs because that should be the new object where mbbs is not set because in only first object i have set the values so if i run this so you can see that we got the mbbs in both the objects because we have not added the component over here we have to make this as a component so once i make this as a component and if i go to the bin config let me just remove this bin for now now everything is coming from the component of a doctor that sets the scope as a prototype and if i run this again let me go to the main.java and then if i run this i should get mbbs for the first and null for the second so that means based on the scope that we defined spring will create the objects and it will return the objects accordingly from the container so now we understood how to create the beans how to define the different scopes we need to understand the life cycle of a been as well and what are the ways that spring gives us to do any modification in that particular life cycle so in the spring life cycle there are seven different steps the first thing is the definition of a bean that you will define that these are the beans that we need to create and after that spring will try to instantiate those beans so that's the bean creation or the instantiation process that particular step in the life cycle after that it will try to populate the properties so whatever the id that you have provided what are the different scopes that you have provided or the default values or whatever that you have provided for that particular bean spring will try to add those particular or set those particular values so the next step is the post initialization step in this step whatever the aware interfaces that you have implemented those particular interfaces will be executed like whatever the custom execution that you want to do in the bean life cycle that particular will be executed so after that bean would be ready to serve all the dependencies and everything would be injected and the bean would be ready and would be available in the container and the next two steps are the destruction of the beans the sixth step is to pre destroy so whenever a particular bean is trying to get destroyed right so whenever any cleanup is happening at that time if you want to execute in custom logic like to uh, delete some data or to release the connection or release the or to close the file or anything at that particular time you will define your custom implementation in the pre destroy phase and then the last step would be bin destroyed at this particular time bin will be destroyed from the jvm itself so this is the spring bin life cycle where all these particular steps have been mentioned and what happens at what particular step so if you want to do any modification then how we can do the modification that we need to understand so from this diagram you can see that once the bin definition is been passed that particular bin will be instantiated and then after that it will populate all the properties and after that all the aware interfaces which are there those will be executed there are different aware interfaces so the bean name aware would be executed first then it would be bean factory aware then application context aware then pre initialization bean post processor process will happen and then initializing beans after property set will be executed and after that if there is any custom methods then those particular custom methods will be executed and after that post initialization process will happen and at that particular time bin will be ready to use and when the container shuts down disposable beans destroy method will be executed and then 
any custom method is there and custom destroy method that will be executed and then the bean will be clear from the JVM. Now why we need to implement custom methods in the bean lifecycle? Suppose assigning a default values, right? So whenever you want to create any bean, if you want to give some default values like a file path or anything, at that time we can use this particular custom methods to inject those values. If you want to open or close the files or if you want to open a DB connection and close the DB connection when the object is created and destroyed. So at that particular lifecycle points we can create the custom methods and we can create the connection and we can destroy the connection and if you want to start the threads or destroy the threads at the time of construction and destruction of the beans for those purpose also we can use this particular custom methods in the bean lifecycle so these are just the different examples that i have given you at this particular places this bean lifecycle can be very handy so let's see in the code how we can do this so the first thing we'll do is we will implement one aware interface Okay, uh, so in the doctor class, what I'll do, I will try to let me use bean name aware. Okay, and for this, I need to implement the method. So let's go ahead and implement the set bean name method. And this is the method. Okay, so what I'll do, I'll just do a out over here and I'll just say set bean name method is called. Okay, simple thing. Let's go ahead and run this. Let's just comment this out. And you can see that before creating the object, set bean name method was called and after that doctor is assisting this particular method was called. Okay, so this way we can implement all the different aware interfaces which are available to modify the behavior of the lifecycle. The other thing also we can do is to use the annotations. So suppose once the object is created, right, at that particular time, if you want to call anything, what we will do, we will create one method public void and we will say post construct and I will say as out post construct method is called okay and I need to annotate it with at the rate post construct but that particular annotation is available in the java x annotation api so we need to add the dependency for that so let me just go ahead and add the dependency let's say java x java x dot annotation api which is part of java x dot annotation and the version is 1.3.2 let me just refresh the main one and if i go to the doctor again if i do post construct now that it is available if i go to main if i run this i should get it you can see that the name was called first and then after that post construct method was called and after that object was created and i was able to execute this object the same way you can go ahead and implement the pre-destroy method as well so this way you can add the custom method implementation for your bean life cycle so this was all about the spring framework and the dependency injection what are the different features available and how we can use spring framework for our advantages if you know this basics and if you know this concepts very well then you'll be able to understand any of the libraries available within the spring ecosystem because for everything this is the base so we already learned about the spring framework and in this video we are going to learn about the aop with spring framework so first of all let's understand what is aop aop stands for aspect oriented programming now okay that's the definition but what exactly it is right aspect oriented programming is just a methodology with which we will create the applications just like oop right object oriented programming we create the application Similar to that, there is an aspect oriented programming with which we will create our application. Why AOP and what are the benefits? Let's first understand that. So AOP gives us the flexibility to remove the cross cutting concerns from our application and to separate it out from the main business logic. That's a lot of jargons, right? So let's understand what are cross cutting concerns and why we need to separate it out. So when we are creating the application, we tend to do a lot of things, right? So suppose Let's take the example of a shopping cart, right? So in the shopping cart, what we do is we add the items to the shopping cart, which we want to buy. And from that shopping cart, if you want to remove the items, we can remove the items. And after that, that particular shopping cart, we will check out the shopping cart and we will try to order those items which are there in the shopping cart. We will do the payment for that and we will add the shipping address and payment details and everything. So all these things will happen. And to do all these things, what we generally do is we try to add a lot of different logics to it, right? There will be a lot of business logics also. 
and there will be a lot of different extra things that we are going to do. Suppose we are going to do the logging for each and every request that is going for the shopping cart. Whatever the actions are performed by the user for that particular request, we are going to log all those data in the loggers so that we can understand when there is an issue, what happened to that particular request. So that thing we will do, try to add the loggers. The other thing we will be possibly doing is to handle the authentication and authorization. We will try to see that particular request is authorized and authenticated properly. Whatever the features the user is trying to use, that particular user has all those rights to use that feature or not. So this type of logic also will be going to implement. Then there might be logics to convert the input data, whatever we are getting input data to sanitize those data, right? So whatever the JSON format or whatever the JSON input that we would be getting it from the request, we would sanitize those data. So these are all the things that we would do every time when we get a request, either it would be in the payment page, either it would be in the shopping cart, either when adding the data to the shopping cart, while going to the home page anywhere. This type of things that generally we do. And this is completely different from the business logic that we have because for each and every operation that we do, business logic will be different. But these are the things that we would generally do. So these are known as cross cutting concerns. So what aspect oriented programming tells us that just try to remove those cross cutting concerns from the main business logic and keep those things as a different place and run it separately. So. That means your business logic is completely different and your cross cutting concerns like logging, authenticating, authorization, you are sanitizing the data and everything are at the different places. So that's what we are going to do, right? To separate out the cross cutting concerns in this video. So we will be taking one example where we will see what are the different ways that we can do, what are the different methods available, what are the different ways that we can implement it. We would be using the AspectJ library to implement this uh, AOP with Spring Framework. So let's open IntelliJ IDEA and let's see the demo for it. And before that, if you're enjoying this video, then give us a like on this video and subscribe to this channel for awesome new videos. If you want, you can also join this channel by clicking on the join button below and support me. Now let's go to the IntelliJ IDEA. So let me just open the IntelliJ IDEA. And here I'll create the sample Maven project. So let me just create a new project over here. And here I'll just select the Maven. Project SDK is Java 11. I'll click on next and the name of the project I'll give as let me just give Spring AOP demo and in the artifact let me give com.daily code buffer so this is what you give to make your group ID as unique and the artifact ID I'll give as the Spring AOP demo and the version I'll just keep it the same 1.0 hyphen snapshot and let's just click on finish to generate the project. So here in this pom.xml file, we have to add the dependencies for the aspect J and the dependencies for the spring context because we will be using the aspect J library and the spring framework to implement this demo. So let's do that. What we have to do, we just need to add the dependencies tag. Inside dependency, we need to add the dependency. So we will add the dependency. Here I need to add the spring context from the org.spring framework and the version I'll add as 5.3.14. So this is the one dependency that I've added. Let's add the other. And if you don't know how to add this particular dependencies tag, don't worry, I'll show you one way as well. You can directly go to the Maven repository and you can search from there and you can add. Okay, so just go to the browser. Okay, and here search for Maven repository. And here you can search everything suppose spring context so here you will get that this is a spring context and you can go here you can go to the version and you can just copy this details and you can paste in the pom.xml file similarly i just need the aspect j as well okay aspect j runtime so i'll just go here and i'll just take the stable version okay so this is the stable version and i'll just copy this and I'll add the in the dependency. Okay. And let me go back and I just need the aspect J weaver as well. So let me go here, go to the 1.9.7, the same version, copy it and add. Okay. Just save it and refresh your Maven project. And all these dependencies will be added in your project. So the process is completed now. Now, 
let's go to the src folder main java and here we can create the package so let me just create a package that says demo okay so let me create the uh, main class over here i'll just create the java class and says main and inside this i'll just create the main method this is simple thing okay now what i'm going to do is i'm going to create one shopping cart class so let me just create a shopping cart class and this has a method public void checkout and i'm just printing out one thing okay checkout method from shopping cart called i know spellings are wrong let me just correct it okay so consider that this is a checkout method and it's doing the checkout for your items in the cart but for simplicity i have just written one print statement over here which is printing that checkout method for shopping cart is called considering this is a logic okay now in the spring we need to create the bean for this shopping cart so we need to make this as a component right and to get this all the components either we can go with the xml based configuration or we can go with the annotation based configuration so what we'll do we'll go with the annotation based configuration with the bean config file so let me just create a configuration file i'll create java class and say bean config and this one bean config i'll say this is a configuration okay with the configuration annotation and what i'll do i'll just enable the component scan and i'll say base package is equals to demo so this is my demo as a base package so whatever the components that i'm going to create it will scan all those components it will scan all the components in this base package available okay now if i go to the main and i can get that from the application context so i can say application context context equals to new annotation config application context near i can give bean config dot class simple right this is the same thing that we did in the spring framework video we got the context and from this particular context we can get the beans so suppose i want the shopping cart bean right so i'll just say shopping cart cart equals to context dot get bean here i'll say i need the bean of type shopping cart dot class and i can say cart dot checkout simple stuff let's run this and it's working fine right checkout method for shopping cart is called now if you go here in the shopping cart generally what you do when you have a lot of logics available right you can do logging right you will do logging like uh, you have entered into this particular method and you have exited this method you will do authentication and authorization you can do sanitization sanitize the data right so these are the general stuff that we will be doing every time right but this is your business logic so what aop as we defined in the earlier right is to separate out the cross cutting concerns so these are the cross cutting concerns that we need to separate it out now all the cross cutting concerns that we want to separate it out that's called an aspect so this is the aspect this is the aspect this is the aspect logging okay so for all these different cross cutting concerns we can create the different aspects so let's take an example for logging as for logging let's create the aspect so in the demo let me create a class that says logging aspect okay and whatever the aspect that you have created that you need to annotate with aspect okay so we annotated with this particular aspect now here you can create the different methods that can be executed now if you create a method right suppose public void logger suppose you want to add the loggers and you just added loggers here right 
whatever now how the system will get to know okay this is the logging aspect and this is something that we have to learn and from where we have to learn so this is something that we have to add so we need to define the point cuts so this is a point cut if you can say okay like what we have to run what we have to run like this is something that we have to run but we have to define where we have to run so for that we will be creating the point cuts and at what location we have to run so wherever the point cuts you are calling right like suppose if you go to the shopping cart and at this point you want to call that particular point cut that particular method so this is known as a join point so the, it's simple to understand okay you just don't get confused with the lot of different uh, jargons like what is point cut join point aspect and everything simple thing we need to understand is what is something that we want to call and where we want to call that's it we just need to define these two things and that's what we are going to learn in a simple way so suppose consider this is a method that we have to call at every method before the execution starts simple thing right so whenever whenever there is any method available right suppose let's consider a simple thing for this particular checkout method whenever this checkout method is getting executed i want to call this logger simple right so what i can do is i can define the annotation that is the before annotation okay and in this particular before annotation i can define before calling this method i want to call this method simple so what you are doing is you are just removing whatever code that you might have written from the log for the logging from here to a different altogether aspect so here i can define the execution okay so in this execution you can define which particular methods that you want to invoke okay so i can say i just want to invoke the method from demo package dot shopping cart dot checkout method whatever the return type may be simple thing i just define like for any return type whatever the return type currently it is void so that's fine so that's why i have written mention star in the demo package shopping cart type that is the class in that there is a checkout method for this particular checkout method i want to call this logger where before before calling this method okay now if you could try to run this still it won't work because if we can check it won't work right you can see that it didn't work because we need to enable it so if you go to the configuration bin config and here we need to enable enable aspect j auto proxy so once we define this and if you go back and run this again still it didn't work because how spring will know that there is something called aspect because spring just understands what components right so let me go to the logging aspect make sure that this is a component so it's in the spring's radar okay because we have defined that whatever is inside the demo package we need it right so let's go back to the main class and let's run this again and now we should get it you can see that the logger was called first and then the actual method was called okay so that means you just removed the loggers from the main method only kept the business logic and you just removed the loggers to the new aspect that you created that is the logger aspect now there are different uh, point cuts that we can call right suppose currently we call for before we can call for after we can call after returning a value we can call after throwing a value okay and we can also call around the method so these are the five things that you can call a method for so let me let me go to the uh, logging aspect again and let's create for after as well okay i'll just tell this as a before logger and let's create one more public void after logger and i'll just say as out after logger and i'll just say before logger just to separate it out and i'll annotate this with after okay because i want to call it after and i want to call around the method so i'll just define in the execution and here i'll just define that star for any return type star for any package dot star for any class dot 
checkout method let's run this let's go to the main and let's run this and you can see that it worked because we have defined in the logging aspect this way that for any return type for any package for any class if there is a checkout method then we need to run this particular method okay now what if i just add any of the input parameter suppose i'll just in add the input parameter string status okay and now if we try to run this okay there is an error so we need to go to the main class and here i can say status is cancelled suppose okay and if i run this again and here you can see that only checkout method for shopping cart was called so the aspect was not called so to make sure that the aspect matches the input parameter as well we need to go to the logging aspect and here in this particular parenthesis we just need to define two dots so it will just make sure that whatever the number of parameters are there it will match okay and if i go ahead and run this again it should work you can see that it is working completely fine so we just saw that how to define a particular point cut over here and what are the patterns that we can give for the point cut to match the join point now let's define one more aspect because we need to separate out the authentication and authorization as well right so let me just create one more java class that says authentication aspect okay and as we did in the logging aspect we need to annotate with aspect and we need to annotate with component as well now here what we can do is we can create a point cuts and that point cuts also we can define in the methods to be called so suppose if you have multiple point cuts right so suppose we have multiple different packages available and for all the different packages we want to do the authentication and authorization so we can define the different types of point cuts like this is the point cut for this particular package this point cut for this particular uh, package for different packages and you can call the aspect for all the different types of point cuts so let's so let's try to do that i'll create one more method public void i'll just say authenticating authenticating point cut okay and i'll just say public void authorization point cut okay you can see that i just created two point cuts so rather than directly defining where to call let me just mark this as a point cut so i can mark with as red point cut annotation now here we if you see the logging aspect you can see we use the execution over here so this execution defines for a pitch which particular method that you want to execute and here in the authenticating aspect we will define with within so this will define for which particular type of class that we want to execute for all the methods available so i just want like whatever the methods available for the shopping cart i want to execute the authentication so i can just define for all the demo dot dot star simple thing and for all the types within this particular demo package i want to execute this authentication point cut and similarly this also i want to define within within means for your class your type okay and within the demo package if you want you can select the shopping cart okay dot star for any methods this we also we can do and we can give directly dot to make sure that for any of the class okay let's keep it this way also so you we have uh, one more example for this as well now these are the two point cuts that we created now we need to call this point cuts as well so what i'll do i'll just say public void authenticate and i'll just say sop as out authenticating the request spelling is wrong let me just correct it okay so i'm just trying to authenticate the request now i need to check where so i just want to do before okay i want to do before a method is called when so here i just want to define like when i want to do the authentication i want to do authentication before the point cards that i have mentioned because first thing i want to do when any request comes is to authenticate that request 
so here i'll define that i just need to do authenticate so whatever the point cut i have defined right it will come here at the authentication point cut authenticating point cut but i also want at the time of authorizing point cut so i can define with and and operator and authorization point cut okay so i'm just telling for these two authenticating point cut and authorizing point cut i want to call this method if you want you can also go ahead with or or as well okay and you can go with and and as well so either of the whatever the requirements we can call these particular point cuts this way as well so let's go ahead and run this if you go to the main if you run the method again and it didn't work so let me just change to all the type over here and let's run this again it should work now and yeah you can see that it is working authenticating the request okay so this way we can define for the type as well and if we have this available in the different packages also then we can go ahead and add the different packages and we can mix and match the packages with and condition or or conditions now these are just the simple things that we did like how to call the uh, aspects now there will be scenarios where we need to get the data as well so whatever is happening within the shopping method we might need those details as well suppose we need to have the input arguments we need to have the return variables and everything so let's try to understand that as well suppose for this particular logging aspect if we can see for the checkout method we have defined that we might also get the input variable or we might not get as well and here we have defined that there is an input variable now let's see what are the different ways that we can get and if you want anything to access within this then we can define the join point over here join point object okay and from this join point object you can see we can get many things what is the kind what is the signature source location static part what are the two long strings short strings arguments target this lot of things that we can get for the point cut whatever we have defined so let's try to get the signature okay and let me just add this in the sys out what is the signature of the method that has been called and if you go ahead and run this and you can see that the signature is void demo shopping cart dot checkout and the input parameter is string okay so you can see this way we can get the details now let's try to get the details of the arguments so the arguments we have passed is type string and let's try to check what is the value suppose if we want the value right to log anything so we can do that way so in the logging here what i'll do let me just comment this out and i can take gp dot get arguments okay so it will return the array of arguments so we might have multiple arguments right so it will return the array and from that array i just need the first argument because i have only passed one argument and that argument is type string so i just want to convert it to two string so this is my argument that i am getting and if i get in this string argument over here before loggers with argument okay i'm just printing that argument so let's run this so we should get that argument as well and you can see that the argument that we had passed was cancelled and we are getting the cancelled here that before logger with argument cancelled so this way you can see that we just define that whatever the input parameters are there we can access those input parameters at the join points and we can do any operation so we just logged it like whatever we had to do to log now we can also access the return type as well what is the return type so let me change a method let me add a method okay public int quantity simple quantity i've just created a simple method which defines the quantity and it's returning value 2 so whatever is been written over here if we want to access that we can access using the after returning annotation so let's go to the logging aspect let's create one more method public void after returning 
and I can just sys out after returning. Okay, now for this we need to define a point cut, right? So what I'll do, I'll just define public void after returning. Hope the spelling is correct. After returning point cut, and I'll just mention this is a point cut. And point cut is execute execution, and execution is for any return type from demo dot shopping cart dot quantity method and I'll just keep double dot so if we change the input variables also in the future this will work so this is a point cut where we have to execute and we want to get the input variable as well so the input variable suppose I can say it's a type of string right and I can say it's a return value now how I will get the values over here so here I need to define after returning and here at which point cut I need to call this so I can define point cut equals to the point cut name is after returning point cut. This is what we created, right? So I'll just mention this over here after returning point cut. This place I want to call this. Now I need to define the return value as well. So what is the return value? Returning. And what it is returning to? It is returning to the input variable that I have defined over here. So it will return the value to this variable. And we can access that variable over here. Hope this is clear. We just created the point cut over here. That point cut defines that this point cut has to be executed where? At the quantity method of the shopping cart. And this is the execution that I want for that. So I just define that after returning, whatever has been returned from here, after returning to, this has to be called. So I just define this after returning point cut. This will be called. And what will be the return value? That returning value should be coming to this ret well variable that has been passed into the input variable and here if I say after returning plus return value so I should get to over here simple right so similarly we can also define for the after throwing as well where if there is any exception we can get the exception and we can work for that particular exception in this aspect so this was just a quick intro about the aspect j and how we can use it with the spring framework and there are a lot of different things that we can do like for all the different types of packages and we, and for all the different types of methods that we can define and how those will be executed we can define using the point cuts. So this is all the basics and foundation of the aspect J. If you want to learn more I will just link the documentation for it. In one page everything is defined there and it's very easy to understand. After this video you will be able to understand that very easily. start with the basics of a theory first and then we'll move ahead with the application itself. So we will learn what is Spring and what is Spring Boot framework and why we need a Spring Boot at the first place. After that we will see how to create a REST APIs using the Spring Boot framework. We will take one of the example and with that example we will try to create all the REST API endpoints like get data, delete data, update data, save data, get a particular data. So all those endpoints we'll try to create. After that we will try to add the logging in Spring Boot. After that we will try to add the particular configurations in the configuration files. After that we will try to add the exception handling in the Spring Boot. We will see how we can do the exception handling and all those stuffs. After that, we will implement the unit testing for all the layers. So whatever layers we create like controller layer, service layer, database layer, for all those layers we will implement the unit testing using the JUnit and Mockito. We will do all this using the in-memory H2 database and after that once you are comfortable with any of the database then we will convert that in-memory H2 database to actual SQL database. So we'll be using MySQL database. So we will save all the data in our database. After that we will see how to get a particular values from the configuration files, whatever data or whatever configurations you can add in the properties file, how to fetch all those data. So we will also see how to implement 
metrics for your Spring Boot application, how you can monitor your application and how you can deploy your application to production. We will also see what are the different ways we can deploy Spring Boot application in our servers. So this is going to be a pretty advanced and long tutorial. So stick around till the end to learn everything in detail. I suggest you to practice alongside what I teach you for each and every topics. So you will get more hands on experience for all the topics that we cover in this tutorial. So this is all about the different concepts and topics that we are going to cover in this particular tutorial this is going to be very fun and very interactive video so watch till the end and learn spring boot framework now firstly let's see what is spring and spring boot so spring is a java framework built to create an enterprise ready application so when you create a java application there are a lot more things that you have to do a lot of configurations, a lot of property additions and a lot of technologies or a lot of packages and a lot of modules and jar files that you need to add to create your applications. Now Spring is a framework that allows us as a Java developer to do a lot of things. There are a lot of modules available for different kind of stuff that we can use as a part of Spring framework. There is Spring Core, Spring MVC, Spring Web, Spring Batch, Spring Data, Spring Data JPA. There are a lot of stuffs available. In the Spring Framework, we can use all those stuffs for our different activities. So we can only concentrate about the actual coding that we have to do. But when you're creating a Spring application, there is a lot of configuration that you have to do, right? If you're working with Spring Framework and you want to include Hibernate, then you have to do the configurations for that. If you want to include any caching mechanism, then you have to do configurations for that. If you want to use any messaging queue, you have to do the configurations for that as well. So as a Java developer, as a Spring user, you have to do a lot of configurations to get ready with your application. After that, once you create your application, you have to deploy your application to any of the application server or web server. So there are a lot of moving parts when you are working with the Java applications. So Spring framework makes it easy for us to create all the application but there is a lot of configuration that we have to do so with this in mind spring developers thought of okay let's create something easier so all the developers can really concentrate on their actual work only concentrate on the convention not the configuration part so for that they created the spring boot now what is spring boot spring boot is just the extension of a spring framework it's not a different framework spring boot itself uses the spring framework internally it's just the extension layer for our spring framework now spring boot provides key benefits for use for a java developer firstly the main thing is rapid application development spring boot provides us to do the rapid application development so whatever application that we want to create we can create using spring boot very easily the other thing is managing the dependencies when you are working with the spring framework also at that time also you have to add a lot of dependencies that you are using for your application Spring Boot provides a way to group all those dependencies into a different starter templates. So Spring Boot provides different starter templates that includes all the dependencies that are required to do that particular task. So suppose if you want to work with the JDBC, then there is a Spring Boot starter JDBC template available that will include all the dependencies required to do that particular thing. If you want to work with the JPA, there is a Spring Boot starter JPA template available that will include all the dependencies required to do that particular task. There is a Spring Boot starter test available to do all our Spring Boot unit testing using the JUnit and Mockito. So there are a lot of different templates available that we can directly use as a starter template and we can directly work with it. The other thing Spring Boot provide is the auto configuration. So whenever we implement any of the things, we have to do the configuration for all those stuffs. Suppose if we implement Hibernate, we have to do the Hibernate configuration. Suppose we implement any messaging queue, we have to do the configuration for that messaging queue. If we implement any of the other libraries, there might be one or the other configuration that we have to do to work with the Spring Framework. What Spring Boot does is the auto configuration for all those dependencies, all those libraries that we can use. So if you want to implement Hibernate, just add the Hibernate dependencies using the Spring Boot starter. All those configurations will be added automatically using the Spring Boot auto configurer template over here. So that's a really good benefit for all the developers here. The other benefit that I like is the embedded servers. So if you see the traditional way of deploying the Java application is like you create the application, you create the war files of your entire application and you deploy that war file in any of the application server or the web server, either JBoss, Tomcat or WebSphere or anything. You will deploy your war file to that particular server. But with Spring Boot, that particular server will be embedded to that particular entire application. So we won't be creating the war file of our application, we will be creating the jar file 
and in that particular jar file our server will be embedded so we can directly run that jar file in any of the environment so it's always production ready so there are a lot more benefits to work with the spring boot applications and the main thing is market is moving towards the microservices architecture rather than creating the monolith so to create all the microservices using java spring boot is the default option so now with this it is pretty much clear that spring boot is the way to go now whenever we talk about the spring framework or spring boot dependency injection is the topic that everyone discuss right so let's understand why dependency injection is so hype over here so if you take any of the programming languages or any of the frameworks for that particular programming languages dependency injection pattern is a default way they will go for creating the different objects in the application now why that now if you take the traditional example you create any of the class in your java application suppose student now to create the object of that student what you will do student as equals to new student so that means you yourself is creating the object of that particular class over here and when there are a lot of hundreds and thousands of classes created and all those classes are interrelated to each other then it's not a good idea to use that approach to create the class manually so in this type of scenarios inversion of controls comes into picture what is inversion of control inversion of control is nothing but to give the control from yourself as a developer to the framework that you are using so suppose if you are using spring framework that means we are giving the control to spring to create the object for us we will just tell the spring okay you are the boss you create the object for me i'll just directly use it so that's the inversion of control we gave the control to spring now to implement that thing dependency injection is the pattern that we use dependency injection means suppose you have created one of the class that is student and in that particular class there is a another class that is subject available so you don't have to create that particular object for that dependency injection pattern will create that particular object for you whenever you want so what will happen is when the spring boot application start it have the factory that will create the all the objects or all the beans of your application so suppose if you have hundreds and thousands of classes in your application all those particular classes object will be created when that particular spring boot context is started and all those particular beans will be stored in one of the springs container and whenever you want that particular bean or particular object you will tell okay spring i want this particular class and spring will give you directly you don't have to create the object spring already has all the objects you can directly use it so this is a very important part to understand when we do the demo we'll be using it everywhere so at that time i will show you how to do this but this is the theoretical part that you should understand what is ioc and what is dependency injection so this is the concept in which everything will be working so this is all about inversion of control and dependency injection in spring framework now let's go ahead and start our applications so spring boot provides us one tool to create the bare minimum or bare bone spring boot applications and on that we can create our applications so let's see what it is it's called spring initializer so let's go to that tool if you go to start.spring.io over here i'll link that into the description below so you can check this out so with this particular tool we can create the bare bone spring boot project so here you can see that there are different things available over here Here you can see that project information you can create the maven project or you can create the gradle project so these are the two project build tools available maven and gradle i'll be choosing the maven over here and you can see that you can choose any of the language over here there is an option for java kotlin and groovy we'll go ahead with the java over here and here you can see that you can choose the different spring boot versions available over here yeah you can see that different snapshot versions available release candidate versions available there will be a different m1 m2 m3 there are that means a milestone versions available i suggest you to always go ahead with the latest stable version available currently it's 2.4.5 whenever you are watching this video whatever the latest version available you can select that particular version over here so i'll be just selecting 2.4.5 over here and if you go to the bottom over here you can see the different packaging type is available it's jar available and war file available we'll always go ahead with the jar file and at the below you can select the java version whichever java version is available you can select i have java 11 installed in my machine so i'll go ahead with the java 11 over here you can see that you have to add the different project metadata over here yeah you can see that you have to add the group artifact the project name project description and your base package over here so let's go ahead and give this information i'll just give com dot 
daily code buffer com dot daily code buffer over here and artifact I'll give as Spring Boot tutorial. The name of the project is Spring Boot tutorial. The description is demo project for Spring Boot. That's fine. And here I will change the package name as Spring Boot dot tutorial. So that's it. Now if you see over here, you can add the different dependencies over here. So as we will be creating the REST APIs in this particular application, Spring Web is the base dependencies that we need to add. So if you click on the add dependencies over here, you can see there are a lot of dependencies available. Yeah, you can search for it and you can add multiple over here. So we'll search for the web over here. Yeah, you can see that Spring Web build web including RESTful application using Spring MVC uses Apache Tomcat as the default embedded container. So when we add the Spring Web in our project, it will add all the default libraries that is needed to create our Spring Web application. So let's add this over here. We can add multiple over here as well. If you go ahead and click Control B, you can see that there are shortcuts available. You can use all those things. Let me add over here. So currently we'll be using the H2 in-memory database over here. So if you don't have any database installed in your application, then also you can follow along the tutorial. So let's add that H2 in-memory database for now and later when you are comfortable with the Spring Boot application and then you can go ahead install any of the database and you can connect that database. So currently let's add the H2 database. So you can see this is the H2 database provides a fast in-memory database that supports JDBC API and R2DBC access with a small 2 MB footprint. Supports embedded and server modes as well as browser based console application. So we'll be using this browser based console application for this H2 database. So let's add this over here. Now you can see that we added all those particular informations. We added all the dependencies that we want to start our application. And if you click the explore button over here, you can see that this is your entire project. If you see this, this is the pom.xml file as we have created the Maven project over here. And here you can see that this is the parent available. Okay. This is the Spring Boot startup parent and version information over here. And these are all the project metadata that you added over there. And these are the dependencies that you added. You added Spring Web dependency and we added H2 database dependency. And Spring Boot Starter is the default uh, dependency added for our unit testing. So this is the particular pom.xml file. And if you go to the SRC folder over here, this is the entire folder structure. If you see SRC means Java com dot daily code buffer dot Spring Boot dot tutorial. This is our default package that we created and this is the base file Spring Boot Tutorial application Java that is created. This is the main application file with this our application will start. And here you can see that we have resources folder where we have our application properties. We have test folder for our unit testing. So this is the entire project structure that we will be getting it. Let's close this. We can generate the project from here. And if you want to share this project with anyone with all the dependencies and all this particular information added, then you can click on share. And with this particular link, everything will be added with by default values, whatever you added over here. So if you want to share with anyone, this is a great uh, tool to share those particular project details as well. So this is all about the Spring Initializer project. Let's generate the project and then we'll open in any of the IDs available. So let's generate it. And here you can see that the project is generated. So this is the project that we downloaded over here. Let me just extract it. Now we can open this particular project in any of the IDs of your particular choice. You can use IntelliJ IDEA, you can use STS that is built on Eclipse. You can use Eclipse itself. You can use VS code. You can use any of the editor as well. There are a lot of different plugins available for all the different editors. You can add those plugins and it will be very useful for the Java applications as well. Nowadays, I really like to work with VS code as well with the different plugins available for Spring Boot applications. But today, we will be working with the IntelliJ IDEA. There is an IntelliJ IDEA community edition that is free of cost that you can download. I will add the link in the description below for you to check that out. I will also add the link for the STS for you to download. So let's open the project in IntelliJ IDEA and we will also open the same project in STS and see how it works. So this is the project over here. Let me open the IntelliJ IDEA. And here, let me just open the project. I'll click on open. And here, my project is available. 
inside my g directory spring boot tutorial this is the project okay so let me open this particular project press the project you can see that it is downloading all the meme dependencies and indexing all the files so once that is completed you can see this is my project over here this is my pom.xml file over here and this is my source directory main java this is my package and this is my main application file over here and if you go to the resources folder you can see the static temp static folder templates folder and this is my main application dot properties file over here now let me show you how to open the same in sts also okay let me just minimize it let me open the spring tool suit I'm creating the workspace over here. I'll launch it. Here we'll import the project and our project is Maven. So I'll just go to Maven existing Maven project. I'll browse the directory. It's over here G directory Spring Boot tutorial select folder and here you can see that pom.xml file is been identified so click on finish and here you can see that this particular project is imported and at the below you can see that all the Maven dependencies are getting downloaded over here and here you can see that if you open this is your main spring boot application.java file over here you have all your property file as well now to run this particular application using sts you can go to spring boot tutorial right click on it and click on run as spring boot app over here okay you can also do run as java application to run from here so this is how your application will run from spring tool suit if you go to intellij idea if you want to run the application you can see that if you have opened spring boot tutorial application.java which is the main file over here you have the play button you can directly click on it to run the application else you can go to the file over here that is spring boot tutorial application right click on it and click on run over here after you start running here you can see that the play button is over here you can run from there as well so this is how you can run your application using sts and intellij idea so we'll be using the intellij idea only but if you are using sts you can open this way and you can run from here as well there is an another way to run from the command prompt as well that also i'll show you in a bit so let me just close this sts for now okay but you should get an idea like how to work with it as well so let me just close it and here you can see that this is my application over here so let's go through everything over here so if you go to pom.xml file over here so here in the spring initializer also we saw that we had different uh, starters available at the starting also we talked about different spring boot starters available that will have all the dependencies which are needed to run our application so here you can see that this is our main parent for our spring boot that says spring boot starter parent and after that we have added couple of more starters so we added spring web that added this particular dependency that is spring boot starter web and spring boot starter test dependencies and we added the h2 database over here and this is the maven plugin over here so let's go ahead and see what's available which are the dependencies added to this particular spring boot starter web so if you do control click over here this particular pom.xml file will open over here and here you can see that these are the different dependencies available you can see that it has added spring boot starter okay spring boot starter json spring boot starter tomcat spring web dependency spring web mvc dependencies okay so these are all the dependencies dependencies available if you open again spring boot starter tomcat and if you go down over here you can see that for this jakarta annotation api is available and tomcat embedded core is available okay so you can see that we don't have to add all these particular dependencies all added with just one spring mvc starter dependency so this is the benefit of spring boot application now if you go to the spring boot starter test over here so yeah you can see that it has added spring boot starter spring boot test dependency and you can see spring boot test auto configure dependency so this particular spring boot test auto configure will allow spring boot application to auto configure all the particular configurations to run this particular 
test. So you can see that it also added JSON path dependency, Jakarta XML bind API, Aspect JCore, Hemcrest, JUnit Jupyter, Mockito, JSON assert, Spring Core, Spring Test. So yeah, you can see that if we were not using Spring Boot, we have to all add all these particular dependencies and we need to start our application. We need to configure everything. But here, everything is configured easily. So this was all about the Spring Boot starters, which are the different starters available. Now, if you come to this particular file, that is Spring Boot tutorial application, which has the main method, which is the starting point for our Spring Boot application. And here you can see that there is an annotation added that is Spring Boot application. So this is a key annotation for our Spring Boot application. If you open this particular annotation, you can see that it has few of the main annotations. You can see that it's Spring Boot configuration and you can see that enable auto configuration and component scan. So what all these particular annotations do? Here you can see that it has added Spring Boot configuration. So that means it tells the application that this is the main Spring Boot configuration file. So this particular Spring Boot application, this is the main Spring Boot configuration file and it is also added enable auto configuration. So that means all the auto configurations for our application will be added to it. And suppose if you want some of the classes or some of the configurations to not add automatically we can also exclude them so suppose taking the example of an hibernate if you don't want to add the auto configuration for hibernate you can add the classes in this particular enable auto configuration uh, annotation to exclude all those particular things if you open this you can see that in this enable auto configuration there is an exclude class list you can add all the different class that you want to exclude and here you can see that there is a component scan available so component scan if you are already aware about the spring application component scan will scan all the components available in your spring boot application and all those particular components will be added to the spring container when the application is started so by default whatever the package is there like com.dailycodebuffer.springboot.tutorial so this is the default package added so whatever the classes or whatever the objects available inside this particular package or the sub packages will be added to the spring container. So if you're creating different packages, you have to add the component scan and you need to add the package information. So those particular packages will come to spring radar and all those particular objects will be added to the spring container when the application is starting. So we need to understand what this spring boot application annotation does. So these are the key things that has been added to the Spring Boot annotation and the Spring Boot application dot run method starts our application. Okay. And this is the class that we are, that is already passed like this is the main configuration class that should be running over here. Now we can run this application. Okay. Nothing will happen, but it will be running. So if you start the application over here, run Spring Boot application, you can see that it started running. Okay. You can see that the application started running. Here you can see that my application is running on Tomcat with port 8080 over here. Okay. The Apache Tomcat is Apache Tomcat 9 and it started in 2.335 seconds. Okay. So my application is running on Tomcat now. If I go to the browser and if I hit localhost 8080 over here, you can see that we are getting the white label error page that is a fallback page. Okay. Because we have not created any of the APIs now. So it's redirecting me to the blank page blank error page for now but my application is running on my embedded tomcat so you can see that we did nothing till now okay we just opened the application in our id and we start and entire application was deployed to our embedded tomcat and everything was running now here let's create the sample rest api over here okay so to start with what we will do we will create one of the package over here let's create one package we will see as a controller and inside this particular controller package, we will create one controller. So we'll just say hello controller. This is my controller over here. Now we have to create a simple basic API. So now we already talk about the component scan and inversion of control and dependency injection and everything. So to make this particular class as a component of a spring so that whenever the application is started, this particular class is added to the spring container for that we need to add the at the rate component annotation for this particular class that we created so now this particular class will be in the springs radar so that whenever the application context starts this particular class that we created new will be added to our spring container so whenever we need this class spring can give us but technically this hello controller is not 
a simple component right it's a controller it's a resource so we can use a different annotations that is available that is called controller now this particular controller when you add this particular controller it's a stereotype annotations that means it tells us directly okay this particular hello controller is been added the at the red controller annotation that that means this is the controller by default now when you open this particular at the red controller you can see that at the red component is added so that means this will be behaved as a component by default so that's a good thing over here right because we have different components for different types of classes that we create currently we are creating the restful apis over here so that means my controller is still has to be rest controller right not a simple controller so for that also we have the annotations okay so instead of controller we can use rest controller over here so this particular when we add rest controller over here it defines two things it will tell okay this is a particular controller and as a component plus it will tell that it will return always a response body so if you open this here you can see that it will always return the response body because our rest apis will always return some of the data it won't return any of the jsp pages or anything because we won't be working with all the jsps it's old technology let's use the new technology so instead of controller we defined okay this particular controller is my rest controller so whatever the things i will be doing in this particular class that all will be my rest endpoints so i'm just removing the unused imports for here in the intellij idea i can use control alt o to remove all the unused imports okay now let me create one of the methods over here okay i'll just say public string hello world okay and this particular hello world will return welcome to daily code buffer now what i want to do is i want to serve this particular endpoint okay whenever i hit that particular endpoint i want this particular method to be executed so for that what i'll do i'll do request mapping okay so whatever the request i want to execute i'll map that request to this particular method so for that i will do request mapping over here and i'll pass value as slash okay so whenever i'll hit localhost colon 8080 slash this particular method will be called and here i'll define the method so which type of particular method it is it's get post port delete or whatever so this will be my get request so i'll say my request method is request method dot get over here so what i did i assign one of the endpoint that is slash that is my default endpoint to this particular method that's a get request so whenever we hit this particular endpoint we will get this particular string in return okay simple thing over here now one more thing as we talked earlier spring boot does all the auto configuration for us but if you want to change any of the configuration spring allows us to do all those configuration using the application dot properties file so we can add all the different properties to change whatever configurations we want to change by default my application is running on port 8080 that's the default tomcat container port okay so that's the auto configuration done for me but now i want to change that particular configuration i want to run my application on port 8082 so for that we can add the configuration in my application.properties file so let's go to the application.properties file and here i can change my server port so the property is server.port over here okay equals to 8082 so that's it now my application will run on port 8082 really simple right now you might be thinking oh this there will be a lot of properties and how i'll get to know okay which properties to change there is an entire documentation available that spring boot team has provided like which particular properties is for which particular thing so i'll link that particular thing in the description below that particular url so you can check that out what all configurations are available and which particular properties is for which particular configuration so it will be very easy for us to change all the configurations so this is the default for my server port that i change server.port equals to 8082 now let's run this application i'll just click on run over here to run my application here you can see that my application has started now my application is running on port 8082 over here you can see that so if i go to my browser if i change my port to 8082 and this is my default endpoint i added and here you can see that i am getting 
welcome to daily code buffer so my application is running cool right so this is the first spring boot application now if you come over here you can see that this particular line is still verbose right because you are adding the request mapping and you're telling okay this particular request should be of type get so always there are different types of requests available right like get post put delete options trace everything but always to add that particular thing it's a little bit verbose over here right so what we can do instead of using this request mapping there is a different annotations available that defines that particular mapping so we want to use the get over here we want to map this particular method to get so rather than using request mapping and to add the method as a request method dot get we can directly use get mapping annotation and i'll define okay this is my endpoint so you can see that we remove the entire line and it's very simple now so this particular method we can directly identify okay this is the get mapping for this particular url and if you open this get mapping over here you can see that get mapping has this particular request mapping over here and it says that method is equal to request body dot get which already we did earlier right instead of that we can simplify with at the rate get mapping if you want to do post mapping you can do at the rate post mapping if you want to do delete mapping you can do at the rate delete mapping so all these particular annotations are available we can directly use it so it's very easy to use so for this let's again start our application okay but for now i'll show you the different way so spring boot have the different maven goals also to run our spring boot application if you see over here maven you have the different different maven life cycles available you can run any of the particular life cycles also so if you want to run this particular application using the command line there is one way to use the spring boot maven goals over here so if you go to the terminal over here we are not running from the application from the id itself if you go to the command prompt to this particular folder and if, and if you do mvn spring boot spring hyphen boot colon run over here so this particular spring hyphen boot is the maven goals we can run over here so here you can see that my application started now okay it's the same thing if i go back if i do refresh you can see that my application is running so we saw the two ways to run our spring boot application there is one more way to run the spring boot application that how we will be running our spring boot application in production that i'll show you at the last so stick around till the last now to close this server i'll just do control c over here okay yes so whenever we are developing the applications we need to do a lot of changes and we need to start our servers after our changes we need to test everything so to stop the server and start the server every time once we do the changes that's a really tedious task so for that Spring Boot provides the Spring Boot DevTools dependency that we can add into our project so that whenever there is a changes, Spring Boot will detect those changes and it will restart our application. Okay, so let's see, let's add that particular thing and let's see how it's working over here. So for that, we need to go to our prompt.xml file to add that particular dependency. We will use the particular project that we had already created in the Spring Initializer to add that particular dependency. So let me add the dev tools dependency over here okay and if i go to the explore path over here and here you can see that this is the dev tools dependency added so let me just grab this thing and add in the project over here after this i am adding the dependency okay save it now we need to reload our maven configuration so here you can see that you can reload the maven configuration from here and here you can see that the configuration has been added over here now if you are working with the sts this particular dev tools will start working for you by default but for intellij idea we need to do couple of changes so that our id is supporting live reload functionality live building functionality okay because by default intellij idea is coming by disabling all those particular functionality so let's go ahead and add that particular thing so if you do Control shift a over here you can see you can search everything over here and here you search for the registry over here okay in this registry search for the compiler.automake.allow.van app.running search for this and tick mark this so this particular things will be enabled over here so that's the one thing that you need to do the changes after that go to the file go to settings over here go to build execution deployment go to compiler and here you can see that 
enable this build project automatically okay so these are the two settings that you need to add in the IntelliJ IDEA once this is done you can run your server so you can see that my server has started running now and if I go to the home controller this is what we, I should be getting so yeah you can see that I am getting welcome to daily code buffer now if I do any changes over here if I do some extra A's over here okay and here you can see that if you wait for some times this particular change should reflect here you can see that it reflected the changes you can see that condition evaluation unchanged so we are not restarting the server if we go again and if I hit refresh you can see that my changes are reflecting over here okay so that means my dev tools is working so this is what you should add when you are developing your Spring Boot applications it will save a lot of time for you guys so this is all about Spring Boot dev tools dependency now let's see what we are going to build today over here okay what application that we are going to build so if I I have created a diagram over here so yeah you can see that we will be building the backend application only that is the creation of the REST APIs so yeah you can see that I have just added all the front-end technologies so from all these particular technologies we can call our RESTful APIs right so we can create our entire backend using the Spring Boot and from the front-end anything can call these APIs to create the entire end-to-end full-stack application so what we'll be doing is we will be working with one department entity so we'll be creating one department so for that particular department we will be adding the different rest apis uh, we will be creating one post api to save that particular department to get all the departments we will be creating one of the api to get a particular department we will be creating one api we will pass one of the ids so for that particular id we will be getting the data back we will create one of the api to delete that particular department and we will also create one of the APIs to update that particular department when you pass any of the ID like I have created 4 to 5 departments and I want to change one of the departments that is department ID 3 then you can pass 3 and you can pass the data so that particular department will be updated so we will be creating bunch of APIs over here to work with the department entity over here so this entire particular thing we will be adding in one of the department controller that we create so that will be our controller layer to handle all our requests after that we'll be creating one service layer our service layer will be our business layer so all the business logic that we want to add to handle our department will be adding in that particular business layer controller layer is just to get the particular request and get the response back so it's just for the routing purpose your service layer will be the main business layer where you will be writing all your logic and after that from that particular service layer you will be calling your data access layer or your repository layer this particular layer will be responsible to interact with your database so whatever database operations will be there this particular layer will be handling all those particular database operation and we'll be having one database also so currently for starting we'll be using the h2 in memory database but after that once we create a few of the apis we will switch over to the mysql database so you will get the understanding also how you can switch the database as well using the configurations so these are the different layers that we are going to create so we'll be working with one of the department entities as well so for this particular repository layer we'll be using the spring data jpa over here okay so for spring data jpa we need to add the particular dependencies as well so we'll be adding that particular dependency also and for the database we are using the h2 in memory database so we'll be using the browser based console so we need to add the configurations to enable that particular console as well and we can add all the different configurations also so let's create that particular application now we already added the h2 in memory database dependency if you go to the pom.xml file okay we already added h2 database over here now we need to add the jpa dependency so let's go to the spring initializer and let's add the jpa dependency okay spring data jpa this persist data in sql stores with java persistent api using spring data in hibernate let's go to the explore and uh, here is your spring data jpa okay i'll just copy paste over here you can see that we are not adding the version information over here because whatever the spring boot parent version would be all those particular versions will be the same all those particular things will be based on the our parent spring boot 
version so yeah you can see that all the dependencies are added for my spring data jpa so let's close this particular file now let's add the configuration for our h2 in memory database so we need to go to our application dot properties file and here we can add the configurations so i'm just copy pasting all the properties over here and i'll explain you yeah you can see that we have added spring dot h2 dot console dot enabled equals to true so we are enabling the web console using this particular property over here now after that you can see that we are adding spring dot data source dot url that is jdbc colon h2 dot memory dot dcb app so this is what our database url is so we are using the h2 memory database and dcb app will be my database name and after that we define spring dot data source dot driver class name so this is my driver that is org dot h2 dot driver so we are using h2 driver over here and these are my username and password that is spring dot data source dot username equals to sa and spring dot data source dot password equals to password over here and we define the jpa database platform as well that we are using h2 dialect over here for using our jpa data source platform so with this particular properties our entire h2 database is configured for our jpa in hibernate and we also enable the h2 console so let me just start the application and i'll show you our database as well okay let me just start this so yeah you can see that once we added this particular configuration that is jpa here yeah, you can see that hikari connection pool has been added okay so all this particular you can see that jpa entity manager factory has been added internally it is using hikari connection pool to maintain all the database connections so if i go to my browser now and this is my application and here if I do slash h2 console over here my h2 console will open okay yeah you can see that this is my h2 console over here this all the details are pre-populated you can see that your driver class name your jdbc url whichever we gave over here okay everything is populated if not you can copy paste this information and you can add over here yeah you can see that your username is also populated that is sa and your password is this password so you can add this particular password over here test the connection you can see that the connection is successful so after that you can connect also so here you can see that you are connected to your h2 console and you can see that this is my schema this is my database currently there is no table created for it now let's go ahead and create the department entity and create all the layers and let's start working on it and here you can see that we have created one of the packages so let's go ahead and create the different packages for it now so i'll go ahead and create so the first package i'll create this the entity package okay to create my entities then i will create the service package for our service layer then i will create repository package for our data access or repository layer cool now in this entity we will create our department entity so let me go ahead and create new java class and i'll say as a department over here inside this particular department let's create few of the properties so i'll just say private long department id private string department name private string department address private string department code over here so these are the different properties that i have added over here now let's create the getter setters in the intellij idea you can use alt insert to create the different generators so i'll just use getters and setters over here i'll select all the properties click ok to generate all the getter setters for it now i will also use the same alt insert to create the constructor over here with all the fields okay this constructor with all the fields and i also create the default constructor as well constructor default constructor and i'll also create two string method over here
cool right so this is the entity that we created so now to make this particular class as an entity so that it can interact with our database using the jpa we need to annotate this particular class with at the rate entity over here using the java x dot persistent dot entity package over here so now this particular department can interact with my database now as in the relational database all the tables will have one of the primary key so for this particular entity also we need to create one so my department id will be my primary key so to make that primary key i need to annotate with at the rate id over here now how you'll be generating your primary key that also you can define over here so here i'll define generated value strategy equals to generation type auto so this is my entity created over here now for this particular we need to create the controller now so i'll go to the controller package and i'll create the new controller that will say department controller as we saw in the particular home controller we will annotate this particular department controller as rest controller so this will be behaved as a rest controller and we can create the rest apis over here now we have to create our services and repositories as well so here we'll go with the standard practice over here so we will create the interface for our service and we will create the class implementing that particular service because one service can have multiple implementation as well so we'll go with the same approach we'll create the interface and we will add the implementation for the service as well and for the repository also we will create the interface for it so let's go ahead and create the interface that is new java class i'll select the interface over here and i'll say department service this is my interface over here now I'll go ahead and create the implementation class for it. I'll say department service implementation that is IMPL class. And I'll say this particular class will implement department service. And for this particular department service implementation, I will annotate this with at the rate service. So we can know this is a service implementation for it. And here you can see that it also has the component source. This will be in the springs radar and if we go to the repository also we can create the interface that is department repository which is an interface and we will annotate this particular interface with at the rate repository Now for this particular department repository, we won't be creating the concrete implementation class, rather we'll be extending the JPA repository itself because JPA repository gives us a lot of different methods that we can use directly for interacting for our entities with the database. So let me just show you how to do that. I'll just use extends JPA repository over here. Okay, you can see the first one jpa repository and for this particular jpa repository you need to pass your entity so that is my department entity and you also need to pass what's your primary key type so my primary key type is long so if i go to the jpa repository over here you can see that this particular jpa repository extends paging and sorting repository and query by example executor and if i go inside this also you can see that it is or it is extending CRUD repository. So we will be getting all those particular methods that are already been created for it. You can see that we are getting find all method. Okay. And here you can see that find all, find all by ID, save all, flush, save and flush, delete in batch. All those particular methods are already created. So we don't have to create all this particular implementation. We can directly use this particular GPA repository for entire implementation itself. So I'll show you how easy it is. Okay. So yeah, you can see that we created all the particular different class that is my department controller, my department service and department service implementation and my department repository also, which is extending JP repository. And for all this particular classes and interface, we have added either repository or either at the service or at the at the rate rest controller, which are the default annotations, which is adding at the rate component for all of our classes so that means all the classes that we already created are in the radar of spring now so whenever the spring application starts all this particular objects will be created and will be added to our 
Spring container. So whenever we want, we can tell Spring that, okay, I want this particular class. So we can use it directly. Now let's go ahead and create the methods for our controller. So let's go to the department controller. And here I will create first method that is to save the department over here. So let's create the method. What I'll do, I'll create the public method that returns the department object which is created and I'll say the method as save department and this is my method over here and I will map to post mapping over here and I need to call this particular post with slash departments so this is a simple mapping that I already did over here now what I want to do is as I'm creating the rest API using the post mapping that is the post request that I'll do from any of the rest client I'll be passing the request body as well so that will be the entire JSON object that I'll be passing in so what I want I want that entire JSON object to be coming over here and to convert that particular entire JSON object to my entity that is the department entity so first let me define that what I want as an input so I'll just say I want my department over here now whatever the JSON data that you are passing has to be converted to this particular department so for that what we'll do we will add request body annotation so we are telling spring that whatever the data you are getting as a request body okay whatever json you are getting get that particular json and convert that particular json to my department object over here it's a simple thing without spring and spring boot what you have to do is you have to take that entire request body from the request http request that you are getting get that particular request and using the object mapper any of the jackson or json you have to convert that particular json object to the particular java object so that's all the steps that you have to do manually but with this particular annotation spring is doing that for us so with this particular one annotation we are getting entire json object to my department object over here now i want to save this okay so now what we have to do is we have to call this service layer to pass this data and from that service layer we'll do the business logic and after doing that business logic we can call the repository layer to save that particular data over here currently we don't have anything to do we can directly save it but still we'll go ahead with the approach over here so what we can do over here is we can do department service service equals to new department service implementation over here okay simple we are creating the object over here but why right because we are already using spring over here spring knows that we already have that particular department service and department service implementation class and interface already created and spring also knows that okay this particular class i have in my spring container so whenever someone asks i can directly provide that particular object that is already created why user have to create that particular object by their own so this is what we are doing over here, over here right we are creating the object with this particular new keyword so we are taking the control back i don't want that so what i'll do i'll just remove it I don't want to create the object this way. What I want to do is in this particular class layer, I am defining that this is the particular object that I want. I want the department service over here, but still spring is dumb, it doesn't understand. So we need to tell that, okay, this is a particular department service and I want it from you. So for that, I will define auto wire. That means auto wire the particular object that you have in your spring container to this particular reference that i have created so that object will be attached auto wired to this particular reference that we created so now it's simple right we use the dependency injection and inversion control from the springs functionality okay we are not creating any of the object now spring has the object we told them i want that object with the auto wired that auto wire will wire that particular object with the reference that i created now there are two types of auto wiring or two types of dependency injection that I, we can do in the spring that is constructor based and the setter based and here we are using the property base so we are just creating one of the property and we are directly using the auto wire to attach that particular object to my property you can also go ahead with the constructor base you can create the constructor you can pass this particular department service in the constructor and you can create the object as well so there are different ways you can do the dependency injection as well over here in spring now here what we can do is we can create we'll just return department service dot we'll see we'll give the same name over here 
and we'll pass the department object that we are getting okay over here now there is no save department method created in either of the service or service implementation so we have to create it so let's create it here in intellij idea if you do alt enter over here you can see that it is giving the option to resolve this particular error so it is saying that create method save department in department service interface so let's go ahead and create it so here you can see that this particular method is created over here and i'll say it as a public method over here and here you can see that it has a problem for this so that means whatever the service implementation class for this department service is there we have to go ahead and implement that as well so let's go ahead we'll do the alter insert and we'll say implement methods available so yeah you can see that this particular method is implemented over here now it's still returning null over here so what we need to do over here is we need to get the reference of the department repository over here so we'll do the same thing what we did in the controller layer we'll just do private department repository we'll create the reference to it and we'll do auto wire so that means this particular object will be attached to this particular reference now we can call department service department sorry department repository dot here you can see that there are a lot of different methods available from the jpa repository that we have extended okay so here I'm looking for a save method. This is a save method which is taking the entity over here. So my entity is department. So I'll just pass this department and voila, that's done. So with this particular method, my department will save to my database over here. And here you can see that we have not created the table also. Spring Data JPA will create that particular table also for us. Okay. And whenever there is an update to it, that particular update JPA will do to our database as well. So now what we'll do? Let's test it out. Okay. So now testing out, you can use any of the REST client you want. You can use Postman, Insomnia. You can, if you're using VS Code, you can use Thunder Client as well. You can use curl as well. You can use HTTP Pi as well. There are a lot of clients available. You can choose any of the one which you're comfortable with. Here I'll be using Insomnia for now. You can use Postman as well. That will be also okay over here. What we'll do is we can start the application. We can open the Insomnia as well. And we'll see what's happening in our database as well. So let's start the application. Yeah, you can see that my application has started now. If I go to the H2 console over here, if I refresh, let me log in. And yeah, you can see that particular department table is created and department ID, department address, department code and department name. These are the four entities that we created over here. Properties, okay, in the department. Cool, right? Now, let's save the data. If I do over here run, you can see that there are no records available. So if I go to the postman, let me create the new request over here. Okay, I'll say save department, which will be the post request created. And here I need to give the URL. I'll just give HTTP colon localhost colon 8082 slash departments over here and in the body I need to give the JSON data so let me give the JSON data over here so let me just copy paste the details over here okay from the department entity so I want department name I want department address and I want department code as well. My department ID will be auto generated. Okay. So I'll just give my department name is IT, department address as say Bangalore, department code I'll say IT06. So this is my JSON data over here. This is my API with the post request. If I do send, you can see that. It's 200 okay that means data is saved and this is the data that we are receiving back and you can see that department id is created one if i go back over here and if i do run this particular query 
you can see that this particular data has been saved over here and if i save another data ce c is the department computer engineering department and i'll say c07 it's still in the bangalore and if i hit send you can see that this particular record has been inserted and we have two records now okay so my save functionality is working fine now you still have to remember that we are still working with the h2 in memory database so whenever we restart our application or we will be losing all our data so now let's go back and work on the get apis now here we will add one method that will allow us to get all the departments from the database so let's create one of the method over here we'll say public and here as we need to get all the departments available in the database we will use the list of departments so i'll just say list of departments available and i'll just say fetch department list over here okay and here this will be the get mapping okay so i'll just say get mapping of departments now from here we need to get the list of departments from the repository and send back so i'll just use return department service dot fetch department list over here we are not taking any input over here because we need to send all the data back okay and this particular method we need to create in the service interface and service implementation as well so click on alt insert create method fetch department list in department service yes and make it public we'll go to the department service implementation class alt insert and implement this particular method so this particular method list of department fetch department list will send the list over here and instead of return null we will say department repository dot inside this department repository we have a method that is find all that will get all the department as a list and will send back done so this particular method will get all the departments available in our database so let's run this over here we can see that our application has started let's go back to the insomnia in the save department let's save the department okay c bangalore c07 let's save this and i'll save also it department it06 it's in bangalore and i'll save one more department that is electrical engineering it's in ahmedabad and i'll say triple e01 and here you can see that we have added three records over here in our database okay let's create new request i'll say get department and it's a get request okay let me copy paste the url from here https localhost 8082 slash departments that's what we have defined over here in the department controller okay so we'll be using the same this will be the get request now this particular request should return me three records if i hit send over here we can see that we are getting three records over here so all the data we are getting from our database now this is to fetch all the data available in our database now what if we want to get a particular record based on the id that is a primary key which is department id over here so let's go ahead and create one of the apis where we will pass the id of the department and based on that id we will be getting that particular record over here so let's go to the intellij idea and here what i'll do in this controller layer okay i'll create one of the methods that is public and here we need a particular department based on the id so i'll say department I, because i need that particular object only and i'll say fetch department by id and this will be again get mapping over here and i'll say it will be slash departments now whenever we are calling this particular slash departments i want to pass a particular department id for which i want to get the data so that particular part will be dynamic because i can send any of the ids over here so 
that is called a path variable right because what we'll do what we'll be doing is we'll be doing localhost colon 8086 slash departments slash whatever id we are adding okay that's a path variable so we can define as this way so this is particular dynamic value that whatever id we get we have to get as a department id and we have to get this particular id what we define over here as an input parameter to our method as well so what we'll define we'll define long department id over here now we need to map this particular id with this department id so for that we'll annotate this with path variable and this path variable is id over here so this path variable id whatever defined over here you need to give the same value over here and this will be attached to this particular department id now we can find this particular department based on this id so let's create the method over here we'll say return department service dot fetch department by id and here i will pass department id over here again i need to create this particular method in service class so alt insert sorry alt enter and create method fetch department by id in department service i'll make this as a public method and i'll go to the department service implementation implement methods and i will implement this fetch department by id method over here we need to use this department id as an input parameter so what i'll do department repository dot find by id okay this is the method and here you can see that it will return the optional of department and it is taking long id as the input variable so i'll pass department id and here this entire particular thing this find by id will return the optional so to get the value of department we will use get over here to get that particular department now let's go to the insomnia and test this okay no data because we need to add the data back again so let's go ahead and add the data so we'll save the first record we'll save the another record that is it department id06 i'll add send okay if i go to the get department and here you can see that i am getting two records over here but suppose if i want to get a particular record suppose department id2 i want it department so with the get request with the same url we did extra thing over here is we added the id over here that is a dynamic id that we can pass so let's pass the two over here and if we hit send we should be able to get this particular it department here you can see that i am able to get this particular it department over here so we did get all and get by id now let's implement the delete functionality so let's go to the intellij idea and in this particular controller let's create one more api over here okay it's a public string delete department by id over here okay and this is the particular method and here what we'll do we will do the delete mapping over here okay and with this delete mapping i will add the same api over here okay same url with slash department slash id whatever we pass that particular object i want to delete and here i will add long of department id and this should be again path variable the same information that we add in the get mapping in the previous method the same information we are adding over here as we are passing string over here what we have to do is if everything is successful we can pass return department deleted successfully and let's call the department service method as well we'll call department service dot we'll create this particular method that is delete department by id and for this we will call or we'll pass department id over here we need to create this particular method in the service as well so let's create 
so let's create this particular method sorry we need to pass department service over here right so now we have a value that is create method delete department by id in department service okay so let's create the method this is a type void we'll pass public over here let's go to the department service implementation class and let's implement this method and here what we'll do we'll call department repository dot delete by id over here okay and here i'll pass department id okay this particular department by id is returning void over here so that's why we are not returning directly we are returning the string over here so whatever the id we will be passing that particular thing should be deleted so let's check it again we'll go to the insomnia we'll go to the save department api let's create this api that is it department is created let's create the c department c07 send over here c is created the get mapping if we can do okay that particular record is created and if i check for all you can see that we are getting all the departments now let's create the new request for the delete one new request delete department we'll use the same api right so i'll just copy paste it and this particular get should be delete over here and suppose i want to delete this particular c department over here okay so i'll pass two over here and we'll hit on send so you can see that we are getting department deleted successfully and if i do the get operation over here again you can see that we are getting only one record over here so that means our delete functionality is working perfectly fine now let's go ahead and implement the update functionality so in the update whatever the id that you pass so slash department slash id whatever particular update operation you want to do plus which particular data watch particular new data that you want to update that also will pass as a body over here so let's go ahead and implement that in the intellij idea we'll create a new method we'll go to the controller again let's create the new method over here we'll create public and we'll return the department object over here okay and we'll say update department and this particular we'll say put mapping put is used for update and this api would be the same i'll using okay now here we have to add two things we need to take the path variable also that is id over here plus we need to take the request body as well so whatever the path variable whatever the id that we get for that particular record if it's present in the database we have to update with the new values that we have so let's do that what i want is i want long department id and i want department object as well but my department object would be request body and my department id would be path variable with id over here two things i have defined over here now we need to call the service layer so let's call the service layer we'll say return department service dot we'll create the method that is update department only and in this particular method we'll pass department id and department both the things and let's create this particular method in the service class as well we'll create the public method let's go to the service implementation class and let's implement this particular method this is the method update department which is taking department id and department as the input parameter so here what we'll be doing is we will first get the department which is already available in the database get that particular object and then whatever the changes that we have done in this particular department we will update with that particular value so suppose after the three fields that you have if you only change in one of the fields we should only update that particular field and we should check if the other fields are null then we can skip it so let's do that we will do 
डिपार्टमेंट डिपार्टमेंट फ्रॉम डी बी इक्वल्स टू डिपार्टमेंट रिपोजिटरी डॉट फाइन बाई आई डी विल पास डिपार्टमेंट आई डी डॉट गेट सॉरी इट शुड बी फाइंड बाई आई डी ओके सिंपल ना वंस वी गेट दिस पर्टिकुलर डिपार्टमेंट वी कैन चेक इफ एनी ऑफ द पर्टिकुलर पैरामीटर्स आर नल then we can skip it if there is any value then we can update this dep dbd uh, object over here so what i'll do if objects dot non null i'll check department dot get department name and not blank dot calls ignore case department dot get department name then i'll say dp db dot set department name equals to department dot get department name simple right we are just checking if anything is not null and not blank then only set the value otherwise skip it so let's so let's copy this and set for the other entities as well other properties as well so department name is done then we will go for get department code over here department code department code and set department code and here we will go for get department address so department address i'll just copy paste it and set so yeah you can see that we did the null checks and blank checks for all the three values and after that i can say return department repository dot save department db so it's very simple over here we took the value from the database that is dp db over here and whatever the input parameter that we got from the endpoint as a request body we are checking the null checks and blank checks for all the values whichever are not null and not blank that only we are updating to the database rest we are skipping it and after at the end we were just calling the save uh, method of a department repository so that's it so let's check it we'll go to the insomnia first we'll save the value in the database okay so here you can see that is the first record let me add the second record as well it06 send and if i do get over here you can see that i am having two records over here okay so let's create new request for update i'll create new request update department and then i'll change to put method json body create here i need to pass a json data so let me just copy it from here and i'll also copy the url as well and i'll go to update and i'll paste it if i go to the get department here you can see that for the second department 2 the department name is it the address is amdabad and department code is it06 okay so for the second department id we will do the changes so i'll pass slash 2 over here and instead of department name it i'll say information technology and the rest of the things i am passing the same over here okay so let's hit send over here and here you can see that particular department name is updated for the second record over here if you go to the uh, h2 console also we can see the same okay let me just log in over here if i run it over here you can see that we are having two records and the it department is changed to information technology over here and suppose if i remove this information over here and remove department code also and just i'm telling that change the address of the second department okay that means information technology to bangalore and if i hit send over here you can see that only bangalore updated rest of the thing is everything same if we check the database also you can see everything is updating correctly so we successfully implemented entire crud application crud endpoints for our department service we did get 
get all save update and delete everything now let's see how we can add the different extra endpoints also so now let's create one of the endpoints that will return the department based on the department name that we pass so let's go to the IntelliJ idea again let's go to the controller and here let's create the new endpoint we will say public department and I'll say fetch department by name okay and here I will pass the get mapping over here and inside this particular get mapping I will pass slash departments and slash I'll say pass the name and slash I'll say pass that particular name that you want to pass and here I'll say string department name over here and we need to bind this particular department name with the path variable that we have defined that is name so I'll just say path variable name over here it's pretty simple over here okay now let's go ahead and implement in the service and repository layer we'll just say return department service dot fetch department by name we'll pass the department name over here and let's, let's create this particular method in the service layer create method we'll go to the service implementation and we'll implement this particular method that is implement methods over here now for this particular fetching the data for department name there is no default method available in the JPA repository okay so that means we need to define one for us to use that so let's go ahead and create one okay let's go to the department repository this is the interface let's create one method we'll say public which will return back the department now the naming convention is the main thing over here what we need to do is we need to give find by after that whatever the name of your entity is so the name of my entity is department name over here okay let's copy paste copy it let's go to the repository layer and paste it and the naming convention should be this way find by d capital always in the camel casing okay department name over here and this department name should take string department name as the input parameter that's it so we don't have to do the implementation for it with this particular naming convention we should be able to get the data back let's go to the service impl and let's do return departments repository dot find by department name and let's pass the department name over here simple right now let's go ahead and check how it's working Let's go to the insomnia let's go to the save department and let's create the department over here the first department is created let's create the second department ce07 send two departments are created let's check in the get mapping two records we are getting over here now let's create one more request over here department by name and i'll do the mapping over here what we have to pass is we have to pass department slash name slash the name of the department that you want suppose i want ce then i need to pass the exact value that we have added to save the data that is c in capital you need to pass c in capital and if we hit send you can see that you are getting the data back so it's matching the data correctly now if you pass the c small over here you can see that there is no data available because it is matching the exact value over here now how to make sure that you are getting the exact values so let's implement that method as well so that you are getting the exact values so what we will do is we will go to the IntelliJ idea again we will go to the repository and let's create one more method that will return the department based on the department name and ignoring the case so we will define ignore case simple okay now we need to call this particular method from our service IMPL now let's check this again now let's go to the insomnia let's go to save department let's save this C department first record is saved 
let's save the IT department as well again if you see the get departments you are getting both the departments and if you pass CE in capital over here you can see that you are getting the data but if you pass C in small also you should be getting the data because we added the method for case insensitive so whether it's in capital letters or in small letters it should be able to match the records so that's how we can implement the different JPA methods now you might be wondering how I'll be get to know like what are the different methods or what are the different method names that you want to give to get the particular records so for that let's check the documentation for that I will link this particular URL in the description so you can check this out but if you go over here here you can see that these are the different keywords available how you can use and how you can create the method names so yeah you can see that if you want to get the distinct records you can use find distinct by whatever the value you want find distinct by last name so suppose in our case it's department name so we can pass find distinct by department name and if you want to get the data based on multiple values you can see we have here you it's added and and you can give the another value as well and in the input parameters you need to pass the two values first value first input parameter will pass as a last name the second input parameter will be passed as the first name over here and the equivalent jpql snippet jpql query you can see it's this select distinct the table name whatever the entity name is where x dot last name equals to uh, question mark one and x dot first name equal to question mark two so first and second property it will pass this way you can go for and properties or is equals find by first name find by first name is whatever the particular value you, that you are passing if you want to get the dates between the two dates that you pass you can use find by start date between so if you can pass two values date one date two and you will get the records between that two dates available if you want any value with less than less than equal greater than greater than equal all these particular things you can check over here based on this particular naming convention if you follow you will get the data now sometimes if you want to get the data and that data may be complex the query may be complex and you may not be able to achieve using this particular syntax to create those particular methods so for those type of case you can also go ahead with the jpql and if you are not able to go with the jpql as well at that time you can also go ahead with the native sql queries also so for those type of case you just have to pass the at the rate query annotation over here so whatever we created the method over here right so that particular method that you create suppose in our case this is the method that we create that is find department name ignore case and if you are not able to get that particular it's a complex something then you can annotate this particular method with at the rate query over here spring framework data.jpa.repository and in this query you can pass your entire query over here if it's jpql query just pass the JPL, jpql query and wherever the input parameter is there you have to pass question, question mark 1 for the first parameter question mark 2 for the second parameter and if it's the native sql query then just pass the query over here and there is a native query equals to true value available so just pass this value that native query equals to true that means after that this particular query whatever you pass over here sql query will be treated as the native query and you will get the data so this is also you can use to get the data either directly use the method names if not if not possible go with the jpql that also if you feel some difficulties in that you can always go ahead with the SQL queries natively also. So this is the documentation for it. I will link that in the description below so you can check this out. There are a lot of things available and it's very easy to implement. Yeah, you can see that it's the native query, right? It's done select queries, question mark one for the first value, question mark one for the second values, okay? Here you can see that it's defined like native query equals to true. So you can always get the data. Now here we added all the APIs over here, okay? now what we'll do is we will add the validations for all our apis that we have created so what what we can do over here is suppose we have three to four fields that is coming as the input parameter for our apis right to save the data or to update the data and we can add the validations like okay i want my department name always to be available okay without my department name that particular json data particular request body that whatever we are getting from the client that should be invalid that should be bad request so that means every time that particular thing should be available 
we can add a lot more different types of validations when we are getting the data as the input as the JSON format to our APIs. So let's see how we can add those particular different validations. So all these particular validations we can add using the Hibernate validation. So for that we need to add the dependency for it and we need to annotate our entities to validate all our requests. So let's go ahead and do it. So we'll go to the pom.xml file and we need to add the dependency. So this is the uh, Spring Boot Starter validation over here. So let me just add it over here. You can see that Spring Boot Starter validation. This is the plugins that we have added. Let me just do Maven install again over here. And with this particular dependency, if you go to this particular starter, here you can see that it is using Hibernate validator over here. Okay. So this particular thing that we are using over here to do our validations. Now how to add the validations. So suppose let's go to the department entity over here and what I want is whenever I'm getting the data as an input from the JSON, I want my department name always because my department name is very important. I want to save my department with my department ID auto generated and with the department name. If I don't have address and code, that's fine, but I should be having department name. So what I will do over here is I will add the annotations over here so that the validation can happen. So what I'll add the validation is not blank. Okay, here you can see that it is from the javax.validation.constraints uh, package over here and with this particular not blank, I will add the message over here. Like what particular message I should display when this particular validation fails. So I'll just say, please add department name. So this is the particular validation that I have added over here for this particular department name. Now, if you go to the controller and in this particular post mapping, this is where that we are getting the data. So this is the place where we are getting the request body. Now, when, whenever we are getting the request body over here, we need to validate that. So for that, we will add at the rate valid annotation over here. Okay. That is from Java X dot validation. So just add this. Okay. Sorry. So add this annotation that is, that is from the Java X dot validation over here. So now whenever the request is coming over here to save the data from the post mapping, that particular request that JSON body as coming as a request body will be validated against the annotations that we have defined over here. But there are a lot more different annotations available for the validations. So for now, let's test this out. Okay. So let's run this application and my application is started. Let's go to the insomnia save department and if I hit send over here, you can see that my data is saved. Now, what if I am not passing this department name over here? Okay. And if I hit send here, you can see that we got the error that is 400 bad request. And if you scroll down over here, here you can see that we are getting the default message that is please add the department name. This is what we added over here, right? So that means this particular validation is happening. Okay. And you can see that we are getting all the different values. That is object name is department field is department name. Rejected value is null. So it was passed null. So this particular value got rejected. So there are a lot more different uh, validations available. Okay. Let's see that. What are the different things available? There is not blank available. Suppose if you want to uh, check the length, okay. And then you can add the length over here and inside this, you can pass max value. And you can pass min value over here. Okay. And you can also pass the message. You can check the size as well. In this size also, you can pass the max value and min value over here. You can check for the email validation that this is a particular email field over here. You can also check if this particular, if there is an integer value or long value, you can also check if that particular value is positive, that particular value is negative, or you can also check positive or zero. So positive and zero is allowed with at the rate negative or zero, negative and zero value is allowed. If there is a date field, you can check that particular dates are future or particular date is future or present. 
similarly you can check for the past dates and past or present also so you can see that there are a lot more validations available and for all this particular validation either you can pass the regex for the email you can pass the regex expression to match that particular regex expression for email validation for length size you can pass min max values for the different uh, positive negatives negative values we can validate future dates past date also we can validate so these are all the different types of annotations we can use to validate our input request that is json data so you can check all this particular out and you can add the annotations based on the fields that you have and based on the validations that you want to add for that particular fields so we are just using not blank over here now but these are a lot more that you can use i'll just comment it out for now and i will add the code in the github and i'll share the link with you so you can check this out so these are all the different validations now what we can do is we can add the loggers in our application so all the applications should have the loggers right currently you can see that we have not added any of the loggers but we can go ahead and add the loggers it's very easy in spring boot currently we will just add the simple loggers over here but that particular loggers can be extended to uh, file based loggers like you can uh, save that particular loggers in a particular file you can add the rolling based uh, file logging uh, functionality like for every day you can create the new files or based on a particular size limit you can create the different files all these particular configurations you can add using the application.properties file that we have so you can check all those particular things it's very easy but for now let's add the simple logger over here and we'll see how we can add the logging over here so spring boot comes with the slf4j logging library uh, within the system with all the spring boot starters available so let's go ahead and use that if you want you can use a log back or log4j with slf4j so there are different libraries available if you want to add those you can add that particular libraries in the pom.xml file and you can use but if you are directly using slf4j you don't have to add any of the libraries those are directly available and you can directly use it so let's add in the uh, department controller over here so for the loggers what we'll do is i will add the logger over here that is private final logger class okay this logger i'll be adding from the org dot slf 4 j the first one and i'll say logger equals to logger factory dot get logger and here we need to pass the class name that is department controller dot class over here so yeah you can see that this is a simple logger implementation that i added that i'm using slf 4 j implementation and using from the logger factory i'm getting the get logger for the department controller class now Suppose I want to log whenever the particular request comes to this particular save department. So what I can do, I can say logger object that I created logger dot info. I'll say inside save department of department controller. Simple over here. Okay. So I'm just adding one of these particular loggers over here. Let me add the same for get departments also inside fetch department list of department controller so similar types of logger you can add in all the particular uh, service and repository layers and based this particular loggers will be helpful for debugging our applications right so it's just a simple logger that we have added let's restart the application and now when we call the save department hit on send you can see that we got 200 okay and if you go over here we also got the log as well you can see that that particular entire which particular thread it was which particular class it was and what's the log message over here so you can see that we are getting the logs as well if you go to the get department and if i hit send you can see that we got the logs for that also inside fetch department list of department controller so we simply added the loggers over here okay so logging is implemented over here now we can create the different policies how we want to aggregate the logs either in the console either in the file either we know we want to create the rolling policies all those different configurations we can add in the properties file so if you go to the documentation you will get everything but this is how you should or you will be implementing loggers in your spring boot application now as we are working with the java application we tend to create a lot of pojos right so we'll be creating the pojos we'll be creating the properties and for all those properties we'll be creating the getter setters constructors two string methods and all those different things now creating all those particular different things is easy but 
your code is not looking good right because if you see that particular example of our department also for the particular three to four fields that we have created for this particular four fields we created get a setters we created the all arguments constructor that is constructor with all the arguments with the default arguments two string methods you can see that your code is around 82 lines but at the end you just need this particular four fields over here now we should be getting rid of all those particular things right because we don't need it so for this particular thing there is a library available that is called lumbok now lumbok allows us to remove the boilerplate code from our java applications so what we can do is we can remove all this particular getter setters and everything and we can use lumbok and that particular plugin will add all these particular uh, methods at the time of compile time when particular compilation happens all those particular methods will be created so we don't have to see in our code but that will be available so let's see how to implement that so if you go to the spring initializer that we had already right this is a particular project that we had already opened if you go to the add dependencies and if you search for the lumbok yeah, you can see that java annotation library which helps to reduce boilerplate code let's add this particular dependency go to the explore and copy paste the data from this particular pom.xml file if you see over here this is the particular dependency added so let's copy paste this particular dependency go to our pom.xml file add this particular dependency and once we add this particular dependency we also need to tell the maven plugin that we are using lumbok so copy paste this also okay this entire plugin this plugin we will copy paste so we are excluding lumbok over here now once you add the lumbok for your id to know that you are using lumbok you have to add the plugins in your id if you are using any of the ids either intellij idea or sts or eclipse or vs code all those have this particular lumbok plugin just go to your plugin sections and search for it i'll show you for the intellij idea if you search for the plugins over here and if you search for lumbok you can see that i already installed it so it's coming over here okay you can go ahead and install it it will be available in all the ids now this particular thing is only required when for your development uh, activities but when you are running this particular application directly using the command line that particular thing will compile and the particular jar file will be created so it will work directly in your production servers as well so there shouldn't be any worry about it now let's implement lumbok in our entities so let's go to the department entity over here let's remove everything all the getter setters all the constructors to string method everything okay simple we have four fields over here that is department id department name address and department code over here now to make this particular department to use lumbok i just need to add at the rate data you can see that it is from the lumbok so if you just add data over here and if you open this annotation here you can see that this particular data is equivalent to at the rate getters setters required args constructor to string and equals and hash code so all this particular methods will be created for us so we don't have to add any getter setters and everything and if you just want any getter setters then you can just go ahead and at the rate use getters and at the rate setter okay if you don't want setter just remove it just the getters will be available but for this particular entity that is department we need everything so i'll just annotate with at the rate data over here alongside all the getter setters hash code equals method and two string methods i want a default constructor as well that is no args constructor so there will be default constructor created with this and if i add all args constructor the constructor will be created with all the arguments now if i add at the rate builder over here okay you can see with this particular builder an entire builder pattern will be implemented for this particular department service now if you don't know what is builder pattern that's fine you don't have to worry about it for now but just understand that if you want to implement this builder pattern with this particular at the rate builder annotation you can do it in the later part of the video i'll show you how we are using this particular builder pattern so stay around for that but we can add this particular annotation so it will start working now if we run this application again everything should work smoothly no compilation error or nothing should be happening so here you can see that our application has started successfully and if you go around to save the data we should be able to save and if you go to the get department we should be able to get the data as well so everything is working smoothly we just removed all the boilerplate code that we was 
available in our application. So this is a really good plugin that you should be using in your applications. So let's talk about the exception handling in Spring Boot. Now currently if you see our application, okay, let's take one of the example over here. Uh, we'll take the example of get department based on ID over here. If you go to the insomnia, let me save one of the department. Okay, I've saved one of the departments. If I go to get department and if I take this, I'm getting all the departments. And if I pass one over here and if I hit send, you can see that I'm getting that particular department. But if I pass any of the ID for which that department doesn't exist, you can see that I'm getting the error over here. And here you can see that this particular error response have a lot of values over here, right? Timestamp, status, error, trace, what is the entire stack trace over here. Okay, yeah, you can see that there's a lot of details over here, right? And you can see that which what was the message, no value present, what was the path, everything. But actually, I don't want all these particular details, right? I want only particular relevant details to show as an error message. So whatever we want to send the data in the UI, we can send the data and based on that particular error message and status code, we can handle all those particular stuffs in the UI. All these particular structures and everything, if we are logging in the backend, that's fine. But I don't need that particular things to pass in the UI. So let's see how we can handle such type of scenarios and how we can send the data back as the error response. So what we will do over here is, Currently, we executed this particular API that is get mapping fetch department by ID. So for this particular thing, let's implement the error handling. We'll be creating here custom uh, exception over here and we will throw that particular custom exception and we will handle it. So let me just create that. Let me just stop the server. Let me create one of the package over here. Okay. I'll create the package error over here. And I'll create one of the custom exception that I'll say department not found exception. This particular department not found exception will extends exception over here. Let me override all of the methods over here. Okay, I'll do exception, exception with string message, exception with string and throwable with just throwable and exception with string throwable and suppressions okay so i'm just overriding all these particular methods over here in this particular class okay so we just defined one of the custom exceptions now we will throw this particular custom exception when there is no data present we will say department not found so let me go to the service layer because that's the particular layer that we are getting the data if you go to this fetch department by id right this is the particular method that we are getting the data and here you can see that we are directly getting this particular data but if there is no data present then we have to handle it over here so let's change this particular file over here now here you can see that we are directly returning it so first let's change that particular thing okay this particular find by id is returning the optional of a department so let's first get that particular value we'll just say optional of department over here we'll say department and we'll remove this particular get over here simple right we are getting the optional of department from this find by id method now what we'll do we'll check if this particular department whatever we are getting from the database is present or not if it's present that's fine if it's not present then we should throw the exception that is department not found so what we'll do, we'll just say over here if not of department dot is present. Okay, if department is not present, then we'll say throw new department not found exception and we'll pass department not available. And then if you have found the department, we will just say return department dot get simple over here right now here it is saying that we should add the exception to the method signature so let's add this here you can see that it's asking us to add in the entire hierarchy as well so we'll just add it so yeah you can see that it would have added in the uh, service as well 
and if you go to the controller let's see if it's added or not yeah you can see that so here also let's add to the method signature for now okay for the simplicity but we can handle all such kind of exceptions at the controller layer and we can throw different kind of messages based on those exceptions that we have so what we did over here we just added one of the exceptions over here and we added a meaningful message over here so let's see how it is working now so it started currently at last time when we saw that you can see that the message was no value present now if i save the data and if i go back to the department and if i hit send you can see that we still got the same error same big stack trace and everything but at the end you can see that the message was department not available so this was the message that we added but still we don't want this we want to clear it out the entire response we want to have a meaningful response so let's go ahead and implement that as well so what we have to do is now whenever there is an exception occurring at the controller layer we have to fetch that or we have to identify that this is the exception thrown and whenever that particular exception is that what we have to send back the data as a response that we have to configure over here so what we'll do we will create one of the class over here and that class will be responsible for sending all the response back based on the exception that has been thrown so for that let's create one of the class over here in the error only we will say rest response entity exception handler okay so this is the particular class that will handle all the particular exceptions that we want to send back as a response entity and this particular class will extend response entity exception handler now whatever the class that you are creating to handle all your exceptions okay that particular class should be annotated with at the rate controller advice now this particular controller advice currently we are adding for all the controllers that we have but if you want to add this particular controller advice for a specific controller or a specific base package that also we can do so for those particular controllers and for those particular base package only this particular advice will run when there is an exception occurred on all those particular controllers so currently what we did whenever there is an exception in my controller and that particular exception is been thrown this particular controller advice this particular exception handler will handle those kind of exception and it will create a response for that particular exception and it will send back as the response object so here we define that this particular class will be the controller advice and we'll also define this particular class will send the response status okay now we have to create one method and that method will be responsible to handle that particular kind of exception so currently we created department not found exception so we will create a method that will handle that particular exception itself and whenever that particular exception is been thrown what we want to send back as a response that we will give over here so let's create the method over here we'll say public what i want to send over here okay so let me just create one of the entity class or pojo class we whatever you want to tell okay so i'll just say error message over here this is the class that i'm going to create and i'll say department not found exception is the method name let me just create this particular class over here first i'll go to the entity and i'll create this particular class now this particular class we will be sending back so what data i want to send back that i want to define over here so i want to send http status over here first what is the status 200 500 404 four, whatever so that i want to send and the other thing that i want to send is the error message okay this two thing now this particular class should have get us headers and two string methods and everything so let me annotate with other data using lombok i'll create the no argument constructor and also create the all argument constructor over here so simple over here we created a pojo class over here okay with two of the properties and this particular let me just import the package now this particular method will take department not found exception as the input parameter plus it will take web request as the input parameter and 
we have to annotate this particular method with exception handler so we'll just define exception handler and what type of exception this particular method is handling so we'll say this is handling department not found exception dot class so now it's pretty much clear over here that this particular method is handling this exception and it is taking department not found at exception as the input parameter plus web request as the input parameter now we can create that particular error message as the response and we can send back so let's do that so we'll just say error message and one more thing to note over here is that this particular error message we need to send as the response entity so i'll just wrap around this particular error message as the response entity here i'll define error message message equals to new error message and this particular error message i'll give http status dot not found that is 404 okay plus i'll pass the message message i'll get from the department not found exception dot okay this is the exception over here this is the name of the variable so exception dot get message okay so we created the class over here now we need to return this so we'll say return response entity dot status equals to http status dot not found dot body equals to in the body i'll pass the message over here simple thing that i have done over here it's nothing too complex over here we created the method that particular method is handling department not found exception over here it's checking department not found exception as the input parameter plus the request as the input parameter we are not doing anything with the request for now but in case if we need if we need anything from the request we took over here we created this error message object over here and in this particular error message we are passing http status not found and whatever the message it is and we are returning this particular message wrapping around in the response ent entity simple over here now everything should work over here whenever the request comes to this particular department controller and this particular department controller will throw that department not found exception it will come around to this particular rest response entity exception handler because we added the controller advice this particular controller will return the message as the response status and this is the particular method that will handle that particular exception if we have multiple exceptions we can create the different methods for those particular types of different exceptions and we can also use the same particular method for different kind of exceptions as well so let's run this okay yeah you can see that my application has started let's go to insomnia and earlier this was the error message that we were getting okay now let's click on send and let's see what's happening here yeah, you can see that the entire error message is changed earlier it was having 500 internal server error but that's not internal server error that's data not found right so we just gave 404 you can give any of the status according to the requirement over here so we give 404 over here and we give the status as well that not found and the message as well department not available so this is how we can handle exceptions in spring boot for all our rest apis so now let's do one thing over here currently we are storing all our data in the h2 in memory database so by now i'm hoping that you are able to understand the entire flow of all the rest apis that we have created and you have gone through all the particular codes that we have created till now and you are well versed with everything that is done now let's go up the notch and let's use the actual database so currently what we'll be doing is we will convert our h2 database to use the mysql database so for that what you have to do is you have to go and install the mysql database in your machine if you google around also mysql database download you can just download that particular database just go to the mysql downloads over here just download the particular database and install in your machine i have installed mysql workbench over here just search for that as well okay if you search for mysql workbench just download this particular thing in your machine and install it i'll show you okay i'm using mysql workbench so let me just open this particular thing you can use any of the database that you want but we will go ahead with the mysql over here and this is the interface over here you can log in over here my database is working on port 3306 okay over here and you can see that these are the default schemas available default database available in my server now what we'll be doing is we need to 
change the entire properties or entire configuration so if i go to the application.properties file here you can see that these are the configurations that we have added for our h2 in memory database so that is database url username password and all those things so we need to change it to use mysql so let's add the configuration i will keep this particular configuration for you guys and i'll comment it so you can refer it i'll add the new configurations over here okay so let me just comment it out over here okay and let me grab the new configurations here you can see that i just added the configuration over here that is spring data source.url the same over here that we have used and instead of h2 in memory database i just added jdbc colon mysql colon slash slash localhost colon 3306 slash dcb app over here currently i don't have dcb app uh, schema created but we will create it okay and my username is root password is admin over here and i change the driver class name to use mysql driver over here and i just added gpa.show sql equals to true so whenever the, any of the query is executed the query will be printed in the logs so i just added that if you don't add the queries will not be printed over here and here spring.jpa.hibernate.ddl auto update i have added so whenever there is an update in the entities in our application that particular entities will be updated in the database as well so this is the configuration that i have added over here the other thing that we have to do over here is to add the mysql driver in our application so earlier if you have remembered we added the h2 driver if you go to the form.xml file if you scroll up over here you can see that we added the h2 database over here now we need to add the mysql so let me grab that and add it i am adding it over here after h2 only so it's more visible here you can see that i just added mysql connector for java and group id is mysql let me just refresh my main one changes this is the one change that we did the other change we did is in the properties file that we added this particular configuration and we commented out this h2 configuration now that's it no other change now your application will work on mysql the other thing that we have to do is we have to create this particular schema right so let's grab this name let's go to the mysql workbench and let's create the new schema i'll just do create schema i'll give this particular name and i'll do apply the changes and here you can see that this particular dcb app schema is created there is no tables available nothing available okay now let's go to the application and let's start our application you can see that application is started now if i come here and if i refresh my database here you can see that my department table is created and hibernate sequence is also created over here as we already added generate auto sequence okay in our entity and you can see that there is no data available in my database now let's go to the insomnia and let's save any of the departments over here i am saying id department over here itm double it06 let's save it and if i come over here you can see that that particular data is saved to my mysql database over here so pretty cool right we just added a few of the configurations and my entire database has been changed now so let me add a couple of more data over here i'll do ce 07 i'll just add triple e electrical department is in bangalore triple e 01 you can see that three records i have created over here if i do get over here i'll be getting all the data and if i go to the mysql database and if i run this particular query you can see that we are getting all the records over here now all our operations will work on this particular table so that's how you'll be able to change your database as well so do change this particular database and if you are familiar with any of the other database also try to use that particular database and add the configuration accordingly the only thing that you have to take care in mind is whatever database that you are using you have to use that particular driver for it and that particular driver name that you have to give in your application.properties file so that's it now let's talk about the unit testing over here okay every application should have or should do unit testing for that particular applications or for all the functionalities that we have so here we will understand that what unit testing we have to do and how we can do all the unit testing unit testing you can do for your entire application that's an integration testing that we call that you will be testing your entire end-to-end -end flow so whenever you hit any of the endpoint how that particular endpoint is behaving that you can test entirely okay the other thing is you have to test all your different components as well so suppose currently we have a repository layer we have service layer we have controller layer so you can test 
all those three layers differently as well or you can test all the three layers at the same time using the integration test as well so here what we'll be doing is we will be testing all the three layers that is repository layer service layer and controller layer so for this we'll be using the junitify over here and mock it over here so these are the two libraries that has been added to our spring boot application by default so in the earlier starting of this particular tutorial we saw that it was added the spring boot starter test dependencies over here in the pom.xml file let me just grab it again for you guys yeah you can see that this particular dependency was added spring boot starter test this particular test dependency have JUnit Jupyter that is JUnit 5 and also Mockito over here okay so we will be using this particular Mockito and JUnit to test all our components that we have created now let's understand the concept of mocking in unit testing so wherever you see you will be seeing that all the beans or all the different data will be mocked for doing the unit testing over here why mocking and why we have to do that okay so consider you are testing the controller layer over here right so from that particular controller layer you will be calling the service layer as well so you'll be calling few of the methods for service layer as well now you are just testing the controller layer not the service layer okay so you are not considered about how the data has been flowed how the service layer has been working also you just want to test your controller layer but your controller is still dependent on the functionalities or the methods available in the service layer so what you can do is you can mock those particular things you can just tell the system like okay whenever there is a call to this particular method or particular service layer give me this thing directly okay don't go to that particular service layer so this is called a mocking so you're just mocking the functionality available in that particular service layer let's take the example of a service layer and in this particular service layer you can see that there is a fetch department list method available and which is sending the direct list over here but i don't care about how service layer is working okay how service layer is getting me the data i just want to test my controller layer so whenever there is a call to this particular service layer for this particular method i will just say that okay whenever there is a call to this particular service layer and this particular method give me this object simple as it so it applies for the other things as well if you are working with the service layer and from that particular service layer there is a repository layer call over here okay so it's interacting with the database but you don't want that you are just considering to test your service layer so for that repository layer also you will be mocking all the data so for that particular layer you are not testing anything and the same thing happens for your repository layer as well when you are using your repository layer ideally you don't want to save the data you just want to mock that you saved the data okay or you are getting the data from the database now let's implement unit testing in our application so if you see over here, if you go to the project structure over here and if you go down over here, you can see that we have a test folder and we have the same package information over here, over here. Okay. That's the same package information that has been added for all of our particular classes for our main classes. Okay. And if you go over here, there's already one test case created that is spring boot test and for loading the context over here. We don't want it for now. So I'll just remove it because we'll be implementing our own test cases. So let's just remove it for now and let's focus on our own test cases so now we will start with our service layer first okay we'll go with the service layer then we'll go with the repository layer and then we'll go with the controller layer okay and for everything we'll be doing the mocking over here so the simplest way to create the test case file will be for each of the layers that we have so for the department service what we can do is just go to this particular department service go to generate and here you can see that you can create the test class over here from here itself if you create the test class you will get the lot of different options like which particular test class you want to create you can create for everything over here or you can create for particular as well and here you can see that it will be creating a class department service test in the same package itself over here and here it's telling that you can use any of these particular generator methods as well also over here now you can also go ahead and create the package in your test folder and you can create the uh, class directly itself but if you are using the ide we should use the ide to do all of our stuff so let's just create from here as well if you're using intellij idea you can create from here and if you are using uh, sts also that is all there is an option to create the test case from your main classes so you can go with that as well so let me just use this particular generate function and create the setup method and that's it we will create our other methods by our own so let's go ahead and click on ok and here you can see that department service test class is created and if you go over here in the test package over here you can see that 
this particular service package was created and new file was created inside that particular service package now to tell the spring boot that this is a particular test class okay we need to annotate it with using spring boot test over here so now spring boot will know that this is a particular test class and we can add all the things over here now here what we'll be doing is we let's go to the service class and we will implement this particular test case over here for this particular method that is fetch department by name so whenever we'll try to call any of the department over here we should return the department by its name whatever that we are providing over here so let's implement it we'll go to this particular class over here and let's create one method for test case so i'll say public void and always try to give the name of your uh, test case methods very unique so from that method name only you will be able to identify what this particular test case is doing okay though it's a long name that's fine okay so i'll say when valid department name then department should found it's a pretty long name right but that's fine from here we'll be able to identify what this particular test case is doing now in this particular method we need to find the name of the department and we need to call that method as well from the department service okay so we have to use the department service so we need to auto wire that particular class so we'll just use private department service over here and we will use auto wire and whatever the method that we create we we should annotate with at the red test so this will be used as the test function over here now let me just define string department name equals to it here i'll define okay department found equals to we need to call department service over here department service dot fetch department by name over here and in this particular fetch department by name we need to pass department name so this is a particular call that we created what we have to do is we have to validate against it okay like whatever the name that i'm passing okay and whatever the object that i'm getting back because this fetch department by name is returning the department object and it's saved in the found so that particular department name in this particular found and this particular department name if both are equal then my test case is valid so i'll just say assert equals okay and here asset equals will take two parameters okay first i'll pass department name and second i'll pass found dot get department name now this particular asset equals will match if both are equal then my test case is passed if both are not equal my test case is not passed the other thing we need to always take care is we need to write the test cases for all the scenarios all the positive scenarios all the negative scenarios as well then only our entire code coverage will be completed now this is just the happy scenario that i'm doing but we can always go with the negative scenario like when department when invalid department name then department should not return so in those type of cases we should use asset not equals or asset throws okay so these are the different methods available you can just check it out and we can validate against the data that we are sending back now the other thing we have to take care of is if you go with this particular fetch department my name this particular service is calling again the repository layer right so we already talked about like we just want to test our service layer we are not considering about how that repository layer is working so for this particular thing we need to mock it so let's mock that particular layer if you go to this particular fetch department by name let's go to the implementation for it and this particular fetch department by name is calling department repository and find by department name ignore case method over here okay so we need to mock this over here so let's go to our test class and let's mock it now if you see this particular setup method that we already added right and here you can see that there's annotation before each what it will do is this particular method will be called for each and every test case added to this particular class so whenever we run this particular method over here for that particular method this particular setup function will be called upon there is another annotation that is before all this particular if you add this particular annotation to any of the class that particular function will call before executing each and every uh, test cases once so if you have five test cases 
for this particular class only one time that particular method will be called for executing all those particular five test cases before each will be called for each and every test cases for if you have five test cases for five times this particular method will be called and there are also different annotations like after all and after each those type of annotations will is used to clear it out all the data that we have already created so you can use all those particular things as well over here so let me just use before each function over here now i need to mock it over here okay so let's mock the data now what we are mocking department repository so we need to create the object of it private department repository department repository and we'll use mock bin over here okay from the mocketo so this particular bin will be mocked now we need to tell this is mocked now when you call this particular method what you want so let's do that particular configuration so first of all what i need i need the department object that i want to return so let's create that department object first department department equals to now here i can create the object using the constructor as well or i can use the getter setters also to set all the values in my department but in the starting of the video when we were using the lumbox when we were implementing the lumbox at that time what we did we added the at the rate builder annotation to our department class not this one if you go to the entity you can see that we added the builder annotation over here so that means this is providing the builder pattern so what is builder pattern builder pattern is used when you have multiple properties available and you want to use the different sets of properties always to create the object suppose if you are creating the department object and if you have 10 properties then with the help of two properties also you can create the object with the help of five properties also you can create the object so it's not defined and based on that particular thing you can create the object now if you go with the simple approach to create the object using the constructor then if you have 10 arguments you have to pass all the 10 arguments or else what you have to do is you have to create the different constructor lot of different constructor for all the different arguments available okay that's really boring and really tedious not everyone likes right you should not do that so it's a builder pattern whatever data you want pass the data and for that particular thing that a particular object will be created so we'll be using this over here okay so we'll just get the demonstration also how we can use the builder pattern as well to create our objects you can use any approach so let's go to our test class again and here i'll see department dot builder dot now we can set all the values over here you can see that department name department code department id department address so let's set all the values i'll say department name as it dot department address as ahmedabad dot department code as it06 dot department id as 1l one long value dot build so this particular object will be built you can see that it is much neater to create the object this way right now the main thing when you call this particular fetch department by name from the repository layer from the service layer to that particular repository layer you need to pass this particular object over here so what we'll do we'll just say mocketo dot when means when you call department repository dot find department name ignore case so when this particular method has been called so it's it over here i'm defining that i want data for it dot then return department it's simple so whenever you call this particular method i want this particular department as the value back simple as it is okay and here you can see that when this particular method will be called for this particular method this setup will be called before that so this particular mock bean and the mock method will be always available for calling over here so now let's test this out so if you run this over here you can see that this particular test case is passed successfully so this is the one thing that we did over here for our service layer test so you can add all the different methods available over here you can test everything over here now a couple of more things over here that i want to share is if you see this this is the particular name of your test case that has been shown over here and it's the name of your method it's nothing wrong with it okay now you want to add something better for understanding when the report is created for your unit testing you want some better name over here okay so for that what you can do you can add the 
display name over here annotation okay this is the display name annotation and in this you can pass get data based on valid department name something you can give which is valid over here and when there is a report generated with that particular name you can identify what's happening let's run this again and let's see what's happening and here you can see that this particular test case is running but if you can see the name over here it's get data based on valid department name so it's more readable when the report is generated but now suppose you have multiple test cases available and you want to disable any test case okay then with at the rate disabled annotation you can disable that particular annotation over here so this particular test case is disabled so when the entire application when entire uh, uh, test suit is running this particular annotation with this particular uh, method will be skipped so this is all about the unit testing for your service layer now let's go ahead and do for the repository layer now testing the repository layer is little bit tricky over here right because it's your database you don't want to store any junk data while you are testing anything right that's the one thing over here and that's very important thing what we can get over here in spring boot is you can use at the rate data gpa test annotation for testing our repository layer what it does is it will whenever you are trying to persist any data in the database that particular data will persist into database at the time of that particular execution and when that particular method is completed that data will be flushed out so that's the one advantage that we are getting when you're using the at the rate gpa test over here the other thing that i have seen is or the other thing that you can implement is you can run that entire unit testing in the different database itself a testing database that you can create either you can go with the in-memory database for testing that particular thing or you can go with the containerized database that's all the advanced topic over here but let's focus on how we can do the testing for the repository layer with other data jpa test over here okay currently whatever we do over here that will be persisted for the execution of that particular method and after that particular execution of that method that particular things will be deleted so we'll check in our database also what's happening we will try to add some data or try to get some data and that particular data will be deleted so let's do that let's create the test for the repository layer the same way we did for the last time we'll go to the repository department repository and we will try to create the test over here we'll use the setup method and that's it and here you can see that in the test folder over here new repository package is created and your file is created and this particular department repository test we will annotate with data gpa test over here so a couple of things we'll be needing over here as we are doing the test for the department repository we need the object for it so we'll just do private department repository and we'll auto wire it and the other thing we need is the entity manager if you are using the entity manager that's the default entity manager that will still save and process the data so there is a test entity manager available for the JUnit and Mockito so we will use that so we will just say private test entity manager over here and we will auto wire the same so yeah you can see that this particular test entity manager is part of JP itself now in this particular example what we will implement is find by id so currently if you go to the repository layer or in the gpa repository itself there is a find by id method available to get the data based on the id itself so we have to implement that so let's go ahead and implement that now this particular layer whatever the data that we have that might not be having in the database so we need to store that particular data so let's do that in the setup function what we'll do we'll create the department object department department equals to department dot builder dot department name i'll say complete new department let's say mechanical engineering department okay dot department code i'll say mechanical engineering 011 dot department address i'll say delhi dot build over here so this is the object that I want to persist. So what I'll do, we have entity manager, right? So we'll just use entity manager dot persist and we'll pass department over here. 
so this particular data will be persist before i call my actual test case over here so let's create the test case over here so i'll just define public void when find by id then return department over here and i'll annotate with at the rate test over here so this will be in the radar now i'll say department department equals to department repository dot find by id 1l dot get simple over here and we will do assert equals department dot get department name should be equals to oh, this one mechanical engineering so this is a simple thing over here and if you go to the database you have three records available that is it ce and triple e over here and here what we defined before each function means before calling each of the test case we are saving that particular data into the database it's mock okay and we are persisting it so whenever the execution is completed this data will be deleted so let's run this test case so here you can see that execution is completed the test case is successful and if you go and see the database there is no new records available you can see that we were able to test our repository layer without doing any changes to our database itself so this is the basic approach to test our repository layer but ideally i have seen many things like uh, creating or running the entire uh, unit testing for your repository layers while connecting to the database in the entire different database or running your test database in the different container run it do the testing delete it there are a lot of different approaches available you, you can just go through the internet you will find a lot of different approaches to do this kind of testing and you can implement what is more feasible in your application but ideally this is how you should be doing your unit testing for your repository layer now this is done now let's go ahead and implement the unit testing for our controller layer let's create the test class for our controller layer let's go to the controller this is our department controller and let's create the test class for this i want this particular to be created for save department and fetch department by id okay let's do for these two things over here click on ok and you can see that this particular two test cases are the two particular methods are already been added we just have to do implementation over here now to test the controller layer is little bit different the controller layer is been called when you hit any of the endpoints so for here also we have to hit our endpoints and we will see how that particular endpoint is behaving so for that we'll be using the web mock mvc so let's go ahead and do that instead of doing the annotation like uh, spring boot test or data jpi test those were specific to what it was doing we added according to the need here this is our controller so we need to test our endpoints so we need to create the context itself okay so we can do at the rate web mvc test and i want to test my department controller so i'll just define it over here so for this particular class only my mock context will be created and you can use it now as we are using the endpoint we have to use the web mvc over here right we are using the web mvc we need to mock that particular mvc so what we can do private mock mvc and here we will do at the rate auto wired over here now the other thing that we did in the service layer itself like mocking the bean so so from the service layer we were calling the repository layer so that particular repository layer we mocked it so from the controller layer we are calling the service layer so we need to mock service layer so let's do private department service department service and we will use mock bean now let's create one of the department object as well i just want private department department object as well so this particular department object i will create from here so let me just do department equals to department dot builder dot department address as Ahmedabad dot department code as it06 
dot department name as it and dot department id as 1l that is department id as 1 and dot build over here so this is the object that i have created now i will be using this particular object in my test cases over here so let's go ahead and implement that so we'll first implement the save department test over here now for this particular save department i'll be calling the save department method of a service layer okay so for that we need to use the mock bin over here okay we need to mock it and we need to call that particular method like whenever there is an input for this i want output for this so if you go to this service layer itself and for the save method yeah you can see that for the save method it's taking entire department as the input parameter and entire department as the output parameter so we need to do that as well so let's go to the department controller test and here we need to do that so i just created the output object okay this is this will be the output so let me just create the input also so let me just copy paste it and here i'll say department input department and for the input department we won't be having the department id so this is my general object over here now we need to mock it so i'll just say mock it o dot when when there is a call for department service dot save department this particular save department will take input this one input department dot then return department over here so this department is this particular department that we created which is be persisted data okay when the data is persisted we'll be having this department id added so you can see that that's the difference over here in my input department and output department now we need to call the endpoint over here okay so what we'll be doing is we have to do mock mvc dot perform action so what i want to perform is the post request so for that what i need to do is mock mvc request builders dot post method over here okay and inside this post i need to pass my url dot content type would be media type dot application dot json dot content now this particular content would be your json data so let me just add that data i'll go to the postman i want i have to update this data so let me just go ahead and first of all update the data over here in the bar it06 and it over here so let me just copy it and paste it over here and after that and expect what i'm expecting out of it okay i'm expecting mock mvc result matchers dot status dot is okay so i should be getting the 200 okay result over here okay and here you can see that i need to add the exception to method signature let's add it and this is done now here you can see that this particular mock mvc whatever the operation that you want to perform it's correct whatever i'm adding over here i need to pass the post url as well so my url is let me go to the department controller and my url is slash departments over here okay so let me add slash departments over here so this is the final method now couple of more things that we can clear it out over here you can see that the name of this particular static classes are too big over here okay so let's do the static import for this so it's more cleaner okay so i'll just do alter enter over here and here you can see that add on demand static import for this lot more cleaner okay let's do for this as well you can see that it's a lot more cleaner over here so this is a particular method that has been created now let's test this out okay what it will do it will try to hit this slash department service and whatever the data it is input parameter this is the one and output it is testing that all the request is okay over here and whenever there is a call for this particular department service dot save department this is the mock that we have done over here so let's run this And here you can see that save department is successful no extra data has been saved everything is mocked now let's implement the another method as well that is fetch department by id so for this also what we'll be doing is we'll be using the mock it o dot when and we'll say department service dot fetch department by id here i'll pass 1l dot then return then run department object over here okay and add exception to the method signature 
ओके सिंपल नाउ यर वी नीड टू परफॉर्म दी गेट ऑपरेशन सो यर वी डेड दी पोस्ट ऑपरेशन यर विल डू गेट ऑपरेशन सो विल जस्ट से मॉक एम वी सी डॉट परफॉर्म वी कैन डू गेट वी पास द यू आर एल ओवर यर एंड यू आर एल वुड बी द सेम एल लेट मी कॉपी पेस्ट इट स्लैश वन एल बी पासिंग ओके बिकॉज द रिटर्न ऑब्जेक्ट इज दिस वन एंड द डिपार्टमेंट आई डी इज वन सो आई वॉन्ट दिस पर्टिकुलर ऑब्जेक्ट बैक डॉट कंटेंट टाइप वुड बी मीडिया टाइप डॉट एप्लीकेशन जेसन डॉट एंड एक्सपेक्ट स्टेटस डॉट इज ओके ओवर यर एंड लेट्स डू वन मोर थिंग एंड एंड एक्सपेक्ट एंड यर लेट्स चेक द जेसन वैल्यूज एज वेल सो वॉट एवर द जेसन डेटा इट इज should match with the data that we have over here same thing over here okay it's simple i'm just giving you the idea so how you can do the testing as well okay how you can match all these values so whatever the json data it would be i'll say dollar dot the name of the value so if i go to the department entity i'll match with the department name i have so let me copy paste it go to the controller which should be dollar okay dot value to department dot get department name okay simple i am matching that it should be okay result and the department name that i am getting should match with the jason's department name okay so let me run this again and here you can see that it's successful okay so you can see that we were able to implement the unit test cases for all the different layers and we also saw how we can add the unit testing for the different layers based on the different functionalities how to handle the controller layer how to handle the service layer and how to do the repository layer as well now let's see how to add the configurations in your configuration property files and how we can use that in our application so suppose considering any of the uh, data that you want to add in your configuration files okay for any reasons add that in your configuration files and how we can use it so let's go to the property files over here you can see that we are adding all those particular configurations over here so how spring boot is using all this configuration from this particular configuration files and suppose if you want to add your own configuration how we can use it so let's check how we can do it over here okay so let's see i added any of the key value pair so let's say some dot config and let's give the value as some configuration data so this is just a key value pair that i've added and i want to use this in our application so let's use it let's do it simple over here so we had a hello controller over here okay and from here we were passing this particular message over here okay this was hard coded so let's let's take this particular message and put it in this particular file over here and i'll just say welcome dot message over here simple thing that i am doing so whenever you want to change this particular welcome message you don't have to change the code just change the property file and you are good to go so this kind of configuration generally we should be adding now let's go to the controller layer hello controller and i want to send it back from here so what we can do is let's create one of the property private string welcome message over here and i want to use that particular property from that particular configuration file so i can use at the rate value over here and in this particular value annotation i need to pass that particular so let me just copy this value from here that is welcome message over here okay and if i go to this controller i can give using dollar braces and welcome dot message over here so this particular value will be fetched from the application dot property file and will be attached to this particular variable and we can pass this variable return welcome message so you can see that we remove the hard coded value and we add it in the property file so we can directly get the values from there you can see that it's very easy now we are directly getting this value as we added in the application dot property file that's the default file available if you are adding the values in the different files then you can add the property source values over here like from which particular property resources you want to fetch that particular values that also you can define using the add the property resource annotations over here so let's run this application and see 
how it's behaving okay let me run this and we'll call this particular api uh, let's run this application and we'll call this particular endpoint that's the default endpoint over here okay you can see that application is started let's go to the browser let's hit localhost 8082 slash now you can see that we are getting welcome to daily code buffer this value we are getting from the application dot property files okay so this way you can add any of the configuration values in your properties file and using the add value you can get all the values back now spring boot has a support for yaml configuration file as well so currently you see that we added all the properties in our application dot properties file that's the properties file defaultly added or defaultly created from the spring boot application there is a yaml file also created either application.yaml file or application.yml file and in that also all the configurations that you can add that's a default supported by spring boot application now why we need a yaml file why we should be opting for a yaml file the first thing is yaml file is a more human readable format and the other thing is it reduces the duplicate values over here. So currently you see that the database values that we have provided over here that is spring.datasource.url, spring.datasource.username. You can see that half of the part of this particular key is been repeated. So that is not a good way to do our configurations. What YAML provides us is a human readable format where we can remove the redundant part and we can give the configuration in a proper indented format so we'll see how we can do that but i can say that it's a really good format and it's widely uh, adopted as well so if you see any of the other technologies as well most of the technologies will be using the camel configuration itself either you go for docker kubernetes openshift or the aws configurations anything if you see currently yaml is the way to go so i prefer yaml and that's why I have included this particular topic that how we can go ahead with the YAML configuration in Spring Boot and how we can create or how we can change our current configuration also to Spring Boot. So let's see that. So what we can do over here is at the same point where our application dot properties were created here, we can create our application dot YAML file. Before that, there are different plugins available to convert your properties file to your YAML configuration as well. There are, there are plugins available in uh, IntelliJ ID also, Eclipse also, in VS Code also. So if you want to convert, you can use that as well. There are different online tools available where you give your properties and it will convert that to your YAML configuration. So you can choose any of the one, whichever is comfortable for you, you can choose. Here I'll show you how we create it, okay? So let me just create the application.yml file. I'll create a new file and I'll say application.yml. You can use YAML uh, as an extension or YML extension, whatever you like. So currently if you see to give the server port over here, it's like server.port equals to 8082. But in the application.yml file, you can give server colon port colon 8082. So this is the configuration and the indentation is very important over here. So it has to be the correct indentation. Okay. Now let's go ahead and copy paste this entire configuration. Let's go to any of the online tool available. We'll say properties to YAML. Let's use any of the tool. Let's add my properties, convert, and this is my YAML configuration. Let's copy paste and add it over here. Okay. And let me comment everything over here. We are not using the application.properties file now. Commented everything. We'll be using application.yaml. Here you can see that it's much more readable. Here we can identify server.port. And from here, you can see that there is no redundant uh, text available. Okay. This is spring.datasource.driver class name, spring.datasource.password, spring.datasource.url, spring.datasource.username. The indentation is very important. And for here, spring.jpa.hibernate dot ddl auto spring dot jpa dot show sql and this is the welcome message whatever we added over here so this way we can add the configuration in yml file and so let's run this okay so let me run the application yeah you can see that my application is started okay now it will be getting the data from this application dot yml file and if i go ahead and hit this particular url you can see that everything is working the same way
Now let's see what is profile in Spring Boot. Now consider we have an application like consider this application. Okay, this is a application where we are saving the department. So it's a department service that we created. Now this application has to be executed or has to be deployed in our dev server, QA server, stage server, production server for all the different environments. So for all those particular different environments, we will be using the different configuration properties. Let's take the example of the database only. So we'll be having the different database. So the database configuration properties that we added over here has to be different for all the environments. So how we can achieve that in spring using the profiles over here. So what we'll do, we'll create the different profiles for our Dave QA prod servers and we will add the different configurations for it. And when we deploy our application, we will give spring that deploy my application using this particular profile. Let's create the profiles in spring over here. So now as we have created the YAML configuration, we'll go ahead and create the configuration in YAML itself. Now in the YAML, what we can do, we can create the multiple documents in a single file itself. So we will be going ahead with that particular approach. Otherwise, what we can do is we can create the different configuration files for the different environment. Suppose your profile name is dev, then you can create the application hyphen dev.yml file. If your profile name is QA, then you can create application hyphen QA.yml. For the prod, you can create application hyphen prod.yml file. Else, you can add all the configuration in a multi document in a single file itself, that is application.yml file. So we'll be going ahead with that particular approach. So let's add the configuration for that. Let me create the new document. We can create new document using three hyphens over here. So this particular part is one document. The below part is another document. Now in this spring, we can define spring profiles over here. And here I define this particular profile is dev over here. So for my spring dev profile, this is my uh, database details and everything. So let me create multiple profiles over here. Okay, I'll say that this is my QA profile. And I'll say this is my prod profile over here. And I'll say my prod profile is using DCB app hyphen prod database. My QA is using DCB app hyphen QA database. And this is the using same database over here. Now, ideally all these configurations will be different. Here also we added the database different over here. Okay. Now how to tell spring which profile to run. So for that we need to give default active profile over here. So let's give that. So we can add spring profiles active over here. And let's say my active profile is QA. So currently my application should be running with this profile over here. So that means I should be having this DCB app hyphen QA database over here, but I don't have currently. Okay. I do. I have only one database. So if I start this particular application, it will fail. Okay. Let me just restart the application and it will fail. And if you see over here, here you can see that application failed to start. Okay. But if you go to the top in the logs, here you can see that the pol the following profiles are active. That is QA. So my application started using the QA profile, but the database was not available. So it failed. So let's create this particular database. Okay. So I'll just create QA and prod both. Let me create schema that is DCB app QA. And let me create the prod schema as well. Okay. So let's do this as well. Okay. Now you can see that. DCB app one schema DCB app hyphen prod and DCB hyphen QA. So three database we created for three different profiles over here. And currently you can see that for the DCB app QA, there is nothing available, no tables available. Okay. And let's start this application. And here you can see that my application is will be again started on the QA profile and application started as well. And here, if you come over here, if you refresh it, you can see that the table was created in this particular database. And if I try to execute the query, you can see that there is no data available. And if I save the data, you can see that the data has been saved in this particular QA database. So my application is running for QA now. 
okay so it's running with qa profile so we created multiple profiles and we are running with multiple profiles but this is not how you will be deploying your applications in production right you will be creating your jar files and you will be deploying it so let's see how we can do that as well so in the earlier videos also we saw that how to run our spring boot application from the ide as well and from the command as well now let's see how to deploy actually how the application will be deployed in production environment so for that we have to create our applications okay we have to create our jar files so let's go ahead and do that ideally we will be giving one specific versions to our application so for that let's go to the pom.xml file and if you go to the versions over here you can see that the my version is 0.0.1 .0 snapshot which is not correct let's say we are deploying the application with version 1 over here okay so let's say we will give 1.0.0 this is the first version that we are deploying okay in production so we give this version so my jar file will be created using this particular version so let's go to the terminal okay and let's create the jar file so with the mvn clean install command we will be creating our jar files clean will clean the target directory and install will create the package there is a package goal as well that will create the package there is a deploy goal as well that will create the package and deploy to the maven repository so you can choose any of the goals available according to requirement so this will execute all our test cases as well okay you can see that it started executing all our test cases also so until and unless all the test cases are executed our build won't be generated so that means all our unit testing is successful and we are ready to go ahead with the deployment so here you can see that we added four test cases and everything is successful and after that our build was created and if you go inside the target directory and if you do this one here you can see that this is my application that is spring boot tutorial hyphen 1.0.0.0 jar over here now we can deploy it we will be able to deploy this directly because as we are using spring boot we don't need any servers embedded server is inbuilt in our particular jar file so that entire thing will deploy to that particular embedded server so how we will run this is using java hyphen jar command okay and after that we have to give which particular jar file that we want to run so i want to run spring boot tutorial hyphen 1.0.0 jar file and after that for which particular profile I want to run this particular application. So I want to run for prod. Okay. So let's do that. Otherwise, if I don't pass any of the information over here, by default, it will run with the QA profile because we have given over here that my default profile is QA. Active profile is QA over here. So that will run with the QA profile. But if I want to override that value, I want to run this in my production with the production profile, then I can override this value using the arguments over here. So let's pass the argument that is spring dot profiles dot active equals to prod over here so this is the argument that i'm passing and overriding the values over here so let's run this and here you can see that my application has started and here you can see that my following profile is active prod okay so my application is started with the prod profile now and if i go over here to the mysql database and if I go to the prod over here, you can see that the table is created for this prod. And if I see if there is any record, there are no records available. So let's add the records to this also. If I execute this save department API, this particular department is saved. And if I execute the query, you can see that I'm getting my data in prod. So this way I will be able to deploy my Spring Boot application with different profiles. So this is how you will be uh, differentiate the different properties and different properties for the different profiles. And you can leverage this to deploy your applications in different environments. So currently, if you see, we just added only database source and the welcome message over here. We can do this for all the properties over here so just go around and explore this profile as well now let's see what is spring boot actuator now whenever we deploy any of our application into any of the environment that is production environment we have to monitor our application how that particular application is performing is the application healthy what are the different beans created what are the different objects created what's the memory utilization of our application 
all this we want to monitor so spring boot actuator provides us this particular functionality to manage our application health and all those different matrices so let's see how we can do it so for this we have to add the dependency that is spring boot actuator so let's go to the pom.xml file and let's add the dependency so this is my pom.xml file let's go ahead and add the dependency for actuator we'll go to the dependency and here i'll add spring boot starter actuator dependency and if you go to this particular file what's included is you can see that spring boot actuator auto configuration has been added so all the auto configuration has been added by default and it is using micrometer core to do all the matrices over here so after adding this dependency we have implemented the configuration to manage our application with the default configuration so let's see what we have defaultly configured so let's run this application and let's see what default we have so here you can see that our application is started let's go to the browser and yeah you can see that our application is running so to go to the help points actuator help points if you go to the console logs as well here you can see that there are two endpoints has been exposed at the path slash actuator so let, let's see this path so i'll add this particular path and here you can see that there are two endpoints that has been uh, added to here that is health over here and info over here so let's see that if i open the health over here you can see that we are getting status is up so this particular health endpoint will give what's the status of our application what's the health of our application so currently the status is up so my application is healthy and now let's see what info is giving currently nothing okay but the endpoints are available now there are a lot more endpoints available that are by default disabled because it's an auto configuration done by spring boot you can enable it whatever you want and you can disable it whichever you don't want so by default spring boot thought okay these two are important so they enabled those things the rest of the things are disabled now let's see how to enable it okay so let's go to the application so now let's enable all the different endpoints over here so for this we need to go to the application.yaml file and you can see that my default profile is qa let's add in the qa for now okay so i'm just adding this particular configuration that is management.endpoints.web.exposure include all so enable all the endpoints you can expose all the endpoints for the jmx as well so there are two types of options available for the web and jmx you can choose either of the one currently we are just going for the web just for the simplicity to see how the actuator is working but there are a lot more things that you can do so this has been enabled now okay now let's run the application and see what all things are available so here you can see that my application started and if i go to this particular blog you can see that there are 13 endpoints exposed beneath the slash actuator over here so let's go ahead and see that so let me just refresh it and here you can see that there are 13 endpoints available okay you can see that beans available cache available health info conditions config properties environment variables loggers head dump thread dump metrics what are the schedule tasks mappings everything is available you can see all those particular values so let's see the different values let's see the environments so here you can see that these are the different environment values available okay some of these values are default set by the spring boot auto configuration and if you add new values that will be added that you all can see over here all these particular endpoints has to be secured because no one should be able to access this endpoint so it should be behind your spring security so that also you should implement all these particular endpoints should be behind your spring security currently we are now not doing anything over here so let's see all the values so this is the environment let's go ahead and see the config properties here you can see that these are the different configuration properties added and here you can see that it will also show from where this particular config properties has been added we have created the application.yaml file and at this particular line number this particular value has been added that is show sql here you can see that exposure endpoint this is coming from application.yaml file from this file and all the other values will be added by the default configurations as well let's see the beans as well here you can see that these are the different beans added to our application okay 
uh, let's see if there is any cache there is no cache manager added okay uh, let's see the loggers okay you can see that the log levels for each and everything so there are a lot of endpoints available you can get the thread dump as well okay all these values available now all these values you can expose over the jmx also and you can monitor everything using the jmx as well so there is a spring admin available you can use the spring admin to utilize all these apis and create the entire dashboard as well so there are a lot more things and a lot of features available within the spring framework as well to utilize everything so just go through the documentation and you will get a lot more idea about spring actuator as well now if you want to override any of the APIs available that also we can do consider info is not providing a lot of details over here you can add a details in the info endpoint as well and if you want you can create your new endpoint as well and you can expose over here so let's see how we can do it so let's go to the application and let's create the endpoint so in my application let's create the package over here that will say config because we are adding the configuration and let's say we are creating one of the class that is feature endpoint so we are just creating one of the management endpoints from the actuator that will say which all the features are enabled for this particular application so from that we can directly identify which features are there in this particular environment which features are there in this particular environment we can get the idea so let's create the endpoint for that so i'll just say feature endpoint class I will annotate this particular class with at the rate component so this is in the springs radar now now to create this particular feature endpoint as the endpoint for the actuator we have to annotate with at the rate endpoint here you can see that this particular endpoint annotation is the part of spring boot actuate so let's create the endpoint over here and we can pass the id over here id equals to let's say features now let's create this particular functionality what we will do we will create one uh, map over here that will have the data like which particular feature is enabled or disabled so let's do that we'll just do private final map map is of type string which particular feature it is and that particular feature uh, details that we can add over here okay so for that let's create the feature class and for this i'll say features map okay equals to new this is a concurrent hash map okay so this particular object is created let's create this feature inner class okay so we just created the inner class over here and let's make it static inside this let's create the different properties we can create different properties and we can show all the properties over here for now let's create only single property that says it's enabled or disabled and i'll say here private boolean is enabled okay this is one property and i won't get a setters for this property so i'll just say add the data using lumbok to add the data setters i want no or constructor i want all args constructor simply okay so i just added all these particular things so i can add all the data in this feature map now let's add this particular map using the constructor so let me just create the constructor over here and inside this constructor what i'll do i'll say feature map dot put and i'll say department feature okay i have a department implemented so let's say department feature is implemented and here i'll say new feature will say true we just added is enabled field as a true this particular feature is implemented okay now let's add multiple values let's say that after department we will be creating the user service as well to save the user but currently that is not implemented we will be adding the authentication as well but currently that is not implemented so we just added all these particular values now let's create the endpoints so for the endpoints we need to create the method so we will just say public and it will return the map and this map will be of string and feature okay so what we are doing is we are trying to send this particular feature map back when it calls features okay we'll say return feature map so what we are doing is we created one of the endpoint that is features 
and that will send back the list of features available inside this particular application so this is the one endpoint that we added now this particular features will be the get operation okay so we want to read the data so for that we need to add read operation over here we can create the write operation also and we can create the delete operation also delete operation for deleting write operation for saving the data now let's create one more endpoint to gather the details of that particular feature that we are selecting so let's create that as well we'll say public which will return feature object and we'll say this is a feature endpoint and which will return feature map dot get whatever key you pass so for that we need to take input also so we'll just say we'll be taking input as a feature name over here and this particular feature name we have to pass in this particular get method now this is also read operation okay we are getting the data but one thing where we have to add over here is that this particular feature name is a selector so we need to select that particular value and pass over here so for this there is a selector annotation available so we created the two endpoints over here that are get operations to get the list of features and to get the features in our application now let's run this and let's see what's happening okay let's run the application And here you can see that my application started and now here you can see that earlier there were 13 endpoints now you can see that there are 14 endpoints because we created the new endpoint over here okay so let's go ahead and refresh my actuator over here and here you can see that this is the features that we added new over here so let's go to this features endpoint over here and here you can see that these are the features that we added right department feature user feature authentication feature and we also told that okay this is true false false and these are the different attributes that we can add now there was also one more uh, endpoint that we created that is feature slash selector so if you pass any of the feature name that will be called so for this particular features if i pass department feature over here let's select this department and if i pass this particular department value it will get the details of that particular department so currently we have added only one attribute so it's showing the one attribute but if we have multiple if you want to describe what this particular feature is we can add all the details and we can show it over here so this is how we can implement the different actuator endpoints and we can utilize this particular functionality now suppose there are a lot more endpoints available and if you want to exclude that if you want to not expose those particular values so let's see how we can do that so currently if you see that there are environments and beans available that shows all the information about our application like what what are the different environments added what are the different beans or objects created so let's hide those things so for that what we need to do is we will go to our application.yaml file let's go to the application.yaml and these are the management endpoints that we have exposed so here you can see that we included everything now we can exclude also so here i can say exclude exclude environment endpoint and exclude beans endpoint we need to give in quotes so i'm excluding these two endpoints over here so let's run this application again and here you can see that out of 14 only 12 endpoints are available these two endpoints are not available and if i go ahead and refresh my application you won't be able to find any beans over here okay or no, not environment as well so this way we can disable the endpoints as well from the actuator so this was all about the spring boot over here okay we cover a lot of topics over here so if you are aware about all these particular things then you are good to go to create the production grade application so there are a lot of different things that we covered over here we saw the different annotations available in the spring boot and how we can use those particular annotations we saw how to create the different endpoints available and we also saw how to save all those particular data in the database we also saw how to use multiple database as well to change the database and all those particular things we also saw how to change the configuration using the configuration.properties files we also saw how to do the unit testing of all our components that we created we did controller testing service testing repository testing as well we did the profiles how to deploy our applications in different environments using the different profiles as well we also see how different actuator endpoints are available we also converted our properties to the yaml configuration that is widely being used 
so this is a lot of things that we covered and if you know all these things you will be a really good spring boot developer and you can always learn advanced topic going through the documentation for this Now, if you have already gone through the Spring Boot tutorial, then it's probably like you need to understand in depth about the Spring Data JPA. Now, in that particular tutorial, we covered the brief about the Spring Data JPA and we created few of the APIs. In this tutorial, we are going to deep dive about all the topics available in Spring Data JPA. Now, what we are going to cover in this particular tutorial, we are going to cover how to map a particular class to a particular database table, how a relationship is been created using the particular one to one mapping, one to many mapping, many to one mapping and many to many mappings. So we'll go through all the different types of mapping relationships available in JPA. We'll also understand what is JPA and why we need JPA. And we are also going to see a different annotations available that will help us to create more robust applications like how we can add the native queries, how we can add the GPQL queries, how we can add the embedded classes in our entities all those different things we are going to see over here. We are also going to see how we can create the unidirectional and bidirectional relationships. We are also going to see how we can add different constraints and how we can match our entity with the exact table that we have in our database. So there is a lot of things that we have to cover in this particular tutorial. So I suggest you to do practice while I'm going through the tutorial. Now when we are working with the Java applications and we have to connect to the database, what we do is we use JDBC. So JDBC is an API provided by Java so we can connect with the database. Now the problem here is Java works on the concepts of objects and classes and database works in the concepts of tables that will be having rows and columns. Now how to match together? Now in the traditional way, if you're using the JDBC, what we'll be doing is we will be getting the data from the database that will be in the table. We are getting the all the records and we are converting them in the objects or the classes that we have. So that's the conversion that we are doing. But Ideally, we should not be doing those conversions. There has to be a system where it defines that this particular class or objects represents this particular table in the database. Now, for these reasons, there are different frameworks available that gives us the functionality that is called ORM, that is Object Relationship Mapping. Now, what ORM is, ORM defines whatever the classes or objects is defined in your system in your Java application that will represent the table in your database. Now the frameworks like Hibernate, iBat is provides this type of functionalities. Now what happens is Hibernate has its own implementation of ORM, how the different functionalities, how the different sessions, objects and how it is behaving and how it is interacting with the database is different compared to how it's in the iBat is because iBat is will also have its own implementation. If there is any other framework, those particular frameworks will also have its own implementation. Now, when this type of different implementations are there, when we have to change any of the implementation framework, like if I want to change from Hibernate to Ibatis, then it's very difficult. So whatever the specification has been used by Hibernate doesn't necessarily to be used the same in the Ibatis. So what the Java people thought of, let's create the standard specification and those standard specification will be used by the all the third party API providers or ORM providers and whenever we have to switch between those providers, it's very easy for the application developers. So suppose Java provides a JPA specification, that's a Java persistent API specification provided by Java and all the framework providers like Hibernate, iBatis and all the difference available will be using those specifications and creating their implementation of ORM. So what happens is if you are using the JPA and if you want to convert from Hibernate to Ibatis or from Ibatis to Hibernate, then you can convert it very easily. Now the one important thing is what Java provides is just a specification. So you have to go ahead with the implementation provider. So you cannot tell that, okay, I'm just going with the JPA. If you're going with the JPA, you must be using Hibernate or Ibatis or any of the framework, the ORM provider, because JPA is just a specification and you are using that specification via any of the framework provider or any of the third party provider ORM providers. So this way JPA specification has been implemented and the application developers implement those JPA using any of the third party framework available and switching between them is very easy. So this is all about why JPA was introduced and how Hibernate and all those different framework uses JPA and how we can change whenever we need to change in our application. 
So now let's see what we are going to build it today. We are going to build a small relationship over here. I'll show you the example. You can see that this is the class diagram that I have prepared and we are going to build this particular class diagram over here using the Spring Data GPA. Now what all the things are over here? You can see that there is a student class, there is a guardian class, course teacher and course material over here. Now all these different classes are represented by the tables in the database. So we are going to create the tables based on the classes that we have defined over here. Now here you can see that all these particular different classes defines a particular relationship with each other. So we are going to see what those particular relationships are and how we can define the relationship in the entity so that a particular represented tables are created in the database and how we can store those data. So here you can see that we have a student class and we have few of the attributes available like student ID, first name, last name, email ID. This particular class have its name and have its different properties available. So that particular class, how it's represented in the database is that particular class name will be represented by the table name. Okay. And all the properties that are there like student ID, first name, last name, email ID, all those particular attributes are represented by the different columns. So there will be different columns and for all the columns we will be inserting the records over there. All those particular records will be rows created, right? So this is just a simple representation how an object will be represented in a database table. Now this particular student will have a guardian who is the guardian for that particular student. So that relationship how we want to define we will be defining in our system. Now there is a one to many relationship between student and courses because one student can opt for many courses available. Now there is a one to one relationship between course and course material. For every course there will be a one course material object and without the course you cannot create the course material as well. So there is a one to one relationship between course material and course available. Now between teacher and courses there is a one to many or many to one relationship you can say because one teacher can teach multiple courses and on the other hand you can say that multiple courses can be taught by one of the teacher. Okay, so there will be one to many relationship or many to one relationship how you can define in the system that's that will represent what you are going with many to one or one to many. Now between student and courses multiple student can opt for multiple courses. So it's a many to many relationship like many student will be opting for many courses. So this is just the overview of all the different classes that we are going to create and how they are related with each other. So when we create the application, we'll be creating all these particular classes and we will define the relationships as well. Now let's go ahead and create one Spring Boot application where we will define the Spring Data JPA and we will connect to our database. So let's go to the spring initializer over here. Okay. Start.spring.io and let's define the properties over here. I'll define group as com dot daily code buffer artifact as spring data GPA tutorial name as spring data GPA tutorial and package name I'll define as spring dot data dot GPA dot tutorial. Okay. So this is just a simple package name that I have defined over here. I'll be using the packaging as jar file Java version as 11 and let's add the dependencies. As we are going with the GPA, first thing we'll add is Spring Data GPA. I'll add the Lumbug dependency, okay, to reduce our boilerplate code. And I'm going to use the MySQL database. So I'm going to add the MySQL driver and let's add the Spring Web dependency as well. So suppose if you want to create the REST APIs out of it, you can create the REST APIs as well. Okay, so these are the four dependencies I have added over here. So let's generate the project and open in our IDE. So I'll be using IntelliJ IDEA. You can use any IDE of your preference. Okay, let me open IntelliJ IDEA. Open project and Spring Data GPA tutorial. So it's resolving the dependencies. Let's wait for a second. Okay, so this is my project over here. Let's open the pom.xml file and here you can see that we added Spring Data GPA, Spring Starter Web and if you go to Spring Starter Data GPA, so this particular Spring Data GPA is using Hibernate as its default implementation over here. Okay, so we are using GPA with the Hibernate implementation. Okay, and if you want to change it, we can change it as well. Okay, let's go with the default for now. Okay, so this is our pom.xml file. All the details are there. 
now what we have to do over here let's open the mysql as well okay i'm using mysql workbench 8.0ce so this is our database now here you can see that we have only default databases available so what we will be doing is we will be creating one of the database over here and we will be providing all this particular configuration details in our spring boot application so that spring boot application can connect to this particular database so let me go ahead and create the database over here i'll just go ahead and create schema i'll say school db over here apply the changes finish and here you can see that school db is created and there is nothing inside this particular schema okay now what we have to do is for our spring boot application to connect to this particular database we have to give the properties in our application.properties file so let's go to the src main resources application.properties and here we can define the configuration okay so let's add those configurations now here you can see that i have just copy pasted the configurations over here and this is very simple here you can see that i have just added spring.datasource.url the url of your database the username and password of your database okay and which particular driver that you are using as we have added mysql driver and i'm using mysql database i have just defined that i'm using com.mysql.jdbc.driver over here and i just defined spring.jpa.showsql as true so whenever we are doing any operation all those particular queries will be printed in the logs now this particular thing spring.jpa.hibernate.ddl auto this particular thing i have defined as update now this particular thing defines whatever changes that you do in your application like whatever entities and whatever classes that you define those particular thing how it will interact with the database that has been defined by this ddl auto so suppose currently if you see that i have added update so whatever the updates i do in my entities or any of the objects that i'm creating those updates will be applied to my database directly so suppose what will happen is if you have three fields available in your database and three particular available in your classes as well and if you add two new that two new changes will be applied to your database as well so there are different properties available for this okay you can go and check that out as well it is advisable not to use this particular property in the production application because generally when you are working with the production applications there will be a different team available that will be handling your database operations and different scripts you need to create to do all the changes regarding your database and your application will be different so this particular thing that i have added over here just to make sure that whatever changes that we are doing in our application that is directly been reflected and you can directly see what's happening in the database when we do any changes in our entities over here so for that purpose only i have added over here but when whenever you are going with the production you should not use this it's not advisable and whatever particular database objects or database tables are there how to create the same representative in the class that we are going to see over here so suppose any new constraint is been added in your database how to add that particular constraint in your entity in java that we are going to see over here so you can match all those particular things so this is a simple configuration that has been added over here now let's move ahead and let's create the entities over here let's see how to map a class to the table so with this particular example that you can see over here okay these are the different classes that we are going to create and how to map that so let's start with the student over here we'll create the student class and let's see how we can map that particular class to the database so we have student class which is containing student id first name last name email id and the guardian details as well so let's go ahead and create that so i'll go to intellij idea in the java folder let me create one package over here i'll say as entity inside this particular entity let's create the class and i will call this particular class as student this is the class now to represent this particular class to a database to make our system know that this is particular entity that you are going to create to map to the database we have to annotate this class with at the rate entity and you can see that we are using javax.persistent.entity package over here now whatever we do in this particular student class that will be reflected in our database okay now what we want in this particular student class as you can see that we want student id first name last name email id and the guardian details so let's go ahead and add that so i'll say private long student id okay private string 
first name private string last name private string email id and we need to add the guardian details as well right so let's add those as well private string guardian name email and mobile number okay private string guardian email and private string guardian mobile okay so these are the different fields that i have added over here now we need to have the getter setters and the constructors and two string method over here so let's use the lumbuck over here so i'll just define at the rate data using the lumbuck so all the getter setters and two string and hash code and equal methods will be generated over here and i need all args constructor over here and i also need no args constructor over here okay one more thing i am adding over here is at the rate builder to add the builder pattern for my entity class over here okay so this is just a simple thing that i have created over here now this student is a particular class that represents the table using this entity now table now whatever the table that we are going to create will always have one primary key to define the unique identifier for all our records okay so how we can create that so so this particular student id i want to create as a primary key so i'll define with at the rate id over here of java x dot persistent so this particular annotation at the rate id will define that this particular field is the primary key over here now let's run this application and let's see what is happening okay there's a lot of changes that we are going to do but let's see what is happening till now okay if you go to the database okay there is nothing available over here okay i'll go to the main class file over here and i'll just run this application and here you can see that create table student okay here you can see that whatever we have defined in this particular student class okay that particular update operation happened to our database because student table was not available so and in our application we have defined the student entity so that update happened to our database so this new table is created and if you go ahead and check in our database yeah you can see that this particular tables getting one student table over here and if you see over here these are the columns available student id email id first name guardian name guardian mobile name and last name okay yeah you can see that whatever you defined student over here okay in the lower case it created the same table name over here and whatever the camel casing that you have defined over here and here you can see see that using the underscore as a separator all those particular columns are defined over here so that's a default format available when you are creating the entities and how those particular entities will be created in the table format now this particular table is created right now as i already told you that when you are working with the production application you won't be using this particular functionality like ddl auto update there will be already table created and you need to define that particular table in your entities now suppose the name of that particular table is tbr underscore student how you will define that in your entity like, like this particular student entity is representing that tbl underscore student in my database because currently if you see that whatever is defined student the same student table is created okay the column also similar way so let's see how we can define all those particular things now one more thing to note over here is as i already told you that we are using ddl auto as update so whatever the update operations we are doing those particular changes will be happening and it sometimes it may not change the table structure as well so, so what uh, we will be doing is sometimes we will be deleting the table and we will be starting our application so that fresh changes will be applied so we can see what is actually happening over here okay so let's go back let's stop the server and now let's add few of the details now what i want to do is i want to add this particular student entity into my database as a tbl student i want to represent with underscore tbl underscore student okay so i'll define this using at the rate table annotation okay 
and inside this table of nutrition what is the name of the table so i'll define as ebl underscore student now if i start this particular application what will happen is new table will be created with the name table underscore student because whatever changes are already there in the database it will remain the same and the new updates will be added this particular hibernant will understand that okay tbl underscore student is a new table that is not present in the database so let's create it so it will go ahead and create it so that's why i was telling that whenever this type of things will happen we will delete that particular table and we will start our application to apply all our changes freshly so this is the way that we have defined the name of the table now how to define the columns as well so suppose let's go ahead and i want this particular email id as email address not the email underscore id so to define that we can use at the rate column annotation to define the name of the column so here i'll define that name of the column is email underscore address so this defines that whatever the email id is represented over here and in the table it will be represented by email underscore address so this way you can see that we have added the configuration for how our table should be and how our column should be ideally you should define all these particular annotations and all these particular values for each and every fields so here due to the time constraint we won't be adding for all the particular fields okay so this is how you can add those particular annotations now whenever you're working with the primary keys you will be incrementing those particular primary keys and you are going to store those particular values so in the ideal scenarios you will be doing using the sequence generator using the sequence okay so that particular sequence will be auto generated auto incremented every time when you're going to store the particular data so let's see how we can add those particular things so in this particular student id we will be adding the sequence generator how the sequence should be generated and in the generated values how we have to use those particular values so let's see the annotation at the rate sequence generator over here and here we will define what is the name of this particular sequence generator and what is the name of the sequence as well so if you are familiar with the databases you will be having the sequences created and those particular sequence will be incremented when you want to store those particular values and here i'll define the allocation size as well okay allocation size is one and the name of the sequence is student underscore sequence define the same over here that name of the sequence is student underscore sequence now we will define how to generate those particular values for the student id so we'll use the generated value annotation okay and here we will define what is the strategy and here we'll define strategy should be generation type dot sequence because we are using the sequence to generate the values and we'll define the generator that means our sequence so this is a simple annotation that we have added what is the sequence generator and in the generated value annotation which what particular strategy that you want to use we are using auto if you, you can use identity as well but we want a particular thing we have a particular requirement that we want to use sequence that's how ideally you should be doing the production application as well so we have defined that way that generation type is sequence and what sequence that i want to use that whatever i've defined over here now based on the drivers that we have used this particular sequences will be created now if you're using the oracle the sequence will be created in the postgres also the sequence will be created but in the mysql sequences are not there so it will create one of the tables over here and it will increment the values every time when we are doing the insert operations now in our table sometimes we will be having our different constraints as well so let's define the different constraints suppose if you see my email id over here okay this email id whatever i defined should be unique for every student okay like multiple students cannot have the same email id so i want to define a constraint for my table that this particular column should have a unique value so let's add that particular constraint so to add that particular constraint we will go over here in the table annotation whatever we have defined the name here you have unique constraints available okay so let's use this and we will do at the rate unique constraints and let's refine the unique constraints over here you can add multiple unique constraints over here so that's why it's a list over here and here you can see that you can define the name of the unique constraint and the column name as well 
I'll define this as email id underscore unique and column name as email address okay simple over here right now as we are adding this particular email id as unique i want that particular email id from student every time right so whenever we are adding the new student in the database i want that particular email id because as we have added the unique constraint over here that means that particular email id will define that particular student so in the columns we can define the nullable columns and non nullable columns as well so this particular email id should be non nullable column that means we should be getting that particular value value right so let's define that so in this particular column annotation for the email id we will define that this particular nullable should be false that means every time we should be getting this particular value if you are not getting this value it will throw an exception over here so yeah you can see that we added a lot of things in our entities over here right we define the table information unique constraint the sequences how the sequences should be created how the value should be incremented and how a column should be defined it's a nullable column or a non nullable column all those things we have defined these are the general things that will be available for your tables okay so whatever is there you can define this way over here now i will show you what will happen over here when we run the application currently you can see that we already have one student table over here and when we start our application as we have defined the ddl auto as update a new table will be created okay i'll show you that in a second now you can see that create table tbl student whatever we defined over here okay so that means a new table is created so in our database there is two table student and tbl student so yeah what all things happen you can see that it created the table over here with all these particular fields now you can see that it altered the table and added the constraint over here unique constraint that we have defined okay and you can see that it also created the student sequence table over here and it added the value one so whenever we are adding the values now in the database that particular one will be used to insert the data and that particular value will be incremented then so let's go to the database and let's see what happened school db i'll just refresh it and here you can see that there are two tables created student was already there tbl student was created okay these are the columns and if you go to the indexes there is a primary key that we have defined and there is also a unique key that we have defined over here okay but i don't want this particular two tables over here so what you can do is just delete those particular tables and restart your application so that particular only one table will be created now let's understand repositories so let's go to the application let me stop the server now as a repositories there are different types of interfaces available that defines the different implementation of different methods that we can use directly for our entities that we have created suppose if you want to save that particular entity if you want to delete that entity if you want to get all the records available for all those different standard operations those there are different default implementations added using the different repositories in the spring data jpa so let's check what all the different things are available so what i'll do is i'll create the student repository and i'll implement the different repositories i'll show you how to extend the different repositories available for our student entity over here so let me go ahead and create one package over here and i'll say as repository okay and for this particular repository i'll create one class sorry one interface and i'll say this is a student repository okay now i'll define this at the rate repository over here it's a stereo type annotation so spring will understand that this particular interface that we have created is a repository interface now this particular interface can extends different repositories available so if you see gp repository okay this is the repository available and this particular repository if i open this now you can see that this particular gp repository is the interface that extends paging and sorting repository and query by example executor over here and this particular jp repository is using the generix which is taking t and id t is your entity over here and id is the 
type of the entity that you have defined so in our case t is student and id is of type long that we have defined over here okay now here you can see that there are different methods available like find all like find all will return the list of t available so t is student so it will re return the list of students available find all method is there this find all is taking sort as the input parameter so we can define the different sortings over here it can save all the data it can flush it can save and flush all these particular different methods are available in jpa repository now if you see jpa repository is extending paging and sorting repository so let's see what different methods available there you can see find all and find all using the page so if you want to implement paging to get the different records available using the pagination type we can do that as well over here and this particular paging and sorting repository is again extending crud repository so this crud repository is having the different methods such as save method save all find by id so this will defaultly get to the data based on the primary key that you have defined you can see it's passing the primary key over here okay so it is also have the method like exist by id if the value record is available or not find all find all by id count how many records are there delete by id delete so you can see that these are the default implementations available for our repository so we can directly use this particular methods to reduce our efforts over here and there are a lot of different functionalities extra available that you can use to create the different implementation custom implementation as well so we are going to see all those particular things in the later part of the video so you can see these are the methods available let's close these things okay let's define the jp repository for now over here and we will define that it's of type student and of type long over here simple thing now let's test whatever we have created over here okay so ideally you will be creating the rest apis and you will be calling those particular repository methods from the rest api here what we'll be doing is we won't be creating the rest apis we'll be just creating the test class to test this particular repository that we have created to save the time over here okay and if you want to understand how to create the rest apis and how to interact using this particular repositories i have created a dedicated video spring boot tutorial the advanced course you can go ahead and check that out as well in this particular video our main focus is to how jpa works so we'll be only focusing on the repository layers okay what we'll be doing is we'll be creating the test class for this and we will create the different test methods and we will call the different methods available for the student repository and call them with alt insert you can go for the generate and you can generate the test class so i've just defined the simple test class over here that is student repository test over here and i will annotate with spring boot test over here now ideally you should not be testing your repository layer using the spring boot test there is a different annotation available that is at the rate data jpa test what this particular thing will do is it will help you to test your repository layer and once the operation is completed it will flush the data so the database won't be impacted but currently we want to impact our database we want to store our values into our database so we can see what's happening over here so that's why i'm going with the standard testing over here now for this student repository test we need a student repository so let's go ahead and create the object for it student repository student repository and i will auto wire it okay now let's create one method to save the student over here so what we will do is i'll create the method public void save student okay and i'll annotate this particular method with at the red test so we can run this particular test case so don't focus on the test cases that we are going to we are creating just focus on what's happening when we are using the repository how spring data jpa works and how we are going to store the data how we are going to fetch the data all those particular things are more important in this particular course okay so to save the student we need to create the student object with all the values that we have in the student class you can see that we have used the builder pattern so we are going to use this builder pattern to create our object so what we'll do i'll just say student student equals to student dot builder dot we are not going to store the student id because student id will be auto generated using the sequence that we have provided let's pass the email id i'll say shabir at gmail dot com i'll say first name as 
shabir dot last name as daudi and let's add my guardian name as well i'll just say any name nikhil guardian email as nikhil at gmail.com guardian mobile Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Anything remaining? Guardian email, guardian name, last name, first name, email ID, guardian mobile. Okay, and build. So this particular object is built. Now what I want to do is I want to do student repository dot save. What I want to save this student object. Simple. Okay. So I'm just using the save method. Of a JP repository, JP repository is again extending the CRUD repository. So you can see that this particular save method is part of the CRUD repository over here. Currently, if you go and check the database, this particular student repository is going to use the TBL underscore student over here. Currently, you can see there is no records available. So let's go ahead and run this particular method. Okay, you can see that this particular method is successful. Now, if you go down over here, you can see that these are the particular different queries that are being executed. You can see that select next well as ID well from the student sequence. Okay, so it took the value from the student sequence that we have created, and after that, it updated the sequence to the new value. Okay, and it inserted the data into TBL student over here. Okay, so these are the three queries that has been executed over here. And if you go ahead and check the values over here, you can see that we got the values. Student ID is one, email ID, first name, guardian email, guardian mobile, guardian name, and last name. All the particular data has been saved over here. It's cool, right? With one method, with one line of code, we are able to save the data over here. Now let's create one more method to get the list of students available in the database. So let me just create one more method public void print all student okay and this is also i'm going to annotate with test over here and what i'll do is i'll just define list of student student list and this is from java.util equals to student repository dot find all simple over here okay and let me just print it okay let's run this particular method as well now as we have only one student available that particular student will be printed over here now you can see that the query was executed select all the particular columns from that particular tbl underscore student over here okay and this is the data student list equals to first student that is student id first name last name and all those particular details available cool so everything is working fine now in this particular student class that we have created there is an improvement that we can do so let's see what we can do over here now if you see over here this particular student class contains this particular fields over here that is guardian name guardian email and guardian mobile ideally this all details should be in the separate class because student is a separate class is a separate object and guardian should be a separate object and there has to be relationship between these two there has to be different relationship available but ideally this particular data should be saved in a single table in my database okay so let's see how we can do that so this particular property is available guardian name guardian email guardian mobile should be in the different class itself so let's go ahead and create the guardian class okay and this particular guardian class will be having those properties i'm just removing from here and i'm adding those properties over here but this particular guardian class 
cannot be an entity because I don't want to have the different table for it. I want to use this particular properties for my student table only. So how we can do that? We can do using the embed. Okay, we can embed this particular class inside my student. So for my student class to embed this garden class, this particular garden class should be embeddable. So I'll define this as embeddable. Simple, right? So this particular class is embeddable. Now I can use this particular class in my student. So let's go back to student and here I can define private guardian guardian and this is embedded. Now this particular guardian class should also be annotated with at the data because we need data setters. We need all args constructor. We need no args constructor as well. Simple over here, right? Now as all these particular properties are inside this particular garden class can be directly named, right? Email and mobile number, which makes more sense. Okay. But now what happens when we do this? Because as we have all the properties in our table, that is guardian email, guardian mobile, guardian name. And here we have defined as name, email and mobile over here. We need to map it together. Okay. So here what we have to do is we have to map this particular attribute to our database that we have or to all these particular properties. So we need to use the attribute overrides annotation over here. So let's see how we can do this. So what I want to do, whatever the properties are there, this name, email and mobile number should represent to guardian email, guardian mobile and guardian name over here. So let's see how we can do. We can use at the rate attribute overrides annotation over here as we want to override multiple attributes. We'll define the list over here and here I'll define at the rate attribute override over here and it have name of the attribute and the column name. So let's define those things and column over here. So the name of the attribute is this one, this name and we are, we need to define the column over here. Okay. And in this particular column, this is a column. So we need to define at the rate column over here and this has the name, the name of the column we need to define as guardian underscore name, whatever is over here, guardian underscore name. Okay, cool. Now the same thing we have to define for the rest as well, email and mobile. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll say at the rate attribute override and I will say name equals to whatever the name, name is email and column equals to at the rate column and name of the column is guardian underscore email okay one more at the rate attribute override the name of the attribute is mobile okay and column we have to define column equals to at the rate column and inside this let's define the name name equals to guardian underscore mobile hope the spellings are correct name mobile and email so we just define the three attribute overrides like this particular attribute should define to this particular column name and this particular guardian we have added as a property in our student so all good now there will be a issue how we define the or how we create the student object so if you go to the student repository test over here you can see that now there is no longer a guardian name available let me just comment it over here for now so there is no issue for now and let's create a new method save student with guardian okay public void save student with guardian details I'll annotate with other test over here and let's define student student equals to student dot builder dot build okay so here I need to define dot first name as shivam dot email id as shivam at gmail dot com last name as kumar 
dot guardian now this guardian will take the entire guardian object okay so let's let's build that as well so what i'll do i'll just create the guardian object over here guardian guardian equals to guardian dot okay let me go to the guardian and let me define the builder pattern over here now you don't have to do this okay i like builder pattern and i like the way it looks so that's why i'm doing it okay guardian builder dot build email i'll use the same information okay nikhil is the guardian dot name as nikhil dot mobile as one two three four five six seven eight nine okay some number and build over here and i'll use this guardian over here and i need to save this object so i'll just say student repository dot save student now let's run this yeah you can see that it is successful and yeah you can see that the select for the sequence update for the sequence and insert into table over here and if i run the query again you can see that we are getting the record shivam shivam and all this particular detail so yeah you can see that we separated out the two different classes over here okay that is guardian and student but we represented the same in our database over here using the embeddable and embedded over here so if you have something like this when you are using the inheritance parent child relationship you can go ahead with this particular approach now let's see the different uh, methods available how we can create the different methods in our student repository so suppose we saw that there are only few of the methods available in our student repository but if you want to create the custom methods suppose i want to get the students record based on the name of the student so let's see how we can do that so in the student repository student interface we can define the methods so i'll just define public and i'll say my return type is list of student okay and the name of the method that you give over here it has to be in the format that has been defined so i can define find and by what by by capital and then you need to define the attribute name so if you go to the student class over here and here you can see that it is first name over here okay it is in the camel casing here also it should be in the camel casing so i'll just define over here and as it's in camel casing f should be capital over here okay find by first name and then you need to pass the string over here that will be containing your first name so i'll just say first name over here that's it you just need to give the definition you don't have to implement it so i just define one method that is find by first name so let's go ahead and test it out we'll go to the student repository test over here and let's create one more method we'll say public void print student by first name i'll annotate to get the test and i'll say i just need list of students equals to student repository dot find by first name that we have defined and i want the record that is having first name as shivam over here and let's print it let's run this so we should be only getting shivam over here and we'll see what query we are getting out of it okay so here if you scroll down over here you can see that we got the one record which is having first name as shivam over here okay only one record over here now if you see the query yeah you can see that it is doing select from all the particular columns available and at the last if you go where student dot first name equals to whatever the value that you are passing over here so this way you can see that you can create the methods now suppose you want to create the methods 
to fetch the student who is containing first name as some of the characters ok so suppose currently we saw that currently you see that we have just defined that first name is exactly matching that you provide over here but suppose if you want to get the particular students with some of the particular characters that you want to match so that you can define using this way I'll just say I just need list of student find by first name and I'll say containing and I'll pass string name okay simple so what I define over here is I need the records based on the first name but it has containing characters okay I just I, do, I don't want to match the entire string particularly but if we have some of the characters I want that particular records so let's go to the student repository test again let's copy paste this method first name I'll just say containing and here also I'll just say find by first name containing and I just need data which contains sh so let's run this so here you can see that the query executed if you go at the last okay you can see that the first name like whatever you have defined okay like it's doing the escape characters okay percentage part of the name that you are giving and percentage over here and here you can see that you got both the records Shivam and Shabir both the one so this way you can create the different methods as well let's define one more method okay we'll just say I just need a list of students okay find by suppose last name which is implemented the method to get the data by first name now find by last name and that should be not null okay simple I want the records which are not null okay so it will check that last name is not null we will get those particular records now suppose you want to get the data based on the guardian name so that also we can do we can just say list of student find by now this you need to define based on the attributes so in the student table there is an attribute called guardian okay so you need to define that find by guardian this g should be capital right and for which particular attribute in that guardian as well in the guardian i need the data based on the name so i'll just define name simple right and i'll just say string guardian name over here let's test it out this method as well let's go to the test class and let's implement a method public void print student based on guardian name I'll annotate with other test okay and let's implement this I just need list of student student equals to student repository dot find by guardian name and guardian name I'll define as nickel and I'll print this out let's run this you can see that how simple is this right to implement all these particular different methods here you can see that the query is select all the records and at the last you can see that where student dot guardian name equals to this okay so with this particular name that we are defining over here jpa is able to understand what we are saying over here okay and we got both the records that is shabir and shivam as both is having the same guardian over here now if you go to this particular documentation if you go to the spring data jpa learn and go to the reference documentation over here and go to the query methods and here you can see that there is a list available over here okay how you can define your method name currently you saw that we defined few of the methods over here in the student repository okay find by first name find by 
first name containing find by last name not null find by guardian name and here you can see that the list available how you can define your own method name as well so if you want to get the distinct records you can say find distinct by first name last name or whatever you want to give over here and if you want to get the records based on the two values suppose you want to get the data based on your first name and last name so here you can see that and keyword you can use like find by last name and first name so you can define this way like find by first name and last name i want to get the records and in the parameter you can define that way suppose i want student okay find by first name and last name okay and here i need to define two values over here string first name and string last name over here this by y should be small over here okay find by first name and last name and here you can see that if you want to get the records by find by first name or last name you can define that way as well if you want to match the particular values and here you can see that how the sample should be and here you can see that how the jpql snippet is for that so how a jpql query will be represented for that particular thing we will come to that part how to add the jpql queries how to get the data based on jpql queries as well but if you come over here you can see the all the different examples over here and based on this example you can create your different method names okay here you can see that if you are using any values like find by start date between find by age less than all these things you can do over here you can see that we use this particular one right find by not null we define find by last name not null you can use the like operator not like operator okay starting with this ending with this we use this one containing right containing any of the particular one particular characters over here you can use order by last name not last name in not in this it's true false if they, if you have a boolean values you can go with the find by true find by false as well and you can go with the ignore case as well so you can see that if you define ignore case both the both the places when you're matching the values will be used as uppercase so this way you can go through this particular article i will add the link in the description below so you can check that out these are all the different ways that you can create the uh, method as well now the time comes when creating the method name is not enough you have to create the different method name and you have to specify the different query as well right like based on this query i want to get the data so for those particular cases you can use the at the rate query annotation and you can pass the jpql queries as well so let's see how we can do that let me go to the intellij idea and let's create one method over here what i need i want student and i'll just define get get student by email address okay now this is the and i'll define string email id as well okay i want this particular method so here you can see that i have just given the different name over here so you are not confused like uh, with this particular default implementation methods over here i just gave the get student by email address over here now here what i want is as our email id is uniquely identified as we have added the unique identifier for this email id i want that particular student based on the email id that i have provided but i want that data based on the query so i need to pass the query i can give that query using the query annotation and here i can pass the jpql queries okay if you go to this particular document you can see that these are the jpql queries snippets over here okay select distinct and all those things and if you come over here what i can do select you can define select as from student s so the jpql queries are defined in a separate way rather than the native sql queries but this is a very simple over here okay so the jpql queries are defined based on the classes that you have defined not based on the table names and the table attributes table column names this will be defined based on your class that you created and the attributes that you are using in your class so you can see that i am not going with the tbl underscore student i am going with the select as from the student class that i have created and i want the student where s dot whatever the attribute name in here you can see that my attribute name is email id okay so i'll define s dot email id equals to dollar one that is the first parameter 
So I'll just define here as this is the JPQ value as well. So yeah, you can see that we just defined a simple query over here that is a JPQL query. JPQL queries are based on the classes that you have created, not based on the tables in the database. Okay. So that's the one thing that you have to take it in the mind. So student is the class that we have created. Email ID is the attribute property in my student class, not the email underscore address that has been defined over here. Okay. Here is email underscore address, but we are using this particular thing over here. And this should be small email, right? Now let's create a test method to get the data. I'll use this name only public void print get student by email address. Okay. And I'll annotate with at the test over here. What I'll do, student. Student equals to student repository dot get student by email address and here I'll define the email address. I just say shabir at gmail dot com. Okay, and I'll print this student over here. Simple thing that I've defined over here. Okay, nothing complex. So let's run this. So yeah, you can see that the query is executed, select student, all the particular values and at the end you can see that email address equals to whatever the email address was passed and here you can see that only one record has been fetched over here. Now suppose if you want to have only one value, suppose let me copy this thing, okay and I'll just say get student, I'll just say first name. Okay, so I just need the first name by the email address that I'm providing over here. So here I'll define as dot first name that I just need first name. So I'll go to the student and just copy this from here. And I just need as dot first name from the student as whereas where as dot email ID equals to parameter one that is email ID that I'm providing over here. And I don't want as a student, this is the string over here because I'm just getting the one value over here. So let's go ahead and test this as well. Public void print this. I annotate with other test. This is string, right? So I can directly use string first name equals to student repository dot get student first name by email address and I'll just define this email address that is shivam at gmail.com okay and I'll just print this very simple thing over here let me run this and here you can see that the query was executed select only first name as the first column from this particular table where email ID was which whatever was provided over here and only one particular value was printed. Okay, so you can mix and match this way and whatever the way you want to define the particular queries and the way you want to get the data back you can define in the particular method this way. Now you can see that we have defined a lot of methods over here right in this particular repository. Now let's take to the another level. Now you have a very complex objects and you have a very complex query that you are not able to define from the JPQL as well. So Spring Data JP also gives a support for the native queries as well. So you have a native SQL query that you can define using the address query and you can define that this is a native query and you want the data based on that. So that also we can define. So let's go ahead and see how we can define that. Let's create one more method. Let's take the same example. Okay. Let's take the same get student by email address example, but instead of JPQL query, I'll pass the native SQL query. So I just need student from here, this particular method, but I'll just define this is a native one. Okay. And I'll pass a string email ID over here. And at the right query, I'll define. Okay, and the 
value of the query what is the query that i'll be defining over here and then i'll define that this is the native query cool right let me define the query now so the query should be select star from tbl underscore student okay if you go to the database let's let's copy paste this query okay directly i don't want this one schema name i'll define s where s email underscore address equals to question mark one now you can see that with the other query notation we provided the value over here and that value is select star from tbl student where s dot email address equals to question mark one that is the first parameter and we and we have also defined that this particular other query whatever the value that we are passing that is a native query so that is a native sql query now let's go ahead and test it out so let me just copy paste this i'll go to the test and create one more method public void print this I annotate with other test over here and i'll say student student equals to student repository dot get student by email address native okay and i'll pass the email id over here let's print this and let's run this And here you can see that we are getting the data over here and the query is executed whatever the query that we have defined over here okay so if the new query is not generated based on the method name that we are giving or the based on the jpql query that we are passing over here this is the same query that we have defined and the same query is directly executed based on the native query equals to true flag we have defined and we are getting the data as well so whenever you have a very complex queries to work with you can go ahead with this particular implementation to work with the complex queries as well pretty neat right okay so i'll just define this is a native query now suppose if you have a multiple parameters that you're passing over here passing with question mark one question mark two is not always the better approach so what you can do is you can go with the named parameter values okay so you'll be defining a particular naming parameter that particular name parameter that you are you will be defining in your input parameters as well so let's go ahead and see how we can do that as well so let me go ahead and create the same thing over here okay i'll just copy paste the same thing instead of native i'll define native named param so i'm defining the named parameter over here and instead of question mark one over here i'll define colon email id so this is much more readable right and here i need to define that that at the right parameter that parameter is email id so here you can see that i'll just define native name param so it's more understandable for you when i am sharing the code with you okay so this particular query that i have defined over here that query equals to whatever the query i have defined and i have passed the named parameter values and this is the particular method i have defined and inside this particular input parameter i have defined that this particular input parameter defines the colon email id parameter over here and if you have multiple you can add the multiple values over here and you can pass at the red param for all those particular multiple values that you have now let's go ahead and run this as well okay i know this would be a little bit boring for you guys but i'm trying my best to make it more understandable for you okay so i'm just let me copy paste all these details okay and the method is native named query named param okay so yeah you can see that this is the named parameter method that i'm calling let's run this out and you can see that we are getting the record this is the same way cool right Now the next one is really awesome. Currently you see that whatever the methods that we have defined over here, all those particular methods are 
to fetch the data. All this particular, as you can see, all the native queries, all the JPQL queries, everything that we have defined are all fetching the data. What if you want to update the data or delete the data? Okay, that also should be possible. So that is possible using the modifying annotation. So let's see that as well. So let me go to the student repository. Okay, and currently you saw that whatever the queries and everything that we have defined, everything is fetching the data. Now let's create one of the method that will update the records. Now the method that I'm defining over here is to update the first name of a student based on the email ID that we have. So, so I'll just define integer update student name by email ID. Okay, this is the name of the method and here I'll be passing string first name that I want to update and string email ID for which particular email ID I want to update the first name. Now as always we can define using the query annotation. This will have the value what is, what is the query and I'll also define this is the native query as well. So the query would be update table name that is tbl underscore student set first underscore name equals to question mark one where email underscore address equals to question mark two. So this is a simple update query that I have defined over here. Now to make this method to modify the values in our database, we need to annotate it with at the rate modifying. Now as this is a modifying query, as it is modifying the data, there has to be a transaction for it. Okay. So all the particular methods that we want to make it transactionable. So a transaction is created. Some of the operation has been performed on it and that particular transaction has been committed back to the database that all the things we can do using at the rate transactional annotation with one simple annotation a transaction will be created all the operations like insert update delete whatever that we want to do we can do all those things and at the end after that particular operation has been performed when that particular method has been completed that particular transaction will be committed to the database ideally all this particular other transaction will be adding at the service layer when we create a service layer and we can call the multiple repository layers from that service level to make it entire flow as a transactional suppose if you want to insert three records inside a three different table you will annotate your service layers method at, with at the transactional you will call the three methods of the repository layer and once everything is completed successfully, then only at the end your transaction will be committed. Otherwise your transaction will be rolled back if there is any error in it. So that's how ideally a transaction will be implemented. But for now we are adding in the repository layer because we are more focused on the JPA for now. This is the transactional annotation that we are using over here that you can use at your service layer wherever you want to create a transaction. You can create a transaction as, as a method level and a class level as well. Now let's go ahead and test this particular thing. Okay. So what we'll be doing over here is we will be giving the first name and email ID over here to update the record. So let's go to the test class over here. Let's create one test. We'll copy paste this particular thing public void I'll annotate this particular method with other test over here and I need to call student repository dot update student name by email id. And we need to pass first name and email id. Suppose I want to update this particular record that is shabir at gmail.com. So I'll just pass this information that for this email id, I want to update the record and my first name should be suppose I'll just say Shabir Daudi. Okay. Just for the sake of simplicity, I'm just adding this detail over here. Okay. Now let's run this. And here you can see that update query was executed. Update this table set first name equals to whatever the value where email address equals to this particular email address that we have passed over here. And if we execute the query again, yeah, you can see that my first name has been updated with the new values that we have defined over here. So we just saw that we have defined two annotations that is at the rate transactional to define a particular transaction for this particular method and also at the rate modifying annotation whenever you want to execute any queries that has been 
modifying the record in your database. The same will be applicable when you want to delete the records as well. So yeah, you can see that we saw a lot of things about the repository, different repository methods, how to create a different methods, how to use the queries, how to use the native queries and how to modify the queries, how to modify the records using the modifying annotations as well. Now we will see the different relationships available in the GPU. Now firstly we will check one to one relationship in GPA. Now with this particular class diagram you can see that we have two classes that is a course class and a course material and for this particular two classes that is course and course material there is a one to one relationship because for one course there will be a one course material and for a course material will be only available for a particular course over here. So this is a one to one relationship and for this particular thing how a table will be created is like you can see that for a course that contains a course ID, a course title and a course credit and the other course material is having a course material ID and the URL to it. So what will happen is either of the table will contain a foreign key of the other particular table that we have. So a course ID is a primary key for the course table. So that particular course ID will be behaving as a foreign key for a course material table over here. So let's create these two classes course and course material over here and let's see how we can define one to one relationship. So let me go to the IntelliJ idea and with this particular entity package, let's create course entity and a course material entity over here. So I'll just create a new class that says course over here. And I'll create one more entity that says course material over here. Okay, let's go to the course and let's define this as an entity and we'll annotate with either it data for Lumbok, either it all args constructor, either it no args constructor, and either it builder. Just the standard stuff. Okay, let's do the same for the course material as well. Either it entity. Add the red data, add the red all arcs constructor, add the red no arcs constructor, add the red builder pattern. Now let's create the attributes over here. So here I'll define private long course ID, private string course title, private integer credit over here so these things are defined over here now let's define the course material id and url in our course material class so let's go to the course material i'll say private long course material id private string url for the course okay just a simple thing over here now this course material id and the course id in the course class both have the primary key so we need to define the primary key for it and we need to define the sequence generator and the generated values how the values are generated so let's do that i'll annotate with the rate id over here and for this course id let's define sequence generator and the name of the sequence generator I'll define sequence name we will define and the allocation size I'll define over here so I'll just say course sequence and the sequence name is course sequence okay and how the values are generated so at the rate generated value the strategy would be generation type dot sequence and the generator would be course sequence over here. Let's define the same thing in course material. Add the rate ID. Add the rate sequence generator. Well, I'll define the name of the sequence gen generator and the name of the sequence as well. And I'll also define the allocation size that is one. And I define course material sequence okay and generated value i'll define this strategy equals to generation type dot sequence 
एंड जनरेटर इक्वल्स टू कोर्स मटेरियल सीक्वेंस हो गया नाउ वी नीड टू डिफाइन दी मैपिंग हो गया नाउ बिटवीन कोर्स एंड कोर्स मटेरियल द मैपिंग दैट वी कैन डिफाइन इज कोर्स मटेरियल विल कंजिस्ट ऑफ अ कोर्स ओके कोर्स मटेरियल कैन नॉट एग्जिस्ट इट्स इट हैज टू हैव अ कोर्स सो दैट वी कैन एड दी कोर्स मटेरियल टू इट सो फॉर दैट इन द कोर्स मटेरियल विल डिफाइन प्राइवेट कोर्स कोर्स हो गया ओके एंड फॉर दिस पर्टिकुलर थिंग विल डिफाइन वन टू वन मैपिंग now this we have defined that this is a one to one mapping now we need to define for which particular column that a foreign key will be applied okay so for that we need to define join column over here for which particular column that we can join these two particular tables so here i can define name of the column and i can define the reference column name so which particular column it it is referencing to so inside this course it is referencing to course id over here and what is the name of the column that would be course id okay simple we just define what will be the join column in the referenced column name we define which particular column this is referencing to so in this course it is referencing to this course id this particular attribute and what would be the name of that column we have defined that the name of the column should be course id so in this particular course material table that we are going to create this particular course material table will have an extra column that will be course underscore id so that will refer which particular course this belongs to now all the standard stuff that we saw earlier all the things applied here as well that we can define at the red column we can define at the red table we can define the unique keys we can define different constants over here everything we can do over here also but we have a limited time so i'm considering that you can do all those things by yourself by referencing to what we did in the student class everything you can do here as well so let's go ahead and let's start our application and let's see what are the different tables is created so i'll just run the application and once the application is successfully started you can see that there are the different queries created you can see that table course is created okay course material sequence is created course material sequence value has been inserted course material table is created and the course table has been altered adding the foreign key over here and if you go to the database over here and if you refresh the database now you can see that course table has been created course material table has been created and the two sequence tables are created and if you open the tables over here let me open the course table and here you can see that in the course there are three columns over here that is course id the name of the title of the course and the credit available and if you go to the course material you can see that course material id the url of the course material and the course id which this particular course material belongs to so this way we have added the primary key and foreign key relationship between the two tables so here for every course there will be one course material that is a one to one relationship now let's create the repositories for our course and course material over here okay so let me go to the repository and let's create the interface over here and i'll say this is course repository okay and this extends jpa repository and this is of course and long is the id over here and i'll annotate with at the red repository and i'll create one more that is course material repository and i'll extends jpa repository with the course material and long and this is at the red repository okay we just created two repositories course repository and course material repository now what we will do is we will test this particular thing out so we will create a test class for this course material repository over here and we will try to save a course material with the one course over here okay so let's generate the test class over here this is a particular test class that we generated let's annotate with spring boot 
test over here and for this particular course material repository what we need is private course material repository and I will auto wire it so this is the particular repository object that we want to create the different methods so let's create one method to save the course material with the course so I'll just say public void save course material okay and I'll annotate this with the other test over here now let's create the course material equals to course material dot builder dot url so what's the url i'll just say www.google.com dot course and here we need to pass the course object over here dot build so let's define the course object as well course equals to course dot builder dot course title equals to let's say data structures and algorithm dot credit I'll say there's a six credit for this particular course dot build and I will pass this course to my course over here now let's save this course material so I'll just say repository dot save course over here sorry course material over here okay simple thing right we created the object of a course material over here and this course material has to have a course for which particular course that we want to save the data so we define that as well over here and we are trying to save that particular course material over here so now let's run this and let's see what is happening over here okay so let me run this blah 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 and it failed okay let's see why it failed over here and here you can see that the error is invalid data access api usage exception transient property value exception okay object references and unsaved transient ins instance okay object references and unsaved transient instance over here for what course over here okay what we are doing over here is we are trying to save the course material without saving the course over here because what is happening over here is we are trying to save the course material and for this particular course material we have to have a course that is already saved in the database but it's not we have not created any of the course over here what we are trying to do is when we save the course material and we also pass the course and if that course is not available we need to create that course as well to make this thing happen currently you can see that it's not happening but to make this thing happen cascading comes into future once we implement the cascading cascading means what cascading means to pass the properties or to pass the permissions to your child elements from the parent to child Current, currently you can see that i want to save the course material and i want to persist it and we have a course that is not persisted so we will cascade the information we have different cascading types so we are passing that information okay i am trying to persist this this particular course object is not available okay no problem try to persist that as well so there are different cascading types available okay that's an enum available so we can define that and accordingly what we define this particular operation will happen so let's go and define that so we'll go to the course material and in one-to-one -one mapping over here we'll define cascade equals to cascade type dot you can see that there are different options available that is cascade type dot all detach merge persist refresh remove whatever so whatever you define the operation will happen accordingly for the simplicity i'll define cascade type dot all so whatever the operations are there everything will happen over here currently you see that in the course and course material there is no data there is no course material and there is no course as well if you go back to our IntelliJ idea if you go to the test class earlier it failed now let's run it again And now here you can see that this is successful and if you go down you can see that how many queries happened you can see that first the course was inserted okay after that course material was inserted over here and if you go to the database and if we 
run the query you can see that the course is created with course id 1 credit 6 title is dsa and if you come to the course material this course id should be used over here you can see that course id 1 the url is this and the course material id is 2 so with this particular cascading type information we were able to do this now once we go back to the course material over here okay there is a different thing available that is called fetch type how we want to fetch the data there are two types of option available that is eager fetching and lazy fetching so what's the difference between that the difference is so if you are having a relationship between the two tables so once you call the data of a parent so suppose currently when you call the data of a course material do you need to fetch the course also with that or you just need the course material only so based on the application that you have you can define the fetch type so when you define the fetch type as eager it will bring the course data as well when you try to bring the course material but when you define fetch type as lazy it will not bring the data of a course until and unless you specifically ask to bring the course okay so in this particular one to one relationship there is a fetch option available so with this particular fetch you can define either is a fetch type eager or fetch type lazy so i'll just define fetch type lazy over here now let's go back to the test and let's add the method to print the course materials so i'll just say public void print all courses I'll annotate with other test over here and I'll say list of courses sorry I'll say list of course materials okay course materials and I'll say course materials over here equals to repository dot find all okay and I'll just print it okay simple method so let's run this okay you can see that it is throwing the error that could not initialize the proxy for the course so what i'll do over here is there's a two string method that is calling the course over here so i will remove it for now so i'll just define at the rate two string and i'll exclude course over here let's run this again now as we have defined the fetch type is lazy you can see that we are getting only course material over here we have excluded we have excluded the course as well from the two string method so it won't call that particular get course method over here so ideally as per the requirement that you have you can define that what should be your fetch type either it would be eager or lazy over here now you can see that we define the find all method for the course material course material over here now let's go to the course and let's get the courses available over here so let me go to the course repository over here and let's create the test class for this as well i'll implement i'll add the spring boot test over here and i need to add the course repository as well so i'll just add private course repository and I'll auto wire it and I'll have a method public void print courses and I'll annotate it with other test over here I'll have list of courses equals to course repository dot find all okay and I'm printing the courses available so let's run this now here you can see that you are getting the list of courses available okay what is the course available now ideally when you're getting the courses you want the course material as well so ideally when you are getting the courses you want the course material as well because then only you'll be identify what's the material for that particular course right there is no point of getting two details separately but how to get the course material from this particular course repository because you have created the course material repository okay and you are when you are working with the course material object 
you are getting the course material with the courses as well but when you are working with the courses you are not getting the course material why why because you have defined only unidirectional one to one mapping over here we don't have any course material references in our course so you can see that in the course material you have a reference to courses but if you go to the courses you don't have any reference to course material because we have only defined unidirectional one to one mapping now let's see how we can define the bidirectional one to one mapping over here so for this particular courses you need the reference to the course material but you already defined one to one mapping over here so what we can do is we can come to our courses entity over here and here we can define private course material course material over here and in here you can define this is one to one mapping over here but here you cannot define the joining columns right because you already defined in the course material so here you need to say this is mapped by some other class right so you can tell this is mapped by what this is mapped by this particular course in this course material class over here so what you are defining over here is you need a reference of course material in your courses to define one to one bidirectional mapping but that one to one mapping to join a column for a foreign key is already defined in the course material so you are telling that this particular one to one mapping is already defined by the courses attribute in course material class over here so in this course material class there is a courses attribute that has already defined one to one mapping over here cool right now let's test it again now if you go back to the test over here and already earlier you can see that we only got the course over here now if we run it again we should get the course with course material so here you can see that the test case is passed over here and if we go down over here you can see that we got the course also we got the course material as well right so we defined bidirectional one to one mapping so we define the reference of course material in the courses as well so this is how you define unidirectional or bidirectional relationships in any of the relationship types either it is one to one one to many many to one or many to many relationship so i just showed you in one to one the same concept and the same implementation goes in all the other three as well now let's see one to many relationship now if you come to this particular architecture that we have defined over here we just saw course and course material that is having one to one relationship now if you come over here teacher and courses over here that is having one to many relationship one teacher can teach multiple courses over here so that is a one to many relationships and the reverse would be many courses can be taught by one teacher so that would be many to one relationship so let's go ahead and first see one to many relationship and then we will see many to one relationship so let me go back to the intellij idea we already have course and course material classes created let's go ahead and create the teacher class as well so a teacher has teacher id first name last name so let's go ahead and create that so i'll go to the entity and let's create the java classes teacher and i'll annotate with at the rate entity over here at the rate data over here with all args constructor with no args constructor and build a pattern now this teacher has private long teacher id private string first name private string last name over here these are the three fields available for a particular teacher class you can add multiple but let's add it only three for the simplicity over here this particular teacher id would be our primary key okay and we need to define the sequence generator and generated value as well for here so i'll just define sequence generator the name of the sequence generator i need to define the name of the sequence i need to define and also allocation size i'll define as one i'll just say teacher underscore sequence over here the same value i'll define over here in the sequence name okay the spelling is wrong i'll just correct it out okay and i'll define the generated value as well at the rate generated value 
I'll define the strategy equals to generation type dot sequence and generator I'll define as teacher sequence over here. This is a simple thing that we have defined over here. Now what we can do is this particular teacher and course, this particular teacher and course have a one to many relationship. One teacher can teach multiple courses. So a one teacher can have a list of courses inside a particular class. So I can define this way, right? If I go to this particular teacher class, I can define one attribute as private list of courses. Okay, that this particular teacher have a list of courses which a particular teacher can teach. So I can define this particular is a one to many relationship as we defined the cascade type in the course and course material here also will define the cascade type i'll just simply say cascade type dot all for now simplicity now for this one to many relationship there will be two tables one will be teacher one will be course for every teacher which particular course that particular teacher is teaching that particular relationship will be having so you can consider that course table will be having a extra key foreign key that is a teacher id that particular column will define this course is taught by which particular teacher so we need to define joining column over here so we can define joining column name of the joining column and reference column name so what will be the reference column reference column will be this particular teacher id okay and what would be the name of the column i can say teacher underscore id whatever you want to name the column so this is a simple unidirectional one to many mapping over here okay and we have defined cascade type as all over here i hope this is very clear this is a very simple thing we just define one to many relationship between two particular classes that is teacher and course teacher can have a list of course that a particular teacher can teach okay so we just define that way over here now let's start the application okay and a particular teacher table will be created yeah you can see that my application has started and you can see that teacher table was created okay and the course table was altered and a new foreign key was added to that particular course table over here simple right and if i go back to this particular database and if I refresh my database, you can see that now course table was having only three. Now if I run it again, you can see that new teacher ID has been added over here. And if you see over here, there is a new, there will be new teacher table also created. What's the teacher available? Now let's go ahead and create the teacher repository as well. teacher repository as the interface and that extends jpa repository that is of type teacher and long and i'll annotate with at the rate repository now for all these particular things you can define all the methods different methods that we have already saw in the prior part of this particular video right so for this particular teacher repository let's create the test class and I'll annotate it with at the rate Spring Boot test and I need private teacher repository teacher repository and I'll auto wire it let's create the method to save a teacher okay with the course so I'll just say public void save teacher And I'll annotate with test over here. I'll say teacher teacher equals to teacher dot builder dot build dot first name equals to suppose Kutub is a teacher dot last name say khan and dot what course is this particular teacher is teaching now 
this particular course is it is taking the list of courses okay so let me just create one of the course or you can create one method to add the course to that particular courses list as well okay whatever is feasible you can use that way ideally it should be you create one method that adds the course to that particular list of course for the simplicity i'll just do a cheating over here i'll just create a course course equals to course dot builder dot build i'll just say course title equals to i'll just say dba dot credit is phi and build and i'll just use this course as list dot of courses simple now let's add the teacher repository dot save teacher simple right i just created the teacher object over here this teacher is having a list of courses i just added one course let me add multiple okay i'll just say course dba and i'll add one more course i'll just say java this teaching java credit is 6 course dba course java two courses this particular teacher is teaching two courses so i just define this way now let's run this so here you can see that it is successful you can see that one teacher was inserted after that two courses were inserted okay and those particular two courses were updated by the teacher id that we have inserted so let's go and see this you can see that one teacher was created that is Kutub Khan teacher id is one and if you go to the courses over here okay and if i run this you can see that this particular two course dba and java is created and it is taught by teacher id one teacher is one over here and if you see this particular two courses two and three for this particular two courses there are no course materials over here okay so now this is something that we can take care of right because Ideally, what we can do is when you define a course, you should save a course material with it, right? Without a course material, you should not be allowed to save a particular course over here. But currently, you can see that we were allowed, right? We were able to save this particular thing. So how to do that? So that is optionality. Optionality means it defines that whatever the relationship is that it's an optional relationship or a mandatory relationship. So it defines currently you can see that by default, everything is optional. Okay. There is nothing that that is telling us that this is mandatory. Currently, when we save the course without adding the course material as well, we were able to save it. So let's see that. So if you go back to our course and course material over here, so if you go back to the course and course material, here with this particular one to one relationship, I can define optional equals to false by default is always true. So now I have defined over here that whenever you are trying to save a course, course material is required. It's not optional over here. So let's go back to the course material repository test. And let's try to save the course over here and we already have one save course material let's use the same thing over here okay what i'll do i will not define the course over here okay and i'll just change the material as let's say daily code buffer okay and let me save this let me try to save this And here you can see that we got the error over here. And here you can see that what it is asking here is data integrity violation exception, non-null property reference and null or transient value over here for this particular course. So that means this is forcing us to add the course over here. Okay. So now if I, let me just change the name over here. Okay. I'll just say dot net. Okay. Now if I add this particular course back, okay for this particular course material then only it will run now see you can see that it is successful right you can see it was updated now if i go back to the mysql and go to the course you can see that new course was added dot net okay and if you go to the course material 
course material was added for it so this way you can define the optionality for your entities that you have created which of the particulars entities or which of the particular objects and classes are optional or not now let's go back to the one to many relationship here for this particular teacher repository teacher class we have defined that teacher contains a list of courses available that's a one to many relationship now what will be many to one relationship many to one relationship would be there are many courses available and those particular courses are been taught by any one of a teacher so rather than defining this way like this particular class this particular teacher have a list of course we can define a particular teacher who is teaching a particular course that we define that is more readable more understandable and that's a guidance provided by a specification of jpa that you should always go for many to one relationship whenever possible so what i'll do i'll just comment it out for now over here okay i'll just keep this in the code as well so you can refer it out so what i will do rather than defining this way i will go to the course over here and for this particular course i will define that this particular course is taught by whom so i'll just say private teacher teacher and this is many to one relationship okay we just reverse it one to many this is many to one now here also we have to define the join columns over here we can define the name of the join column and also define the reference column name over here the reference column name would be inside the teacher this will be teacher id okay that would be reference and we'll define with same teacher id now with this particular chain there won't be any change in your database everything will remain the same this is how you represent all your tables in your objects there's a representation change over here but the structure will remain the same and this is still many to one unidirectional relationship now when we are trying to now here as well in many to one relationship whatever you define in over here you can define cascade type all over here so whenever you are saving a new course with a new teacher and a new course material all the things will be saved or all the things will be deleted whatever is preferable okay now let's let's create a course with all the particular values okay so we'll go to the course repository test over here i'll say public void save course with teacher object okay i'll annotate with at the rate test over here and what i'll define over here is course object course equals to course dot builder dot what's the title of the course i will just say python dot credit is 6 and dot you can define the course material as well let's define the teacher and for this particular teacher what i can do i can create the teacher object teacher equals to teacher dot builder dot build dot first name i'll just say priyanka dot last name sing dot build okay this is the teacher now this particular teacher i'll pass to this particular course that this particular python course is taught by priyanka singh and now i can directly say course repository dot save save this course over here here you can see that i am just doing the save over here it applies to update delete get all data get a particular data for everything this applies okay i am just giving you a very simple implementation over here so you can understand now let's run this so what what should happen over here is a new teacher should be created a new course should be created and for that a foreign key of a teacher should be assigned to a course so let's run this and here you can see that there is an error over here that's fine i'll just comment it out over here for now okay because we just removed the reference of the courses over here so let's do this save courses with teacher again yeah you can see that the course is created 
and a teacher is created okay so let's go back let's go to the teacher table and here you can see that new teacher is created that is Priyanka Singh with teacher id 2 and if you go to the courses and if you run the query you can see that new course python is created and taught by teacher id 2 over here simple thing one to many and many to one relationship now let's see how to implement paging and shorting using JP repositories. Now, as you are already aware that for every repositories, we have implemented the JPA repository and this JPA repository again extends the paging and sorting repository. If you go to this paging and sorting repository, you can see that either you can implement the find all method or find all method based on the sorting or based on the pagination. You can implement the pagination and it will return the page object with the particular uh, data type that you are passing particular uh, type of object and that will take the page as the input parameter where you will define the different page number and how many records that you want for that particular page and for the sorting as well that you can define what kind of sorting that you need to implement for fetching the data so let's go ahead and see how to use this particular default methods and how we can implement the custom method as well so let me just close this and for this particular course repository let's go to the test over here and let's call this particular method okay so let me just create a new method over here okay i'll just say public void find all pagination and i'll just do a test over here and here i'll define the pageable objects and i'll just say pageable first page with three with three records equals to page request dot off method here you can see that this particular method takes the page number the size of the page and the sorting for that particular page so i'll just define the zeroth page that is the first page and i want three records over here so i'll just remove this i'll just remove this as well let me create one more object of pageable I'll say second page with two records equals to page request dot off. I'll say second page that is first and I want two records. I just created this particular object over here. Now I need the list of courses available for this. So I'll just say list of courses available equals to course repository dot find all and inside this find all I'll just pass first page with three records and dot get content so this is a simple method that I am using find all where I'm passing the pageable object that you saw over here okay you can see that it is taking the pageable object over here as an input parameter from the paging and sorting repository Okay, so I'm just using that particular inbuilt method over here where I will just define the two pageable first page with three records, second page with two records over here. First page that is zeroth page, three records that I have defined three over here. And this particular object will return the page of courses. From that particular page of courses, I have used dot get content method to get all the contents of that particular page. Now there are more details also available. We can get the different things such as total pages and uh, total elements as well. So let's do that as well what i'll do i can define long total elements equals to dot here you can see that there are a lot of different methods available dot get total elements you can uh, convert to stream as well okay you can get the contents you can get the number of elements you can get the total pages okay all those things you can do over here so let me just get the total elements over here for now then i can have total pages as well okay i can say long total pages equals to course repository dot find all first page with three records dot get total pages okay and I can 
define this particular total pages as well. And if you go to the database, currently I have five records available. Now let's run this. You can see that there are a lot of queries available. Okay. This all the queries were executed and you can see that there were a total of two pages and the total elements are five. Why there are two pages? Because I've defined that my page should be of three records. Every page should be of three records. Okay. So that's why I divided into two pages and I want the first page. So first page should contain three records. So here you can see that first course, second course, and this is the last third course available. So three courses are defined over here. Now if I pass the second value, second page with two records everywhere and if I run it again, I should be getting three pages because each and every page should be of two records. Okay. Here you can see that I'm getting total pages as three. My total elements are five and I, as I need to have the second page, I will be getting the two records of the second page over here. Okay. So this way you can implement the by default find all function using this particular pagination as well. Okay. Now let's implement pagination with sorting. I'll just create one more method public void find all with sorting. So this is a test over here. Suppose I want to sort the data based on the title. Okay. So what I can do is I can use pageable sort by title over here. Page request dot off. I can say zero page with two records and sort dot by I can say title okay simple simple page request just like over here whatever defined over here but here I just added the sorting as well I can also do pageable sort by credit descending order as well I can do page request dot off first page with two elements dot sort dot by credit dot descending. So this will sort the records by credit in the descending order. I can also define pageable sort by title and credit descending order. Okay. For this I can do page request dot off can do first page with two records where I can define sort dot by title in descending order dot end again do sort by credit simple right and now I can pass everything over here I can do list of courses over here equals to course repository dot find all and inside this find all I can pass anything I'll just say pass sort by title over here dot get content and let's print it out okay and we can run this so here I just gave you the different uh, ideas like how we can use this particular different sorting multiple sorting descending order ascending order okay and we can pass that particular page request to our find all method and we can get the data over here. So let's run this. And here you can see that we are getting the data over here. Now we can create the custom method as well for the sorting. Okay. So what we can do over here, we can go to the course repository. Okay. Let's create the method over here. What we can do? List of courses over here. Okay. And for this particular list of courses, what I need find by title, find by title containing, find by title con containing over here. And here we need to pass the 
string title over here and page request so this will convert all your data to the list but here you need a page over here okay that you should be getting the page so whatever the page request that you pass over here you will be getting the data as a page object over here so let's check this as well so we will just call this okay we'll create a new method public void print find by title containing and i'll just use test over here here i'll just say pageable again first page 10 records okay equals to page request dot off first page and 10 records over here now what i need i need a list of students sorry list of courses equals to course repository dot find by title containing i'll say containing d and first page 10 records over here and here i'll say dot get content okay i did one mistake over here this should be pageable okay okay right now let's go back over here and here you can see that the error is resolved now let's print it out okay i'm printing the list of courses available with the first 10 records of the first page and we are just getting the title who's containing capital D so if I go over here how many capital D how many records you should get is DSA and DBA over here so let's go back and run this over here and here you can see that we got the records okay we got DSA and we got DBA nothing else okay so my method is working perfectly fine so this way you can go ahead and implement paging and sorting using jpi repositories now let's implement many to many relationship so with this particular image we implemented course and course material that is one to one relationship teacher and course that is many to one and one to many relationship the last one is student and course the student and course have many to many relationship many student can opt for many courses available over here so we already have a student class and a course class over here now we have to implement the many to many relationship how many to many relationship works is we already have a student class we already have a course class over here okay two classes are already created now when you implement a many to many relationship there has to be a third new table added to it that represents the mapping between the two tables that is a student and course you have a student you have a course and there will be a third table that represents this particular student id to this particular course id so multiple student can have multiple course id so that particular table will hold the relationship between the two entities that we have okay so there is a third table new table will be introduced for many to many relationship in the earlier in one to one and one to many or many to one relationship there are only two tables associated always and a foreign key was assigned but here third table will be introduced over here so let's go ahead and implement that we'll go to the IntelliJ idea and we go to the courses over here this particular course is here we need to add the many to many relationship we already added one to one one many to one relationship here we need to add the other relationship many to many for the students that we have as a particular course can be opted by multiple students so we need to have a list of students available over here right so i'll just define private list of student students available over here now for this particular we need to define many to many mapping over here now as for this particular many to many relationship as i told that there has to be new table created we need to use the joint table annotation over here you can see earlier we used to just use join column annotation here we will use join table so i'll just use join table annotation over here and in this particular join table annotation we need to define what will be the join table what will be the new table and which two particular column that we are going to refer over here so let's add those information 
so here i'll just define what will be the name of a table so i'll just say student course mapping over here and here i'll define what will the join column equals to at the rate join column over here and for this i need to define what will the name and what would be the reference column name over here so what i need i need to refer to what for this particular student i need to refer to the course id okay so whatever the course id is available over here that would be the reference column and what would be the name of the column that i want to define that is course underscore id okay this would be your database what you want to define and this would be your class property that you have already defined over here now this is the joining column that you have defined for your student that is your student will be having the courses now you need to define the inverse join column as well that for your courses what should be for the student so i'll just define inverse join column equals to add the red join column what would be the name what would be the reference column name and this would be for your students so if you go to the students this student id would be your reference column name over here and your table name your column name should be student id okay so what we defined over here that for this particular course and for this particular students that we have we are creating a new table that is called a student underscore course underscore map that will have two columns that is course id and the other is student id this course id will refer to the course id of this particular class and inverse column join okay that is whatever i need to define for this student over here okay so whatever you defined over here the list available for many to many mapping that would be for your inverse join columns okay so i need my column name is a student underscore id and it refers to the student id of this particular class that i have defined over here it's really simple to understand just it looks complicated okay it's really simple you just define the new table that contains the mapping between the two already created table for many to many mapping that is a student and a course you have and as multiple students can opt for multiple courses you need to normalize those tables to remove the redundancy and for that you created a new table that new table contains the mapping between your course and a student simple so this is the definition that we have provided for many to many mapping that's it as is a list of students i already told you earlier as well when you are working with a list you can create one more method to add the letter to that particular list so let me just create a method i'll just say public add students okay this will take student object and if students equal to equal to null students equals to new array list okay else directly i can say students dot add student now let's go ahead and test this particular thing out okay let me start the particular application okay and here you can see that if you see create table student course map is created where we have two different ids that is a course id and a student id two columns available and it refers to the two different foreign keys that is a student course map refers to the foreign key of a student id and a course id over here and if you go to the database and if you refresh it over here you can see that student course map is created over here so let's try this out so in the course repository test over here course repository test over here let's implement one method okay public save what we'll try to do is we will try to save a course with a student available okay save course with student and teacher public void at the rate test course course equals to course dot builder dot build 
dot course title for the course title i'll just say ai dot credit what would be the credit i'll just say 12 okay dot i need to add the teacher as well so suppose i already have a teacher or let's create a new teacher as well so i'll just say teacher equals to teacher dot builder dot build teacher first name lizzie dot last name morgan this is the teacher now let's add the students as well okay here I can add the students okay so what I can do let's create a student as well student student equals to student dot builder dot build dot first name Abhishek last name sing dot email Abhishek at gmail.com do i need to add guardian if i don't add that's fine i don't want to add it now this is the student i can add multiple student as well but let's add one student only okay so i just added the student as well so i just created my entire course object let's do course repository dot save course as well so we just created teacher student and we just added all the details in our course as well so let's run this out let's see what's happening over here okay and there is an error that's good you can see that invalid data access api uses exception right because you can see that transient object exception is there why because we added the student over here and we have not defined the cascading type okay so let's go back to the course over here and for this particular students in many to many mapping we can define the cascade type as cascade type dot all for now now let's go back and let's run this again yeah you can see that it is successful okay and if you come over here you can see that there is an insert into teacher insert into course insert into student as well and insert into course student map as well okay so let's go and check our records as well so we added the new course right so this is a new course that is ai okay this ai has been taught by who teacher id 4 so if you go to the teachers and teacher id 4 is lizzie morgan that is id 4 now which particular student right if you go to the student as well a new student was added that is abhishek okay now if you go to the student course map over here here there will be mapping which particular course is been added by which particular student which particular student is taking that particular course student id 3 that is abhishek is taking the course 7 over here okay so there will be a multiple mappings this way this will be a many to many mapping handled by the third table that is a joining table over here so this is a many to many relationship in jpa so yeah you can see that we have covered a lot of things over here we covered all the relationships like one to one one to many many to one and many to many relationships we did paging and shorting as well how to get the data in the pagination form and in the sorted form as well we also implemented the native queries and jpl queries as well and we also implemented the named parameters we also went ahead and saw how to do transactional and how to do the modifiable queries as well using the jpa repositories so this there is a lot of things that we have covered and if you have any questions related to any of the topic that we have covered then do let me know in the comment section below i will try to resolve your issues as soon as possible now as you have gone through everything over here you will be able to create all the particular different operations and handle everything using this particular jpa itself now there is an advanced thing also available using the default entity manager as well that you can go through the documentation and you can create the entity manager object and you can also do the custom method implementation as well here you can see that we did everything using the interface but you want to do the implementation custom implementation for all those particular methods that also you can go ahead and do that but ideally if you are using jpa this is my preferred 
choice as well because this will reduce a lot of coding efforts and a standard implementation is given by, given by JPS. So all the particular implementation what has been done that's a standard format it's well implemented and we just have to use those particular methods. So we'll be getting a really good performance as well over here. So security is a very important part of the application that we develop. So whatever the user is using your application, that user has to be authenticated and authorized to use your application. So it's a very key feature of your application. So in this video, we are going to learn about the Spring Security, how we can allow the user to register to your system with an entire complete flow and how to let your user to log into your system using Spring Security auth2 and open id so in this video what we are going to do today is we are going to create a complete registration flow with login functionality for a user so we'll start with creating the functionality of registration where user can register to the system using the rest apis we are going to create the rest apis only today and the same thing that you can implement in your ui application as well so we'll create a rest api for a user to register to your system where we will take the first name last name email id password confirm password and all those details and user will try to register to your system and when user register to your system user will get an email to confirm that email to confirm the account that the details that a user has entered are correct or not so that particular thing we are going to mimic it today once the user confirms its email address we will be activating the user we will also add the functionality if the user has forgot the password so we'll create an api where user can reset the password as well at that particular time we what we will do we will confirm its email that whatever the email a user is entering if that email is correct and it's available in our system then we will send an email with the reset token to change the password we will also create the functionality to change the password where a user will enter its email id old password and the new password and we will validate the old password and email id is correct then we will be able to change the password as well and we will also allow the user to log into the system with the registration process the user has completed so whatever the details user has entered in our system with those credentials user will be allowed to enter our system using the auth2 and open id so auth2 and open id are the standards within the industry where everyone is using that you would have seen everywhere like login with gmail login with facebook login with twitter github everywhere right so that kind of implementation we are going to do today with our custom authorization server. So these are all the fundamentals of security and we are going to implement today. Now as we talk that we are going to implement a complete registration process with the login functionality with Spring Boot. Let's go to the IntelliJ idea and let's create a simple Maven project and in that we will be adding our different modules for registration and authorization server and whatever we are going to implement. So let's fire up the IntelliJ idea. Okay, I'll go to the Maven project, click on next. Let me create the folder documents, Java workspace, Spring security tutorial, I'll open it. And this is the project that I'm going to create. Let me add the coordinates, com.daily code, buffers, artifact as Spring security tutorial version as this and finish it. So within this, we are going to add our project as a module. So let's create the first project. Let me go to the browser and here, let me go to the start.spring.io the group id i'll give as com dot daily code buffer and the artifact i'll give is spring security client i hope the spellings are correct client yeah i'll give the package name as client packaging is jar java version is 11 and let's add the dependencies so i'll add the web dependency i'll add the lumbug dependency then I'll add the GPA dependency. Then MySQL driver with Spring Web, Lumbox, Spring Data GPA and MySQL driver. So I think with this, we'll be able to create our application. We will add the Spring security module later in this video. So let's generate the project and add as a module in our IntelliJ idea. So I'm just generating the project over here. I'll go to documents, Java workspace. Okay, now here you can see that the project is showing up. Now, let me add the module over here. Okay, inside modules, I'll add the module Spring Security Client, and I need to change the packaging as POM. 
here you can see that my project is showing up and this is my details the spring version i'm using is 2.6.3 spring data jp is added spring starter web is added my sql connector is added lumbok dependency is added okay all the things are added let's go to the src main resources and let's change the application.properties to application.yaml so i'll do refactor rename to yml and i'll change the property that this should run on server dot port 8080 now let's add the another dependency about the mysql connector and the jpa what i'm doing is i'm just pasting the details over here it's pretty simple okay you can see that spring dot data source dot url i've mentioned over here currently i am using the mysql in my system so i have given the path of the mysql that is jdbc mysql localhost 3306 and i'll give the schema name as well but before that we'll create the schema okay after that i've given the username and password of the uh, my database and the driver class name i've given spring dot jpa dot shows equal to so all the queries will be printed and hibernate ddl auto is update so whenever there is a change in our entities it will be reflected in our database so this is the standard configuration that we have added in our system so now let's go to the mysql and create the schema so i'll just open the mysql workbench let me connect so i'll create the new schema and i'll say it's a user registration okay apply the changes close and here you can see that the user registration schema is created i'll use the same in our intellij idea okay this is my user registration uh, schema now within this particular application we are going to build a complete registration flow first so for that let's create the different packages that we are going to need so we go to the java in the client package we'll create the different packages controller entity service repository and model i'll create one more if any configuration that we have to do we will add that in the config folder so these are the standard packages that i have created now let's start to build our application so firstly we'll create the controller registration controller okay and we'll annotate this with at the rate rest controller annotation okay my controller is ready then let me create the entity as well the entity i'll create as a user entity and we need to annotate with at the rate entity now let's add the different properties as well so i'll just add private long id private string first name private string last name private string email private string password then private string role what is the role of a user okay then i'll just add one more private boolean enabled equals to false by default the user would be not enabled disabled okay so these are the fields that i have added what i'll do i'll just annotate with at the rate id i'll just use generated value strategy equals to generation type dot identity and i'll use the lumbok to add the data setters and everything at the red data annotation okay so my user entity is ready and one more thing i'll add is in the password i'll just add one validation that is column length should not be more than 60 okay so i'll just do length equals to 60 okay so maximum password should be 60 characters as we are going to use the bcrypt password encoder we will be encoding the password in the hash code values 
using the bcrypt encoder and we are going to store that password in our database so no one can see the password so these are the details now let's create the service and repository so first let me create the repository within the repository package i'll just create a java class and i'll say user repository and that will be the interface i'll annotate with other repository and user rep repository will will extends jpa repository this jpa repository is of type user and id is of type long okay now within the service let's create the service interface and the implementation of that particular service as well so let me create the class and i'll say it's a user service and it's an interface and I'll do the implementation for that as well. That is user service implementation. That's a class that will implement user service. Okay. And this will be annotated with service annotation. So my controller is created. My entity is created. Repository is created. And my service interface and the service implementation for that interface is also created so now my all the basic classes are created so now let's go and implement the registration flow before that let's announce the winner of the giveaway of the mx master 3 mouse and the winner of the giveaway is whatever the user popped on the screen so i'll be reaching the user from the comments that they have added in that particular video to get the contact details so i can ship the product to them so congratulations to the winner and thank you so much everyone for participating in the giveaway now if you are feeling that you have missed out on the giveaway so don't worry there will be a lot of giveaways in the future and if this permits there will be a bigger giveaways as well so keep supporting and thank you everyone for participating and congratulations to the winner as well now let's go to the registration controller and create the rest api i'll go to the rest controller over here and here let's create the APIs. Now before adding anything to the registration controller, we need to create a model as well. So let me just first create the model and I'll just say it's a user model. And here I'll add the same properties that I have added in the user entity. I just need these details. I need password as well. And there should be matching password as well right when you are creating the form you will be adding the matching password as well annotate with data no arcs constructor and all arcs constructor okay so my model is ready so let me go to the registration controller and let's create a method public string register user and this will be at the rate post mapping to slash register user i'll just keep it registered that would be better and i'll be taking the request mapping as well so i'll just take request mapping sorry request body and this request body is nothing but your user model now at this point we need the user service object as well because we are going to call the user service and from that particular user service we are going to call the repository so let me just create the object for that private user service and i'll just auto wire it and i need the user object the user is com dot daily code buffer dot client dot entity this one user equals to user service dot i'll just do register user and i'll pass the user model okay i'll create the method create method register user in user service okay i'll go to the implementation and i'll implement the method and in this particular service i'll need the user repository as well so let me just create the object for that as well okay and i'll just use at the rate auto wired now in this particular let me create the user object user user equals to new user and all the fields from the user model i'll set to the user so user dot set email i'll do user model dot set email sorry user model dot get email user dot 
set first name equal to user model dot get first name user dot set last name user model dot get last name user dot set role and I'll just do user role okay for now but later we can create this particular thing as a dynamic as well but currently let's make it simple to understand because we need to understand the security part more and user dot set password as user model dot get password now one thing to note over here is whatever the user dot set password that we are doing over here that is the plain simple password that we are getting from the user but when we set to our database we need to convert that to the encrypted password so we need to use the password encoder to encrypt the password before saving to the database so let's do that first now for this particular password we need to create a config so let me just create a new java class and i'll just say web security config and for now i'll just annotate with at the rate configuration and i need the password encoder so what i'll do i'll just say password encoder so to use that particular password encoder we can see that we are not getting the class so we need to add the spring security to our project so let's go ahead and add the spring security so let's go to the pom.xml file let me go to the browser within the same project let me add the security okay and if i go to the explore i can take this spring boot starter security okay so let me add the dependency and for the testing purpose you can add this as well so let me add that dependency as well so if you want to add the test cases for this you can add this cool right so now let's get back to the web security config and here rather than using the configuration i can directly use enable web security okay let me remove the imports and here i can use now password encoder so i'm not getting the class over here so let me restart the may one so i can get it so what i'll do i'll just revalidate the cache so sometimes this kind of issue will happen so you need to invalidate the cache and restart the intellij idea so now you can see that i'm getting right so i'll just use it and use password encoder and i'll just do return new bcrypt password encoder and i'll just use the strength as 11 and i'll define this as a bean so i can auto wire it so if i go to my user service impl here i can use it i can use private password encoder and i can auto wire it okay and now when we are saving the password over here before that we'll just use password encoder dot encode so this password will be encoded over here and then once everything is set user repository dot save user and we will return back the user symbol right so user service implementation is done now let's go back to the controller and here what i'll do i'll just return success okay so you can see that the one part is done that whenever a user will try to register to the system the data will be saved to the database and the user will be disabled in the starting now we need to send the email to the user so that with a particular link so that user can click on that particular link and the user can be activated so that's the standard process right so for that what we have to do is we have to create the event for it because that's the other task that you are doing the particular process that you are doing over here that should not take the extra time for that okay so what we'll do we will just separate out the process we'll create one event and that particular event will handle to create the particular email and send the email to the user so that's what we are going to do but if you want to test out till this particular flow you will be able to test it out and the user will be saved to the database with the 
disabled as a status. So here what we will do to send an email and to separate out the process from this flow, we will create the event. So let me just create the object of the event. We will be using the application event. So we'll just define private application event publisher and I'll auto wire it. Now once we get the user, user is saved to the database, we can create the event. So at this particular point, I can say publisher dot publish event. Okay. And now here you can see that this particular publish event is taking the application event as the input parameter. So we need to create the event that we want to publish. So let's create the event. So for that, let me just create the event package over here. Okay, within this event package, I'll create the Java class and I'll say this is the registration complete event, which will extends application event. We need to create a matching constructor for the super. Okay, so let me just create it and here we'll be taking the user object user user and I'll be also taking one string as the application URL. Cool, right? So yeah, you can see that the event is created. Now I want to have this two particular field as well. So let me just do one thing. I'll just say private user user and I'll just say private string I'll copy this application URL as well. Now this particular application URL is nothing but a URL that we have to create for a user when we send the email to click on it. Okay. So that's the thing. And from here, this dot user equals to user and this dot application URL equals to application URL. Okay. Now my event is created. Now I can publish this event. So if I go back to the registration controller, I can create the new registration complete event. Okay. And here I need to pass user object first and then I need to pass the URL. So let me just keep a string for now, but later we will create the or we will build the URL. Okay. So this particular part is complete. Now we just publish the event. We need to listen that particular event and we have to do something on it. Okay. So let's create the listener for that particular event that we have created. That is the registration complete event. So I'll go to this particular entity package and within this, I'll just create one more package. This will be LIST in your listener. And within this listener, let me just create the Java class that is registration complete event listener. Okay. And this, and this particular class will implements application listener. Okay. And this particular listener is of which type that is the registration complete event. And we need to implement the method. So let's do that. Okay. So this is the implementation part. Now at this part, what we'll do, we'll create the verification token for the user. Okay. So whatever the token will create and will attach to the link so that when a user clicks, the user will redirect back to the application. Okay. With link. So we'll create a link over here. And once the link is created, we can send mail to user. That's the two things that we are going to do over here. So let's get the user now. User user equals to we'll get the user from the event. So we'll do event dot get user. So when we go to the registration complete event, here we will add the getters and setters. Okay. Because I just need the getters and setters. So let me go back to the registration over here and I'll just use the get user and I also need string token equals to and the token I'll just create as a UUID dot random UUID dot to string. Now whatever this particular token is right that particular token we can save for a particular user so that when uh, whenever a token whenever a link is hit by the user that particular token and the token that we have in the database we can match that particular token 
and then only we'll be verifying the user okay so we need to save this token as well so for that we will create the entity again for it so let's go ahead and create the entity for it and for that particular entity we have to attach the user as well okay so i've done the mistake over here that listener i have added in the event so let me just drag and drop to the event okay now in the entity let me create one more entity and i'll say this as a verification token this will be entity and this will be data as well add the id attribute okay and here i'll define one more thing that is private string that is token and private date expiration time okay when that particular token will be expired so we will generally give about 10 to 15 minutes of time to for a token to expire and we'll also give for which particular user so we'll do one to one mapping for a user over here so here we'll just define one to one mapping and we'll define fetch equals to fetch type dot eager and we'll do the join column over here the name of the join column would be name equals to user id nullable false and the name of the foreign key foreign key equals to at the rate foreign key and the name of the foreign key i'll just do fk underscore user verify token okay let me just reformat the file cool right we have added the verification token as the entity as well which will have id token and expiration time now from here we need to create the couple of constructors so we can pass the user and token to this particular entity so let me just create that let's create a constructor verification token where we can just pass the user as well and the token this dot token equals to token and this dot user equals to user and one more field that we have is the expiration time so how that particular expiration time would be calculated so for that let's create the method this dot expiration time equals to calculate expiration date and here we need to pass some static values so suppose uh, let's create one static value over here private static final int expiration time okay so i am going with the 10 minutes of time okay expiration time as 10 minutes so this is something that i'll pass over here that this is the expiration time and let me create the method so i'll use calendar calendar equals to calendar dot get instance calendar dot set time in millis and we'll pass the new date new date dot get time now with this we'll add some time calendar dot add and we'll add calendar dot minute calendar dot minute and we'll just add expiration time and we'll just re use return new date calendar dot get time dot get time okay simple thing you can see that whatever the expiration time that i'm passing over here i'm adding to the current time and i'm passing the value over here so it will be around 10 minutes from the system time so that will be set over here and i'll create one more constructor over here public verification token where it will just take the token so if i just want to work with the token okay i'll just call the super and this dot token equals to token and this dot expiration time equals to calculate expiration time and i'll just pass the expiry time simple right and here let me just add the noax constructor okay so this verification token is created now let's get back to the event listener 
now at this particular point you can see that i have got the user and i have got the token as well now at this point i can save the token and user to the database so here as well i will need the user service so let me create the object for it private user service and i'll just auto wire it and I'll just say user service dot i'll just create one method that is save verification token for user where i'll just pass the token and user okay and i'll create the method let's go to the implementation over here and here I can implement the method that is the save verification token for user okay now here what we'll do we'll just create the object of verification token equals to new verification token where we'll pass the user and token and for this particular verification token as well we need to have a repository right because we have not created the repository for this so let's go ahead and create the repository this repository package let's create the new interface and we'll just say verification token repository okay this is the interface and this will extends jpa repository this jpa repository is of type uh, verification token and of long and we'll annotate it with repository cool right now the repository is created let's go to the event listener this is working fine now let's go to the user service impl the verification token is created and i need the object of verification token repository as well so i'll just do private verification token repository and i'll auto wire it simple right and this i can use over here that verification token repository dot save verification token super simple right now my user and token both are saved to the database now at this particular point i need to send email to the user now what we are doing over here is to save the time we are just mimicking that we are sending the email if you want to actually send the email i have created a dedicated video on spring boot where I am showing you how to send the email from the any of the email client that is be uh, in this in that particular video we are using the gmail to send the emails so that you can implement over here but here we are just mimicking that we are sending the email and we are printing that email in the console so we can get the url and we can use that particular url to verify so now let's get back to the registration event listener and here you can see that create the verification token for the user with link this particular part is created we need to create the link now and we need to send the email that particular part is remaining so let's implement that so here i'm creating the url string url equals to event dot get application url so this particular application url we have not yet implemented the particular method to create the application url but we will implement and we are hoping or we are assuming that we will be getting the application url to the context path okay and then we can add the path from there so from here i'll just append the path and here i'll just pass it plus verify registration so this is some path that we are going to implement registration verify registration and i'll be passing the token equals to plus token simple you can see that this url will have the application url that will be your context url plus so this is some api that i'll be creating that is the verify registration and as the parameter i'm passing the entire token okay let me use the slf4j over here to print the logger and i'll just print log.info and I'll print over here is click the link to verify your account okay and here I'll pass the URL I think this is pretty simple that we are passing the verify registration that one endpoint 
this endpoint we are still going to implement and we are passing the token over here and we are just mimicking that this is the email but ideally this is where you will send the email you can create the send verification email method over here you can pass the details and you can implement it over here okay so this is the mocking that we are doing over here now the application url so this application url we are passing from the registration controller right at this particular point so let's mimic this url let's create the url so for creating the url and to get the context of the url you will need the http request so let me just inject that i'll just use final http so let request request and here i'll create one method application url and here i'll pass the request and let me create the method and from here we can create the url return http plus request dot get server name plus colon plus request dot get server port plus request dot get context path okay so this is a simple method where it's returning the path now this particular flow you can see that it will come over here when we are going to register it will pass the user model where it will have the first name last name email id password over here we are going to pass from the response body means from the as a part of a json and it will save the user over here we'll get the user back and we will create one event where that particular event will send the token to the user in form of an email and that particular email can be used to verify the user okay that's standard flow that we are going over here so everything is implemented i guess let's re-verify okay cool so let's start the server okay your server is started now one thing to note over here is when we go to the browser okay and when we go to the local host 8080 and here you can see that we are by default getting a sign in page and this particular sign in page is from the spring security that we have added the dependency okay and currently there is no user or there is no extra configuration that we have done that spring security will understand so what spring security is doing that it is giving the password as well you can see that this is the password that we can use and the default user is the user to log into the system that's what we can do over here but we do not want to use that we need our custom implementation so that is something that we are going to implement but for this particular api right currently whatever the api that we are using that particular api is also protected so that api we need to bypass like when we want to register it's it is not necessary to log into the system right because we want to create the user so there will be some whitelisted apis or whitelisted urls that we want to bypass and for rest of them we need to enable it so that is something that we have to implement okay that is some configuration that we have to do currently we won't be able to log in directly or use any of the api directly so let me add the configuration for that so we are going to implement a security filter chain over here security filter chain and this will be the pin that will be defining and this will be taking http security as the input parameter will be injecting http security and now we can do something on the http so what we'll do with this http we will disable the CORS and dot csrf dot disabled okay so we are just disabling the thing over here and it requires the exception so i'll just add in the method signature so i am telling that there will be some apis that you need to handle and this all the apis i need to permit okay what will be the apis i'll define over here so let me just define private static final whitelist urls and this is 
string of array and which are the urls i can define okay this is hello i can define slash hello i can define one more that is the registration controller slash register okay and i'll define over here that whitelist urls so this should be permitted all so any urls which have this pattern will be whitelisted okay will be permitted and i'll just do return http dot build so this is a simple security that i have defined over here that i'm just disabling the curs and csrf so i can do post request and everything for now and i'm allowing all this particular urls whatever i have defined over here so in the future whatever the other urls that we are going to build that will be protected behind the security that will be defining later so let's start the server again and here you can see that application started and if i go back and here you can see that i am able to directly call the hello api right so one thing is working fine now the same way register one we can use using the postman so from the postman let's try to register one user and before that if you go to our database let me refresh all and within this user registration you can see that the tables are created that is the user and the verification token okay currently we see there should not be any data okay there is no data in either of those table now let's go back to the intellij idea and this is something register that we have to call right so let me open postman okay let me create the new request over here this will be the post request and http localhost colon 8080 slash register is the url let me reconfirm we'll go to the registration controller register is the url and we are going to use the input parameter over here that is the first name last name and everything so let's define in the body raw binary json and let's define I'll define first name, last name, password, and email. Okay. First name is Shabir. Last name is Daudi. Password I'll give one two three four five six seven. And Shabir at gmail dot com. Simple, right? So these are the details that I'm passing over here. And if I click on send. And you can see that I am getting the response success over here. Okay. And if I go to the database, hit on user, you can see that I'm getting the email, first name, last name, and password. You can see that it's encrypted using the Bcrypt. My role is user and enabled is zero. So it's false now. And if I go to the token, you can see that the token is not created. So there is some issue. So let's check. So if you go to the so you can see that the user entry was inserted over here okay but the verification code was not inserted now the issue i can see over here is this is not a component yet right so spring doesn't know about this yet so let me just add this as a component so spring knows about this and this will be executed so let's restart the server okay server is restarted now let's go to the mysql and let me just delete this okay so no records now okay and let me go back to the postman and from here let's hit send okay success if i go back to the mysql user is there verification code is also there so my event is also working fine you can see that the token is created user id 2 and all the details now if i go to the intellij idea here you can see that the event is created and the link is also there like click the link to verify your account and this is the link and we forgot something over here that is the forward slash right so we will add that forward slash over here and the token is 
this particular token so you can see that we are able to create the link and this is something that you will be sending the user in the email but we are just mimicking over here now we need to handle this verify registration like whenever a user is clicking on this particular url when there is a verify registration we need to take this token and that particular token needs to match with the token that we have within that time frame right so if if a particular user is doing after 10 minutes then we need to define that token is expired and if it's not if token is valid and within the time frame interval we should be validated and we should be activating the user so that's what we are going to do so let's first correct this url after ADAD, we will add the slash and then we will implement this verify registration api so here we'll define this okay and now what we'll do we'll go to the registration registration controller there is one post mapping right so we'll create one more okay here let's define public string verify registration and this is the get mapping where we will define the slash verify registration and there will be one token so I'll just define there will be a request param token and the request param name is also token and I'm defining over here string result equals to user service dot verify instead of verify we'll just say validate verification token and here we'll pass the token okay and here i'm defining if result dot equals ignore case valid i'll be passing valid or invalid from the method so if it's valid return user verified successfully else return bad user okay simple thing now let's implement this method let's create the method in user service and let's implement the method this is in the user service implementation class now here we need verification token verification token verification token equals to verification token repository dot find by token and i'll just pass the token okay and this particular method we need to implement so let me just create the method find by token it will take the token as the input parameter and it will pass the verification token here we got the token now if verification token equals to equals to null then just return invalid token now after this i need to get the user from the verification token and i need to check the expiration time as well so let me just do that i'll just do user user equals to verification token dot get user i'll create the calendar object equals to calendar dot get instance now i need to check something over here if verification token dot get expiration time dot get time minus cal dot get time dot get time is less than equal to zero so i am just so you can see that the time saved in the database minus current time is less than zero that means the token is expired so we need to make that happen that the token is expired so let me just format the code yeah we need to make sure that the token is deleted from the repository so i'll define verify token repository dot delete verification token okay and return expired so now at this particular point we have verified that token is also valid and it is not expired as well so we need to do user dot set enabled as true we are enabling the user 
and we are saving user repository dot save user back and we are returning valid so yeah you can see that it's very simple right we are just checking that whatever the token that we are getting that token exists in the database or not if not it's an invalid token if so we are getting the user and with that particular user we are getting the calendar instance and we are checking the expiration time if that particular expiration time exceeds then we are deleting the token and we are just telling that it is expired otherwise we are enabling the user and we are saving back to the repository so we'll go back to the registration controller and you can see that the complete flow is done right now let's restart the application okay application is restarted now let's go to the database okay let's delete everything so we can see better let's delete apply user deleted okay so there are no users and no tokens available now let's go to the postman and let's create this user so we'll click on send and the user is created if you go to the database the user is there and the token is also there okay so what we are going to do over here is we are going to get this url okay you can see that the url is there so copy url we'll go to the browser to verify let's go to the browser let's verify and you can see that we are getting user verified successfully okay spelling mistake is there i'll correct it out okay so if you see over here if you go to the database earlier you can see that the enable flag was zero so it was disabled now if i again require it you can see that it is verified successfully so now user is verified so this is the complete registration flow you can see that we can also check some of the uh, failure scenarios where we can just change the a token and if we hit you can see that we are getting the bad users so the token is bad right so if we if we wait for 10 minutes okay after 10 minutes if the token is expired then what it will do is it will delete the token itself okay so this way you can implement the complete registration flow with the token implementation where you are sending the token and that particular token has been verified in the database now once this particular complete flow is done there might be a scenario where you didn't get the email or there might be some issue in the server where you didn't receive the email so you might have seen this everywhere like there will be a recent functionality right recent token or recent otp whatever so for this particular registration process also we can implement that particular functionality where when we click on that particular button it will regenerate the verification token and it will send in our email so that particular token also we can use to verify so let's go ahead and create the functionality where we can ask for the regeneration of the verification token and that particular token we will be using so let's do that let's go to the IntelliJ idea and let's implement that functionality so currently you can see that we everything we are doing from the rest apis this rest apis you will be using in your ui application so let's create the method that is public string resend verification token okay i'll annotate it with get mapping and i'll just say resend verify token okay you can give any name and here what i'll be taking is i'll be taking the old token okay whenever there is a request from the ui to the backend for this re-verification re token send that old token as well so from that particular old token we can verify so I'll just take the request param and this is the token string old token and I also need the HTTP request to generate the URL again. So HTTP servlet request and request so here what i'm doing i'm just creating the object of verification token verification token equals to user service dot generate new verification token okay and i'm passing the old token over here so i'll get the new verification token so let me just create this method 
okay i'll go to the implementation part and i'll implement the method now with this particular verification token old token what i'll do i'll create the object of verification token verification token equals to verification token repository dot find by token and i'll be passing the old token over here okay so if i get the token what i'll do i will set the new token verification token dot set token where i'll pass the uuid dot random uuid dot to string so i will just set the new token and with the help of verification repository i can save the token back to the database and can return the token okay so at this point i'll get the token over here in the controller so let's go to the controller here i'll get the token here i'm taking the user out of that user equals to verification token dot get user now at this point again we need to send the email right like this is your new verification token verify this for your particular user so we can create one method where we will be sending the email so we can just say resend verification token mail simple method i'm creating where i'm passing the user object and i'm passing the application url with the request and i can say to the user that verification link sent simple right so now let's create the method so this is the method that i'm going to create so let me add the code over here okay so for this i'll go to the application event listener and i'll get the url and this logger message go over here let me paste it url equals to instead of this i'll just directly use the application url okay verify registration blah blah okay i need the token as well over here right so let me just pass the token as well so what i'll do i'll pass the token as well verification token and i'll update the method okay where it's taking the verification token here verification token dot get token okay so here you can see that the url is created and click on the link to verify your account and for the loggers let's add the slf4j so recent verification token email this is implemented ideally you will be sending the email but to save the time we are just printing out in the loggers so this is a method where you will be sending the verification token again so this is also a new api so let me just handle this in the spring security so if i go to the web security config and here we can add okay now i'm adding currently now but it will be helpful later currently i have permitted everything so currently there won't be any error but the list we are maintaining will help us later okay so let me just add for the verify registration as well so now let's build the application again okay application is started and let's go to the postman and let's change something okay instead of shabir i'll just say nikhil gupta password 1234 and i'll just say nikhil at gmail.com and we'll click on submit to create a new user okay new user is created success okay users are there you can see that the verification token is also created and you can see the token is starting from 2855c53 okay so it's from the 2855 now if you go to the intellij idea you can see that you, you are getting the link as well where you can verify okay 2855 but now suppose i didn't receive it okay just assume we didn't receive it so we need to call that again so what i'll do i will call the api again okay so let me just go to the registration controller and you can see that it's the recent verify token so instead of verify registration the same url let me just copy it okay copy url go to the postman new request and instead of 
recent verify token this is something we need to change instead of verify registration okay so what it will do is it will try to check this particular token if this particular token exists in the database okay that at that time what it will do it will replace with a new token and we will get a new token okay so let's hit this url you can see that we are getting the verification link sent and if we check the database the earlier token was 2855 if i hit the query again you can see that the new token is generated and the token is 41723 something like that and the same link would be generated here as well you can see that the link is generated verify registration token is the new one and when we copy this url go to the postman new okay and we can click on send and you can see that user verified successfully okay so my complete flow is working where we are registering the user we are verifying the token and if we didn't get the token we can ask to resend the token as well that is also completely working fine cool right now what we are going to do is we are going to implement the functionality of the reset password because if we forget the password at the time of login we need to reset the password right that also will be implemented using this particular token flow with the email and later we will be implementing the change password as well now we'll create one method where user can click on reset password and user will get an email with a link just like the way we have created all this right it will be a link where when we click on that particular link it will be to add the new password and that particular new password will be saved okay just imagine that you are clicking on the link and you are getting the page but here we are going with the rest api so we'll be creating a rest api where we will be getting the new passwords and token and email id and based on that we will be saving or we will be updating the password over here so let's create a method that it will create a link for a user to reset the password okay so let's do that so we'll create a method over here public string reset password at the rate post mapping and i'll say reset password here we'll be taking the request body and we'll be taking one object so let's create one object let's go to the model and we'll create a class password model <coughs> let me annotate with data private string email okay currently let me just add this later when we need any other details we will add the details in this password model let's go back to the controller in the request body we will be taking password model password model over here and let's implement the functionality here okay so here what will be user will be passing the email id with which they have created the account and will validate if that particular email id is present in our system then with that particular email id we will be creating a new password token and we will send that token to the user over email with that token we will again validate and we will ask them to reset the password okay so let's do that we'll do user user equals to user service dot find user by email and we'll pass password model dot get email okay let's create the method let's implement the method as well and here we will return user repository dot find by email and we'll pass the email okay and this particular method that we have to add in the repository so let's create the method it will return the user based on the email that we are providing okay now here i'll be getting the user okay and here we'll check if user not equals to null now we got that user particular right if user is not null then i can create a new token and save the token for the password reset so let me just create the token string token equals to uuid dot random uuid dot to string and we'll call the user service dot create password reset token for user where we'll pass the user and token simple right and let's create the method and we'll implement this method as well
now for the password reset token as well we need to create the entity the similar thing we will do as we had done for the verification token so let me just create the entity i'll go to the entity package and create the new password token i'll just name password reset token okay i'll go to the verification token i'll copy everything from here and the password reset token i will add all the details and i'll change the constructors and i will annotate it with entity data and nox constructor okay so let's do that as well entity at the rate data and at the rate no hugs constructor and we'll change the foreign key as fk user password token okay super simple we just created the similar thing for the password reset token as we had done for the verification token now let's go back to the user service impl and in this method let's create the object of password reset token now for this password reset token we need to have the repository so let's create the repository for that we'll go to the repository section let's create the new java class it should be interface password reset token repository and this extends jpa repository and this jpa repository is of type password reset token and id is of type long and we need to annotate with at the rate repository cool right now let's go back to the user service impl we created the password reset token and now we need to add the password reset repository over here private password reset token repository and we'll auto wire it and this repository will be used to save the data password reset token repository dot save password reset token simple right now let's go back to the registration controller at this particular point your password token is set now you need a url let's create the url so that we can hit that url to reset the token so i'll just define the url okay string url and for the url we will create one method password reset token mail similar to what we did for the recent verification token email where we will pass the user object and for the application url we will pass the application url where we need the request so let's inject the http request as well okay we'll pass the request and we'll pass the token as well let's create the method let me refactor this method the name pass password reset token mail okay now here what i need the similar thing i'll just copy this and i'll paste over here i'll just use the token over here and here instead of verify registration i'll just say save password okay this is the link that i am creating and click the link below to reset your password cool right and this url we will return from here now when you click on this url you will be redirected to enter your new password right new password and the confirm your new password so at that particular time we will be needing more details to save the password so let's create a method to save that particular password so here when you click on reset here you will get a link when you click on the link you will pass more details to save the password now this particular save password we will create public string save password 
okay this is post mapping and i will give the same thing save password okay here you can see that it is taking the token as the request parameter so let's add that at the rate request param token which is string token and it will also take the extra data as a json format right like your new password and the email id whatever it is so for that i will just use this particular password model as a request body so let me just add it below over here at the rate request body password model super simple right now here we need to verify the token and we need to save the details so first let's verify the token string result equals to user service dot validate password reset token and we'll pass the token and let's create this method we'll go to the implementation and we'll implement this method and here it would be similar to what we have done earlier to verify this token right so i'll just copy this information from here i'll paste it and i need to change some details instead of verification no code it would be password reset token and here i'll refactor the name password reset token and this find by token we need to create so let's create this method if we go to the user sorry sorry this should be password reset token repository and this we need to change we need to implement this so I, let me just add the method okay in the password reset token repository okay now we are checking if password reset token equal to null invalid we are getting the user from the password reset token we are getting the calendar instance password reset token dot expiry time and all and here we need to use the password reset token repository delete password expired and okay and i don't need these details so let me just remove that simple thing we are just validating the password reset token if token is not available in the database it's an invalid token if token is expired then it will be expired otherwise it's an invalid token okay let's go back to the registration controller and here we will get the valid now and here we will check if results dot equals ignore case valid and i'll negate this sentence if it's not valid then i'll just return invalid token okay or expired token whatever now at this particular point my token is valid okay so i need to update the password so for that i'll go to the password model first and let's add few fields private string old password and private string new password sorry new password okay these three fields now let me implement optional user okay user equals to user service dot get user by password reset token whatever the token is based on that i need the user back so i can change the password so here i'll just pass the token and let's implement this method let's go to the implementation and implement this method and here we will pass return optional dot nullable okay optional dot off nullable we will do 
password is a token repository dot find by token will pass the token dot get user simple right we are getting the user from this token now let's go back to the controller now here we need to check if user dot is present do something else do something so if user is present we need to change the password else invalid token and here i'll just say password change not password change password reset successful okay and here we need to change the password set the password so we need to call that method so here what i'll do i'll just say user service dot change password and here i'll just pass user dot get and password so i'll just do password model dot get new password let's implement this method implement the method and here we'll just do user dot set password password encoder dot encode new password and user repository dot save user password is saved now so now here you can see that we created two apis to reset the password and then to save the password so now let's restart our application and let's test this functionality. Return statement is missing. Let's handle that. Password reset token email. Return URL. Let's run it again. And here you can see that your application is started and you can see that your new table is also created for the password reset token. If you go to the MySQL, let's refresh everything and here you can see that your password reset token is also created. Okay, cool. Now what I'll do, I will try to reset the password for this particular user that is Nikhil. Okay, currently you can see that the password is something like this which is G E M V N something like this. Okay. So we'll change the password. So what is the URL that we have to create? Let's go back and to reset the password, we need to call the reset password and in the body, we need to pass the email ID. Okay. So we'll do that. Let's go to the postman. Let's close this get request and let's copy this post request. Reset password will copy this and paste over here. Go to the body raw JSON and we'll copy the email from the database itself. So let's copy the email. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so for this particular user, when we hit on send, I should get a URL. And with that particular URL, if I pass more data, that is my password, then I should be able to change the password. Currently, there is no reset password token over here. Okay, so if I click on send, you can see that I got the URL. That is save password and this is the token. And if I check the data you can see that i have a token available okay for my user now i need to use this in my new url this is also a post request and in the body save password i'm getting the token as well and in the body i must get the token that i'm passing okay and i must get the new password as well so let's do that so the token I'm providing over here from the parameter itself for the body. Let me go to the binary raw text to JSON 
and here let me pass the new password the new password i am passing is 123 okay simple thing i am passing the token new password and i should be able to save let me just check that the new password attribute is correct new password i just copy from here okay now hit on send you can see that password reset successfully okay and if i go to the database current password you can see that it's starting from g e m v n okay this is some password encrypted password and let's require it and you can see that the password is changed successfully so your token also was verified and the new password was set successfully so this way you can do the reset password verification flow in your application now let's do the change password flow so let me go back to the intellij idea go back to the registration controller and the same way you did for the save password you will do for the change password where in the change password we will get more information what is the email id because currently because earlier we verified the user based on the token that we created now we need to verify the user based on the email id the logged in user itself and then we need to get the old password if we are able to match the old password with a particular user then only we will update with the new password that's the logic right so let's create one more api public string change password okay and here i'll do the post mapping and i'll just say change password and in the input parameter i'll take the request body itself the request body is again password model and we need to find the user by email so i'll just do user user equals to user service dot find user by email and i'll just pass password model dot get email okay we had already created this find user by email method so we are using the same now we got the user now if user is there then we need to check the old password so whatever the old password is entered that particular password should match with the password in the database so let's check that if user service dot check if valid old password and here i'll just pass the user object and password model dot get old password then do some if condition if operation okay so if the password is valid then we can change to the new password and i'll completely negate this if so return invalid old password if this is all good then i'll just say save new password functionality will implement and after that return password change successfully okay now let's implement this check if valid old password so let me just create the method let me implement this method in the user service impl and here we'll just do return password encoder dot matches and here this particular matches will take the old password that is the password that we are passing that is the raw password and the other thing is user dot get password the encoded password it will try to match this the old password the password which we are passing and the password which is already stored in the database if it matches then all good otherwise we need to raise the exception so let's go back to the registration controller it will come at this particular point if password is all good then fine otherwise throw invalid old password now we will implement this save functionality and here we will just say user service dot change password will pass the user and will pass the password model dot get new password to save the password that's it right we are just doing a simple thing over here whatever the password model whatever the email id that we are getting we are getting the user from that email id we are checking if the old password is correct or not and after that we are 
updating to the new password so let's restart the application and test this now let's go to the postman let's create a new api request let me just copy this it's a post request instead of reset password it's a change password and let me add the body data as well we pass the email old password and we'll pass the new password as well the email id i'll pass as is of nikhil the old password we set was i think 123 but let me pass 567 and the password i want to set is 789 okay so at this particular point i should get the error right because the old password is not correct that i am sending back so if i hit on send there is some error okay so let's see what is the error i'm getting the null pointer exception obviously right because this particular user is not available we need to handle all these particular exceptions okay currently we have not handled all the exceptions but when you are implementing perfectly we should be handling all the exceptions currently i'm just showing you the way so let me just copy the email id correctly okay and if i hit on send currently you can see that invalid old password i'm getting now if i give the correct password that is 1 2 3 i should be able to update the password you can see that password change successfully now the password is 789 so currently you can see that we have successfully implemented the change password functionality as well now there are a lot more functionalities that you can implement within the entire registration flow change password flow and reset password and everything these are all the foundations that i have shown over here but there are more advanced things that you can do like handling the ip address and locations and everything if you want to check out check out the article from the yugen i'll just mention the link in the description below i have taken the lot of reference from that so if you see this right the complete registration flow with the help of spring security i have taken a lot of inspiration from you so you can check out this entire tutorial it's very in depth than what i have implemented in this particular video so you can check out this complete flow and you can implement in your project according to your requirement i highly highly recommend this particular article it's implemented very well so you can check out this article i'll link this in the description below now from here we can understand the complete registration flow registration with the email with the token with the reset token verify token change password reset password and all the functionalities we have implemented now we need to implement the login functionality so whatever the users that we have created right in our database we will create a login functionality to validate a particular user and to enter into our system so now let's implement the login functionality it's very important okay so before we implement the login functionality we need to understand about the auth 2.0 so you might have seen this auth to implemented at many places so everywhere you go you will be seeing this particular buttons to login with those particular authentication providers so there'll be octa auth 0 and many things okay so these are all the authentication providers based on the auth 2.0 o standards now before we implement anything we need to understand about the auth 2.0 so auth 2.0 which means open authorization is a standard designed to allow websites or application to access resources okay hosted anywhere on behalf of the user so it's like very simple if i give you the analogy i have my mobile phone okay and if you want to use my mobile phone you have to take permission from me to use that particular phone that's a simple thing so that's the analogy that we are going to understand from there so i have my phone that means i have my resources i have my apis if you want to access it you need to take the permission from me to use those apis or to use my mobile phone okay so that's the standard that has been os 2.0 so os 2.0 is just the authorization protocol and not the authentication so it only provides the authorization like you are allowing someone to use your resources i am just allowing 
you to use my phone okay simple things it's just the authorization that you can access this but what about the authentication that authentication comes later when you connect open id with it okay so auth 2.0 and open id connects together and you will get the complete authentication and authorization working together now the other important part of the auth 2.0 is it is designed primarily as a means of granting access to a set of resources suppose you have a set of resources like if you take the example of a twitter twitter has its own api if you want to access this those apis you need to request for it right you will be requesting twitter to use it okay and the twitter will give you some extra details about authorization client id and all those tokens and everything to use those apis so it's just like that and auth 2.0 uses access tokens so we will go in detail about the access tokens and how everything works but this is a basic idea about it now in auth 2.0 these are the basic jargons that you need to understand because everywhere this will be the thing that we will be talking about that is the resource owner client authorization server and resource server entire auth 2.0 depends on this and you will be implementing this only let's understand resource owner what is resource owner a user or system that owns the protected resources and can grant access to them i just give you the example right i have my phone and i am the sole owner of that particular phone because it's my phone okay and if you want to use it i can grant you access and you have to ask for me so that's the resource owner now the client the client is the system that requires access to the protected resources you my friend you are the client because you want to access my phone right so a client will need the access from the resource owner and here you can see that client must hold the appropriate access token if you want to access my phone you need to have my password right so that is something that the access token will be given to you so that's the resource owner and the client now the next is the authorization server so this is the server receives request from the client for access token and issues them upon the successful authentication and consent by the resource owner so it's something very simple right authorization server will what it will do is it will just give you the token on behalf of the request that you are giving okay authorization server is nothing but to authorize your request it will just check that are you authorized to use that particular resources that you are trying to use and once the consent for that is given by the owner resource owner then authorization server will allow you to use those particular resource that's a simple thing and the resource server a server that protects users resources and receives access request from the client it accepts and validates the access token from the client and returns the appropriate resources to it so it will just try to handle or it will have all the resources so it will try to handle all the resources and if any of the request comes with the proper authorization with the proper code then it will allow the client to use those resources otherwise it will decline the request so these are the terms these are the main terms that we are going to implement we will be implementing the authorization server we are going to implement the resource server and we are going to implement the client so whatever the application that we are going to build the apis that we are going to build that will be your client so with that particular client we will be implementing the authorization server and the resource server so all everything works together and your request will be authenticated now if you go back to the intelligence idea if you see here this is your spring security client this is your project where you have the different apis right whatever we have created so these are the apis that is your client and this particular clients whenever you are doing any request you might need the access from the authorization server or the resource server whenever you want to create any of the things it's simple as that right so we have to create the authorization server and all this authorization will be handled from your database okay if you go to the database these are the users that we have right shabir and nikhil currently so all your authorization will be validated against this particular users we will be passing the user details it will handle this user details and once the users are validated it we will be allowing the resource to use and the next thing that we have to understand is the scopes scopes are important concept because scopes exactly defines what you are allowed to use okay suppose you are not the admin so you are just the user then you have only rights to read the data if you are admin you have some rights to modify the data as well so all these particular things are defined based on the scopes of the application okay scopes for the particular user and all these particular scopes you will have to give the consent to use those particular scopes so it's very simple like if you are going to any of the websites and there is a button to log in with google when you hit on that button log in with google you will be redirected back to the 
Google page and where you will be entering your credentials. Once you enter the credentials, you are authenticated by Google and after that you will be displayed the scopes like these are the permissions that your client is asking right to read your name to read your email id to read your profile picture these are the different scopes they have defined so it's asking the consent from you that a particular client is asking all these particular details from me and if you hit allow then only the consent is accepted and the particular client is allowed to use those resources it's similar thing so these are scopes and if you see this particular flow over here so this is just the abstract flow there are different particular variations available based on the different grant types and the flow will be changed accordingly so the ideal flow would be like you have the client your application your user that is a resource owner your authorization server and your resource server and this is your service APIs entirely on top of the authorization server and the resource server whenever application wants to use anything application will create the authorization request to the user to the resource owner like I want to use this particular resources and user will grant the access like you grant the access when you click on the gmail right after logging to the gmail so you gave the grant like okay you can use those resources to the client now client got the consent like okay i am allowed to use those resources then client will send that grant to the authorization server okay i got the request okay i got the permission now okay this is the permission so what authorization server will do is okay it will validate okay you got the request you got the code now take this token so authorization server is giving token back based on the code that we got as the grant okay so now the token is given back to the client after validation now with this particular token the application or the client will hit the server to get the details so once that particular token is valid until that particular token is valid so resource server will allow those requests if the token is not valid resource server will not allow those requests it's a simple flow this particular things you need to understand that is a client resource owner resource server and the authorization server this is how everything will work together now we'll go to the application and we will implement the authorization server and we will connect our client with the authorization server and we will also create the resource server so if there is any resources that we have created behind the authorization server then user can use those so let's go to the IntelliJ idea okay we have one client available and this particular client has a controller and you can see that there is one API get mapping slash hello so this particular request should be allowed only if you are logged in now let's implement the authorization server so we need to create the new authorization server application so let's do that so now if you want to understand this flow you can go to the auth playground okay auth 2.0 playground this one okay and from here you can understand that particular flow so here you can see that there are different flows available there's a different types of implementation that you can do authentication code pixie implicit device code open id connect and anything okay generally authorization code or the open id connect with pixie would be more implemented so let's try to understand the simple authorization flow i'll add the link in the description below so you can check this out i'll go to the authorization flow and here you can see that it is asking to register a client first okay client means your api from where you're going to access okay before you can begin the flow you will need to register a client and create a user simple thing so let's register a client okay in order to use the auth api you will need to first register application if you go through this right if you go through this entire flow you will get a much more understanding about the auth2 flow so I'll, I'll highly recommend you to go through this particular flow as well so you will get more understanding so let's register this client okay and here you can see that you got the client registration data so it's sim it's similar to how you will be registering your application to any of the auth2 providers like google github linkedin or whatever like whatever the auth2 providers are there you have to register your application and you will get the client id client secret let me just open this in a new window and these are the client registration so let me just continue and register this client to the auth2 okay and here you can see that this is the first flow build the authorization url and redirect the user to the authorization server and currently this way the authorization url will be built so your authorization server.com whatever the authorization server is slash authorize so slash authorize this, this so these are the standard apis okay these are the standard apis from the auth 2.0 wherever you will be implementing this this will be the standard 
URLs. If you want to modify, you can modify, but these are the standards. And with this authorize, you will be passing more parameters. That is the response type. What type of response type it is? It's code. So because we have started with the authorization code flow, the response type is code. Okay. If for the different uh, flow, this particular value would be different. And you can see the client ID and client ID equals to client ID that we got and the redirect URI. This redirect URI is nothing but once the authentication is done where you want to redirect back. So that particular URI we need to define and the scope. So these are the scopes that we talked about earlier like what should be the scope of the access that you want to grant. So that scope and this particular state you can see that the state is the parameter the client will need to store this to use in the next step. Okay, so the state also will be generated. So these are the standard parameters that will be generated to authorize your request. So let's authorize this request against the auth server. And here we need to add our credentials. So these are our credentials. So let me just copy the username. And this is the password. Okay, once we log in, it will be authorized. And here you can see that now it is asking for the consent okay that do you approve or not so we will approve and here you can see that verify state parameter and here you can see that it is checking that earlier state and the current state after redirection the states are same if it ma if it matches then continue if it doesn't matches then what is the flow so you can check both the flows so let's continue with the it matches continue so you can see that once this matches the next is the exchange the authorization code so after that whatever the code we got right we need to hit this token uri to get the token so here you can see that the grant type equals to authorization code we are passing the client id we are passing the client secret okay whatever the client secret it was we are passing the redirect uri and also we are passing the code okay whatever the code we got from the above step so once once we hit on go against this authorization code and all the details we will get the token and that is the token that we have to use so once we click on go at the end you can see that we got the token this is the access token for your resources from your client so you can see that there is a refresh token the scope is also defined what is the scope of this token it's a bar barrier type okay when it expires so all this information is there so you can try for the another flow as well and you can check it out how everything is working so this is a general idea how this auth2 will work and similarly we will be implementing in our system so now let's go to the spring initializer okay start dot spring dot io and let's create the authorization server so let me just add the group id com dot daily code buffer and the artifact i'll give is auth authorization server the package name i'll give auth server okay packaging is jar java version is 11 and let's add the dependencies so i'll add the lumbok dependency i'll add the gpa dependency as we need to connect to the database i'll add the mysql driver i'll add the security and I'll add the web dependency. So these are the dependencies that I'm adding in my authorization server. So let's generate the project and add in the IntelliJ idea. So I'm just generating the project. Let's open in the finder, unzip it. Let's copy this, we'll go to documents, Java workspace, spring security, and I'm adding over here. Okay, now this should be added to the IntelliJ idea. And if I go to my parent that is spring security tutorial, let me add the module auth to authorization server. Okay, here you can see that auth authorization server is imported. I'll be using the services. Now within this authorization server, okay, we need to add one more dependency that is the authorization server. So let me just go down over here in the dependency section. Let me add the dependency. That is the Spring Security Auth2 Authorization Server. The version that we are using is 0.2.2. .2. So this will allow us to create the authorization server. Now for this authorization server, let's go to the Java main resources. Let's change the properties files to YAML. And 
and let's change this server port server dot port to 9000 okay so i'm just changing the port and for this as we are going to use the jpa with the same database i need to add the configuration details for the same so let me just go to the spring security client i'll go to the resources application.yaml let me copy this detail and let me go to application.yaml and paste this simple right i'm just using the same mysql localhost 3306 user registration schema username password as root class name provided and show sql is equal to two so all these details are there now for this particular authorization server as well we need to use this user registration and the user flow right so we need to have the user entity user repository and the user services that we have defined in the spring security client to my authorization server as well ideally if there is any duplicate or duplicate files that you have to use so you can separate out all those particular files in a separate project and you can use that particular project's dependency in your pom.xml file you can go ahead that way also but currently let's directly use those so in my java folder let me create the packages i'll create the package entity service repository config so i need the user entity so let me just copy this and paste it over here then i need the user repository so let me just copy user repository and paste in the user repository now in your auth authorization server we need to implement the custom user detail service now user detail service is the default service provided for the users to interact with the spring security to check if the user exists or not so that particular thing we have to customize it to use our database so we need to create the custom user detail service for that so let me just create a class that says custom user details service custom user details service this is the class in the auth authorization server and this is the service and we will implement this as a transactional and this particular custom user details service will implement user details service this user details service you can see that is part of the spring security okay and there is a method that we need to implement that is the load user by username so whatever the username is for me the username would be my email id whatever that we are using so with the help of the user id that we have we need to load the user from the database and we need to pass back to the spring security so spring security can handle that user this is very important step okay because without implementing this user detail service spring security will not know about the users that we have in the database so for this reason only we had added the user and user repository entity and repository in our application copied from the client so let me just create the object of user repository and i'll auto wire it okay now instead of username i'll just make it as email so we can understand better so here let's implement it we need the user object that is the what we have added in the entity okay so let me just use this daily code buffer auth server dot entity this user equals to user repository dot find by email will pass the email okay we got the user then we will check if user equals to null then throw new user not found exception and you can pass no user found and after that if so and now we need to return the user that user would be of this one that is the org.springframework.security.core.user details so this is the user that we need to return back okay and here this particular user needs few details so let's pass it user dot get email then user dot get password currently i'm passing everything to true because if you see this we need to pass username password it's enabled 
account non expired credentials non expired account non locked so one two three four true this value i can get from the user itself so user dot is enabled rest everything to true okay and the last thing it requires is the authorities authorities is nothing in the spring security that what all things that you are authorized to use the resources it's just as the scopes okay so let's implement the method for that as well so i'll just implement get authorities method and here in this authorities i'll pass the list dot of user dot get rules and this get authorities let me just create this method and this is a collection that extends granted authority now we need to create this granted authority so let me just create the list of granted authorities authorities equals to new array list and for each string role in roles okay let me just rename to roles i will need to add the authority so authorities dot add a new simple granted authority si simple granted authority and i need to pass the role then return authorities okay so let me just add the new over here cool right you can see that you my thought that we did a lot of things but it's simple we just created the custom user detail service and implemented the user detail service which is very important part of the spring security to load the user based on our database that's the custom implementation so we injected the user repository and this is the load user by username method that we have implemented the method which is taking the email as the input parameter we got the user from the database if user is null then user is not found exception we thrown else we created the user object from this user that we have from the database so we passed all these details email password enabled everything okay all these details you, you can pass from the user you can add all these details in the database okay and we can handle it and we got the roles and based on the roles we created the authorities okay so the user is created so now we, this particular user will be part of the spring security so whenever we need a user we'll get directly from you so your custom user detail service is done now comes the other thing that we need to implement the configuration we need to add the configuration for our authorization server so this implementation would be standard for all the authorization servers so there is a bunch of code where you will be creating the public keys private keys and all those stuffs to handle your authorization server so your clients can connect to it and the exchange between the authorization code and the token can be happen smoothly so it's a bunch of standard codes that i'm going to add over here and i'll try to explain it so for that let me create the configuration file so in the config directory config package sorry i'll create the java class and i'll say authorization server config okay so this configuration would be basically standard configuration for your authorization server i'll just add the configuration and i'll just add proxy bin methods to false now there are a bunch of standard implementation that we have to do so let's add that we would be needing the password encoder so i'm just adding the password encoder over here so now you can see that the bean is not available so we need to create the bean for it so let's create the bean for it so let me go to the custom user detail service itself and here let me just create the bean okay i'll just use password encoder i'll just make it a public method and return new bcrypt password encoder with strength 11 the same thing that we have added in our client as well and annotate with pin no fancy stuff okay so now in the authorization server the error is gone now let's add bunch more things now we need to add the security filter chain okay so let me just create the bean of it let me just so yeah, you can see that we have implementing the security filter over here and we are injecting the http security so what we want to do for our security so it's simple stuff 
this particular thing you can see that the auth to authorization server configuration dot apply default security so we are applying the default security over here that means that default auth to authorization functionality so default slash authorize api slash token api all those default apis are there right for the auth 2 all those default apis will be defaultly added to our configuration so that's what we have done over here for our security filter chain okay if you go to this particular class you can see that this is the apply default security that we are calling and these are the bunch of default configuration is being added over here okay you can see that all the rsa keys and uh, jwt and coder and everything is been defaultly added over here and we are calling that apply default security so all those particular apis are available for auth 2 all those default apis will be enabled and then what we are doing for this http we are using the form login and we are customizing this form login for the default so with the default configuration for auth 2 everything will be set up with this line of code okay and we have added the highest precedence for this bean 2 be used so if you want to configure any of the apis for the auth 2 then this is the place that you have to configure but i'm going with the defaults you should go with the defaults unless there is a specific requirement okay so this is the configuration for that now as we saw earlier every time the clients were getting registered to the authorization server so here also we need to register the clients so client registration also we need to enable over here we need to add the configuration for it so let me just add the default basic configuration i'm just copying this code because this is the standard code okay now there is a lot of things in this method but don't worry everything is simple so here you can see that it is registered client repository so this is the repository that has been provided for all the clients to get registered okay so if you want your custom implementation you just have to implement this interface okay it has the couple of methods that is the save find by id find by client id that's it you just need to implement these methods according to your requirement according to according to the database that you're using or according to any of the things that you're using if you just implement these three method to get the particular output or particular return type that's all good okay so currently I have only one client available okay I am using only one client that is my spring security client this particular spring security client I want to register with my authorization server so that's why I have just added one client statically over here ideally you won't be doing this these are the static configuration okay if you want to do dynamically like with like how we saw earlier you need to use the jdbc uh, registration client or your custom registration client where you will be getting all those details or you will be generating all those details and giving to the user who wants to use your authorization server i know what i want to use because this is my project this is my client and for this client there are details that i am using over here that i am registering over here and these details i will give to this client so this client can connect to the authorization server that i have okay so this is simple thing i am creating the object of registered client with random uuid okay and what i am giving this details that is the client id i am cli passing the client id as the api client that is the name of my client so my spring security client this is the name i will be giving to this spring security client then i am giving the client password that is the client secret i am encoding the password with the secret then client authentication method so i am using the client authentication method as the client secret basic okay so whatever the secret information that you am passing over here with that particular information i will be able to authenticate my client these are the grant types that, that we are allowing you can see the authorization code password refresh tokens so these are all we are allowing for the client to access through then these are the redirect urls i will talk about this redirect urls later so these are the urls of your client so once the authentication or once the authorization is happened from the authorization server where you want to redirect back so i want to redirect back to this particular urls now how i got this particular urls that I'll tell you like how we got this. These are the standard format URLs that you can define. Okay. So everything I'll tell you later once we implement this. But consider these are the two URLs, redirect URLs. Then I have defined two scopes. Okay. One scope is the OIDC scopes for your open ID connect because we are authenticating as well. And the other scope is read scope API.read. 
and then the client settings I have extra added. So what I'm doing is in the client setting is client settings dot builder dot require authorization consent. So I am enabling the consent over here that my authorization server, this server needs to give the consent back to the client to allow. Okay. So it will have the page of the consent as well. If I don't add it, there won't be consent. The consent will be directly given and I'm building this particular object. Okay, and I'm using the in-memory registered client repository. So this particular registered client will be in the in-memory itself of this particular authorization server. There is one more default implementation added that is the JDBC registered client repository. If you want, you can directly use that as well. And if you want, you can create your custom implementation as well. As far as I know, there will be only these two implementations by default provided by the Spring Auth server because there are a lot of databases and there are a lot of implementations available. So you can always go ahead and implement according to your requirement. If you want to use Mongo, Redis, whatever, Cassandra, whatever you want to use, you can implement this particular repository. You can extend this, implement this repository according to the database that you are using to register your clients. I have one, so this is direct. So this is a code to register my client. We'll come back for this to redirect URLs later, okay? But rest of the things are clear that we are giving the authorizations and everything to so how to connect my client to this authorization server. Then now the next thing I required is the public and private key configuration. So let's add the code for that. Okay, here yeah, you can see that I've just added this information, but this is nothing but the standard configuration for your public private keys. We just have to create one bean for the JWK source and we are just creating the RSA key over here. This is the standard, you just need to copy paste it and it will work. You don't have to change anything, okay? Until and unless you have to change the algorithm, like which algorithm that you are using to generate the key. That's it. Rest everything you can directly use it. Now you might be wondering from where I got, got this code. Got this code from the samples shared by the Spring Security team itself. You go to that repository, Spring Security Auth Server, all these particular details are there. So you can directly use from there. This is nothing fancy, just just directly use it. You don't have to change anything. You don't have to bother about it. Okay. Now the next configuration that you have to do is the provider setting. So provider setting is nothing but the the authentication or your authorization provider or server provider. So these are the bean configuration for that. So yeah, you can see that I have just defined a bean for the provider settings. Okay, you can see that there are a lot of information, a lot of changes that you can do. We have just defined the issue where you can change the authorization endpoint, token endpoint, JWK set endpoint. So if you want to configure any of the endpoints over here, you can configure the endpoints. Okay, but by default, the standard endpoints you will get. These are the beans that I have provided. Now you can see that the issue where I have provided is HTTP auth server colon 9000. So if you see 9000, that is the 9000 port of my auth server itself. If you go to the application.yaml, this is my auth server currently and I have passed the URL for that. So now this particular auth server URL, you can define in your host files. Okay. So what you can do is you can go to the terminal and if you go to cat slash private etc host file, Okay, and here you can see that this is the host file that you, if you want, you can change this host file. And here you can see that by default, the local host for 127.0.0.1 would be there. And I added one more entry for the host as the auth server over here. That's the only thing that I have implemented. So this is the configuration that you have to add for your auth server to work with that particular URL. So I hope this is clear now. So the configuration for the authorization server is done. Now we need to do the configuration for the basic spring security as well for this. So let's add the default spring security configuration. So let me just add one more configuration file and I'll just say default security config. Now you might be wondering there are a lot of changes and a lot of complex things here but don't worry these are very simple and this you have to do only once. Once this is done, once this is set up, you are good to go always. So this is the default security config and we need to enable web security and here I am just adding the configuration. Simple okay. If you see here, I am just adding again the security filter chain and I am getting the HTTP as the input parameter. What I'm doing, I'm just changing the authorized request. So I'm just doing that all the request coming here has to be authenticated. Okay. Any request has to be authenticated with 
default form login for the authorization server that's it okay simple thing now a lot of configurations are done for the auth server very little things are left so now we have defined the custom user detail service like this is the user detail service that you have to use to validate the user we define the authorization server config like how the authorization authorization server should work we also define how your basic security should work like all the requests should be validated so now one thing is left is your authentication provider like authentication manager how you should be managing your authentication so whatever the user object from the custom user details service i created right from here now with this particular details with this user that i have created i need to validate the credentials that i'm providing from the input so whatever the input that i'm providing that has to be validated against this users right whatever the users that i have mentioned so i need to define the custom authentication provider as well so that the users are validated against so let me just create the configuration for that so let me just create the service and i'll just say custom authentication provider I'll annotate this with service and this custom authentication provider will implement authentication provider okay and we need to implement the method as well that is the authenticate okay these are the implementations that we have to provide now how we can authenticate we need the custom user detail service as well so whatever we have defined over here so let me just inject that private custom user detail service i'll just auto wire it and i'll also need the password encoder over here so let me just auto wire it private password encoder And now this is the authenticate method in which we have to customize it okay so let's do this so let's get the username password string username equals to i'll get authentication dot get name string password equals to authentication dot get credentials dot to string now user details object we need from the security user details equals to custom user details service dot load user by username and here we need to pass email so email we see our username will get the object of the user details let me just make it to user that is better now we need to validate the user so let me just create the method check password where you are passing the user and password okay and let's create this method and this is your raw password okay let's implement this if let me rename okay check password i don't know why i make this much spelling mistakes okay now if password encoder dot matches raw password with user dot get password return new username password authentication token okay where we need to pass user dot get username user dot get password and user dot get authorities else return new return new bad credentials exception let's say bad credentials okay throw simple so yeah you can see that we are just authenticating okay with the authentication manager over here and we need to add the support as well so let me add this return username password authentication token dot class dot is assignable form authentication okay so this authentication has been handled over here so you can see that simple thing authentication is handled now this custom authentication provider we need to bind okay so let's do that so let me go to the default security and let's bind this over here let me create the object private custom authentication provider okay 
I'll auto wire it and let me create the bean of authentication manager public void bind authentication provider auto wire it and I'm just injecting authentication manager builder auth and this authentication manager builder dot what is the authentication provider that is the custom authentication provider okay so we just bind this custom authentication provider to our authentication manager builder that's it you can see it's simple looks difficult but simple so now your auth authorization server is ready all the configurations are done it can handle all the requests now we have enabled everything now we need to register our client we need to add the configurations in our client to talk to this authorization server okay as every authorization server will give you the details to handle everything in your system we need to do that so if you go to this authorization server config you can see that these are the register client repositories these are the details that we need to handle so this is our spring security client here we need to handle everything in our application.yaml currently we have the spring data source on jpa now we need to add for the spring security auth so let's add that i'll just copy the details and i will explain you everything if i type there will be some error in the indentation and we might waste a lot of time so let me just copy the details after the ddl auto update i'm just copying every details over here okay so now you can see that it's part of spring security auth2 and we are adding the client now now after this client these are the custom things now we need to handle custom is registration so this is the name of your client okay we are adding the registration client and the name is api client oidc okay provider is spring now this spring provider i will get into details the client id and secret that is the api client and secret this is the same thing that we have defined over here that is the api client and secret okay api client and secret that is the api client oidc authorization grant type is authorization code this authorization code we have enabled you can see that authorization code we have enabled grant type then redirect uri now this re redirect uri is standard http your server name your port slash login slash auth2 slash code and registration id your registration id is nothing but your api client ydc okay and the same uri whatever it is configured over here the standard format you can see over here okay http 1270.0.1 et80 login auth2 code and api client ydc that is the client over here that you have defined makes sense right now now the scope scope is open id for your authentication as we have implemented as we have added the open id as well and the client name api client ydc and now the below one you can see it's for the api client authorization code where the provider details client id and the client secret we have mentioned the same authorization grant type is authorization code and the redirect url is 127.0.0.1 colon 8080 slash authorized once authorized this is the redirect api it will be redirected to okay and the scope we have defined is api dot read so this is the scope that we are going to define and the same thing we have defined you can see in the authorization server config you can see that api dot read scope and the other one was oidc scope dot open id the same thing we have defined over here that is the open id scope and the provider you can see the provider spring issuer url it's HTTP colon auth server colon 9000 if you come back over here you can see that we have defined the issuer over here that is the auth server 9000 so the same configuration we have defined over here similarly you can define according to the name that you have given over here so this is the name according to the name everything you have to provide over here so if you come you can see these are the two redirect url you have mentioned over here that only you have configured okay and this redirect url is nothing but the standard format that you have to give based on the client id or the client name that you are giving registration id so this is the configuration now the next thing you need to configure is your web security so if you go to the config we have created the web security config here we have enabled the web security and 
we have added the security filter change where for the HTTP we are disabling this URS and CSRF and we are adding the authorized HTTP request and we are permitting all the URLs this all the URLs we are permitting but other than that what all the other URLs we have to be authenticated to go into that okay so let's add that so I'm adding one more ant matchers slash API slash anything anything coming with slash API slash anything has to be authenticated okay and we need to add the configuration for our auth server as well now dot auth to login we need to add now for this to work we need to add the authorization client as a dependency so let's add the dependency so i'll go to the spring security client and i'll go to the pom.xml file and i'm adding one dependency And this dependency you can see is for Spring Boot Starter Auth2 Client. So this will be my Auth2 Client now. So now if I go back to the web security config, I'll be able to add. Let me stop the server and invalidate the cache so everything is refreshing. So we'll give the Auth2 login and Auth2 login. And we need to give the login page, which login page to redirect. So we can define or two dot login page. And we need to pass the URL. So the standard URL we need to pass that is slash auth2 slash authorization slash your registration ID. So whatever the registration ID that you have defined, right? If you go to your application.yaml, that is the API client OIDC. So you'll be giving API client OIDC your login page dot auth to client customizer dot with defaults okay with default configuration we are enabling everything that's it so this is the configuration that we need to add now slash api right so if you go to the hello controller so let me just add the slash api slash hello over here okay so this is the api that we are going to call and it is just returning hello welcome to daily code buffer okay so let me just start the auth server so your auth server is started and let me start the client as well so i started the client as well okay now you can see that it's connected let me just let me just go to the browser okay now let's go to the localhost let me just open the debugging tool we'll go to the networks let me just close this okay and let me go to the localhost 8080 slash api slash hello for this my request should be redirected to the authorization server for authentication okay and here you can see that it has been redirected okay now here i need to provide the authentication here you can see that it is redirected to the auth server colon 9000 slash login page and here you can see that your hello controller was there right your hello api it was called and it was sent to the api ydc this is a url you can see that auth2 slash authorization slash api client ydc and and you can see that the authorize was called with the response type client api sorry client id so scope information state information redirect uri everything is passed the same flow that we have seen with the playground right that these are the api these are the endpoints will be called okay and after that it's been called the authorized we need to get authorized so what i'll do i will add the details so if first if i add any details okay and if i try to sign in you can see that no user found so this is the particular flow that will happening so it has to be authenticated okay now if i give the correct information if i go to the mysql okay if i get the nickel over here okay if i pass nickel at gmail.com and the password for that we had kept was 789 okay so if i go back to the browser okay if i do 789 and if i sign in you can see that it has been redirected back okay if i go to the slash api slash hello you can see that i am getting the proper response now okay 
Hello, welcome to Daily Code Buffer. Now, if I want to get the logged in user information, that also I can get using the principle. So let me just add that as well. So if I go to the controller, hello controller, and here if I inject the principal object, principal from the Java dot security, and here I'll just say hello, and I'll just define principal dot get name. Let me restart my client. Okay, my client is restarted. Now let's go to the browser. Let me just open the incognito mode, and I'll just do localhost 8080 slash API slash hello okay you can see that I am redirected back to the login page and if I give the proper information let me just copy the email id okay and I'll give the password 789 and if I click on sign in you can see that I'm redirected back. I'm getting this error because I have not defined this particular endpoint. But instead of this, if I go back to API slash user, sorry, hello, you can see that I'll get the user as well that nickel at gmail.com is signed in. Okay. And as I have defined everywhere as 127.0.0.1 instead of localhost, if I hit this URL instead of localhost, okay, let me just close this. Let me just open the incognito again and if I hit this, I'll get the login page. Let me just give the nickel information over here. And if I do 789, then it should redirect to the correct page. You can see that I'm getting the correct page now, right? It's been redirected correctly. So this way you can see that we have implemented the auth2 with open id authorization server and the client as well. So it both of them can interact with each other and only the authorized resources are allowed. Now what if you have a resource server as well? So your resource server is there where only the authenticated user can access those authenticated resources. And if you want to access those resources using your client how to handle that so let's create the resource server let's create one more application add into our project and let's go around how to fetch the data from the resource server as well so let's try to do that let me just close this uh, let me go to the start.spring.io i'll just do com dot daily code buffer artifact as oauth resource server packaging is jar chao version is 11 okay and here what i'll do i'll just add the web dependency i'll add the spring security dependency and i'll add the auth resource server dependency okay that's it let's generate the project and add an intellij idea so yeah let's generate it open in finder unzip it let's copy this Okay, let's go to IntelliJ IDEA and add as a module in our main project. Let's go to pom.xml file. I'll add the auth resource server. And Maven reload projects. Yeah, you can see that this is the auth server. Now let's configure the auth resource server as well. So what I'll do, I'll just first change the application.properties to application.yaml and I'll just do server.port as 8090 and I'll add the configuration for the spring security as well. So what I'm adding, I'm just adding spring.security.auth2 this is a resource server JWT issuer URL is auth server 9000. So this is my issuer URL. So I just configure this as a resource server. Now we need to handle the basic spring security as well. So let's go ahead and do that. So here with the Java, let me just create the new package and I'll just say this is a config package. And within this config package, let me just create the Java class and I'll just say resource server config and I'll enable the web security. 
here we need to create the security filter chain bin so i'll just define security filter chain and this is a bean now you might have noticed that we have everywhere in all the application we have defined the security filter chain okay and i'll just define the http security now we need to configure this as the same way we have configured in our auth server and the client as well so we'll just define http dot mvc matchers now all the api request okay we are targeting and it should be authorized request dot mvc matchers slash api slash all the api request and here we need to add the exception okay let's add the exception dot access we need to provide the access and it should have the access only so here you can see that we are calling the method that access only has authority api read so here you can see that we have defined the scope okay so whenever we are defining the scope for the authority we need to define as scope underscore and whatever whatever the scope it is so we are just handling the api read now if there is multiple we can add the multiple access over here so this is the api read, read that we are defining dot and auth to resource server or auth to is a resource server dot jwt okay and we need to return http dot build simple so here you can see that simply we just define the security filter chain where we are authorizing all the request where scope is api dot read now let's create the resource or the api for this resource server okay so what i'll do i'll just create one package and here i'll just say controller inside this controller let me just create one java class and i'll just say user controller annotate with rest controller okay and let me create one method public string of array get users return new string and here i am defining multiple users okay let me just define shabir nikhil shivam and let me annotate with at the red get mapping slash api slash users okay you can see that the simple api that we have created now suppose this is the api provider this is the resource server okay and now in your client you want to call this api but it has to be authenticated right it has to be within this scope whatever the scope we have defined if you are passing the scope and it's matching with the scope then only we should be able to get the details so we need to configure our client to handle the web client so we'll be using the web client to call this particular url and to fetch the data so we need to configure our web client as well so let's go ahead and do that if you go to our spring security client and in the pom.xml in the pom.xml file we need to add the dependency of the reactive spring as we are going to use the web client now this is nothing but you are calling one of the apis that is behind the authorization server that is your resource server you want to call those resources you want to utilize those resources to utilize those resources your web client has to be, go around get authenticated and should get you the data that's it right it's simple as that whatever the api that you are directly calling from the client and if you want to call another api from the another resource server it has to be authenticated it has to be within the scopes that you have mentioned then only you should get the details so that's what we are trying to implement so let's add the dependency for that so let me go to the file over here within the dependency after the auth to client I'm adding two more dependencies and you can see that it's a spring webflux dependency and reactive native dependency so we can use the web client so now as we are going to use the web client we need to configure it as well so let's go ahead and configure it we will create the configuration class for that now this all things you can see whatever I'm configuration I'm adding that is only one time configuration so the only challenging thing to understand is that configuration part in the starting but once you add the configuration once you get the hang around of it it's very easy to implement the other things so as i need to configure the web client i'll create a new class that says web client configuration 
okay and i'll annotate with at the rate configuration okay now now there is a default configuration okay you can directly add the configuration so i'll just add the configuration so you can directly utilize it so yeah you can see that i've just added the configuration let me import all the classes so okay i'm sorry i just added the web client configuration at the wrong place so let me just delete from here or let me just control x from here go to the src in spring client in java config here i need to add okay and from the pom.xml file let me just correct it out if i have done any mistake no it's all good in this pom only i have added okay make sure that if you are working with multiple projects this type of things happens this, uh, this type of issue happens so make sure that you are adding at the correct place so you can see that it's just a filter function added and it's applied that web client will be or to client to configure okay or to is configured to use and here you can see that this is the authorization client manager where it is using the authorization code refresh token and all those things so this is just a default you can see it's just a default implementation you just copy all these details you just enable the beans web client and auth to authorization client manager and you're good to go you don't have to do anything now once this is implemented we can use web client to call that particular api that we have added in the web in our resource server okay so let's do that so let's go to the controller let's go to the hello controller and here we can call that api so let's do that so here i am creating one method that is public string of users okay and you can see i'm just passing as a get mapping and slash api slash users and here we need to inject oauth to authorization client okay and which authorization we need to annotate with registered auth to authorization client okay so we need to bind it so which particular so if you go to the client okay if you go to the resources application.yaml this is the one api client authorization code this is the one that directly we are binding that it will be using the api client as the client id secret the authorization code the url the scope all this information for our authentication for our resource server okay so let's go over here and let's define this that this is the one that we are going to use hope so now it is visible now we need to use the web client to call that so let me just auto wire the web client as well so i'll just do private web client and i'll auto wire it now return this dot web client dot get dot uri so we need to pass the uri so what would be the uri this one http 127.0.0.1 colon 8090 that is the port number that we have defined in our resource server and slash api slash user is what we have defined as the endpoint to get the resources okay and then we'll define dot attributes auth to authorize client okay so in the attributes that you have to define is server auth to authorized client exchange filter function okay this is what if you go to the web client this is what you have defined right so that one we have defined and let me just do the static import and here we'll define the client dot dot retrieve dot body to mono this is of string array dot class dot block okay so the error i'm getting over is because of the attributes it should be attributes okay a right, simple thing okay now this particular method is ready it is trying to get the data from the resource server that we have defined and after authenticating authorizing i am getting the data so now let's start the server i'll start the auth server first then let me start the resource server as well i'm sorry the resource server only started let me start the auth server as well spring client as well okay so yeah you can see that everything is started now if i want to call the 
hello controller slash api slash users it will try to call this particular resource server that is behind the authorization server as well after authenticating with the proper scopes only i'll get the resources so let me just go to the browser let me open the incognito window i'll just use this slash api slash hello instead of that i'll just define users okay it should be redirected to the login page as it was intended then i'll give the user information and password is 789 and here you can see that it is asking for the consent from the resource server that you should be authenticated you can see that api client what is the api client api client is nothing but your client if you go to the application or yaml api client this is your client right and what it is asking you can see that is want to access your account that is this one nicolette gmail.com the following permissions are requested what is it scope only we have defined api read so we'll just give the api read consent and submit the consent and you can see that i'm getting the data over here so you can see that my app resource server is behind the authorization server once the consents are there after that only i'll be able to access those resources so that's how the complete flow with the auth2 and open id for authorization server resource server and the auth client works so if you want to understand more in depth about everything i'll add the documentation link in the description below so you can check that out i'll also link the different articles where i have read about it i'll link everything in the description below so you can check that out and there are different flows as well like we just use the authorization code flow there are different flows also available so you can try and implement those flows as well but the fundamentals are same just focus on the fundamentals just try to understand everything and learn accordingly ideally there will be very less chances where you will get to implement all this kind of securities because nowadays there are a lot of third party tools available like okta or zero like gmail github and everything right so most of the times people will be using that only and it is suggested to use it because they have done a lot of work on that the tools are really good so we can directly without worrying everything we can directly get all those security features and i'm also not a security expert by any means but this is what i have understood and i've implemented and this is also not a particular flow that you will be implementing the production there are a lot more extra features there are a lot more extra configurations that you have to do within this as well to make your application more secure so so these are all the details that i wanted to share about the auth server resource server and client and everything if you have any doubts then do let me know in the comment section below and if you want to learn more about how to package those applications and to deploy to kubernetes and to learn kubernetes then these are the videos that you can check out these videos to learn more about the kubernetes and how to deploy these services to the kubernetes cluster and also how to automate those deployments as well so that's all i have to share if you have any doubts or anything then as always do let me know in the comment section below i'll try to help you out as soon as possible so i hope you have enjoyed this tutorial i know it was very long and it was a complex as well but i have made my best effort to make it as simple as possible so hope you enjoyed it and if you like this video give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for the upcoming awesome videos if you want you can join this channel as well and support me so that's all in this video i'll see you in the next video till then happy coding Bye bye